If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com to the on the first side where you see the two great fields of the United States of America yep. okay now if you notice it says those are supposed to be the two great fields of the United States of America correct yep. those aren't those are the two seals of the order of the Illuminati now I have all this memorized from my days in the Illuminati This went on the dollar bill in 1935, but this reflects ancient beliefs of secret societies that go back literally before the birth of Christ. It symbolizes the ancient goal of secret societies of the establishment of what in scripture we see in Revelation 13 as the reign of the beast and the false prophet. You're the Great Seal. It's a very fascinating story. <laughs> I got one right here. The Great Seal of the United States, or is it the Great Seal of the Illuminati? There's a lot more than meets the eye.
Welcome to TruthRadioShow.com and welcome to our documentary here, Freemasonry from the Light to Darkness. So, my, I'm your host, Dan Bedondi here. I'm the host of the TruthRadioShow.com and my co-host, Brian Reese. So, we're joined with Trey Harris and David Carrico, who are both well-known researchers, especially David Carrico, who has over 30 years of top research into the Masonic Lodges. So basically what we do today, guys, this is a contemplation of the shows that we've done in the last couple of years that are put together. And mind you, with all this information we do have, it's only touching, scraping the tip of the iceberg, you know, the iceberg, literally, you know, the tip of the spear, they call it. <laughs> and uh, because if we had to do a full documentary on everything about Freemasonry, we would be here for weeks. So what we want to do is cover the basics and go in a in a little bit, you know, in a deep a little bit to expose the rituals and everything else that goes on in Freemasonry. Because what we're trying to do here is we're not trying to judge. We're not trying to um, condemn Freemasons. And if you're a Freemason, you know, we actually uh, want to pray for you. You know, I mean, that's what we want to do is pray for you to get out of the lodge. Now, myself, David Carrico, and others, we know people very close people that were Freemasons. And I know uh, a gentleman who I've had on my show many years, he was a former 33 degree Mason. You know what I mean? And there, and there was an organization called Masons for Christ, ex-Masons, ex-Freemasons for Christ that I have interviewed over the years as well. It's not in this video here, but um, that informed us all the stuff that does go on Freemasonry that most Masons themselves don't even know. So it's presented to be a fraternity of God it's not at all. It's certainly not the God of the Bible. I'm going to tell you that right now. Whatever regards what you think, and I know a lot of Blue Lodge Masons who think it's the God of the Bible. They got a Bible on the altar. It's all an illusion. So we're going to get to all the dark stuff and expose it all. So we encourage you to watch this documentary. And if you know a Freemason, guys, please, number one do, to do, pray for them because they're being hoodwinked. And most Masons are very good people, great-hearted people. They'll give you the shirt off their back. They're very intelligent people and everything else, but they're being hoodwinked. So number one, we need to pray for them to get out of the lodge, to disembowel themselves from the lodge, and come to Jesus Christ. And number two, show them this documentary, guys, and we challenge them and everybody else to challenge this information and look for yourselves. Or, and if you're a Freemason, we encourage you, go to your Masonic library. You can pull the books up for yourselves to show you directly that everything we say is true. And we're going to present that information in this documentary. And once again, this documentary is a contemplation of shows that we've done in the last couple of years. It's myself, my co-host, Brian Reese, um, lead researcher, David Carrico. He's the host of FOJC Radio. That's followers of JesusChristRadio.com, FOJCRadio.com. And my buddy, Trey Harris, who is also a talk show host. So all well, of us get together, put our knowledge together, and uh, again, we're only touching the tip of the iceberg with this. Because if we were to do a full documentary on everything about Freemasonry, we'd be here for weeks. This is just a uh, bullet point and general idea, and we do get really deep into some stuff. But to show you and to prove to you, not only with our mouths, you know, our research and everything else, but from Masonic material itself, former uh, quotes from former high-end, well-known Freemasons. And their own books and writing. So we're going to show you all this stuff, guys. So please enjoy this documentary. And if you're a Freemasonry and you want to come out of the Freemasonry, please reach out to us. We, we've we helped many people out of the craft, okay, uh, especially David Carrico. And, you know, we can help you through all that and to erase that spiritual filth. And, I'm you know, I, I don't mean to offend you, but it's spiritual filth. And there's a reason why that Thomas Quincy Adams, I'm sorry, John Quincy Adams, the president said that uh, Freemasonry pro promises light, but it produces darkness. That's why we named it Freemasonry from light to darkness. What we're trying to do now is bring you back from the darkness into the light. And uh, that's the light of Jesus Christ, not the light of the craft. So, guys, uh, please uh, watch this documentary. And uh, if you need to get a hold of us, put in the comments section. or go to truthradioshow.com. Our contact information is there. So, God bless. Shalom. And you are the resistance. Enjoy.
And Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Spiritual Warfare Friday. Uh, the title of tonight's broadcast is Freemasonry, The Darkness Behind the Light. And I'm your host, Dan Bedandi. we got a jam-packed show for you, uh, tons of information. So I just want to let people know a couple things ahead of time before we start the show, uh, especially with Freemasons out there. Uh, it's a very sensitive topic and everything else. I do want to express to people very much that not every Mason's evil, that not every Mason's a bad guy. In fact, it's the other way around. Most Freemasons are great and wonderful people. They really are. Uh, but however, um, truth being told, what they are into, known as the craft Freemasonry, is not of God. And I'm not here to try to personally attack Freemasons. I'm not doing that. I am just simply exposing the truth. And uh, what I'm going to show you tonight, you can literally look the stuff up in your own Masonic libraries to find this information out, which is literally kept from a lot of Masons at the lower uh, degrees. And for people out there, too, who have friends and family who are Freemasons, don't be too hard on them. I mean, you need to let them know this is a very serious thing, but don't castize them and don't think of them as evil people because, again, most are not evil people. They're just hoodwinked and lied to, you know what I mean? Like anything else, like the false religions out there, no different, okay? So, yeah, let's just get to our show, guys, because we got lots to talk about, and I'm talking about a lot. So, um, I could easily do several shows on this, and, um, and to be honest with you, I was trying to jam information uh, just... I didn't even know where to begin, to tell you the truth. At the, uh, the be you know, a couple of days ago, I'm like trying to gather information because there's so much, it really is. And I'm like, where do I begin? How do I even present this? Last night, I'm putting the slides together, try to put them in order. I'm like, wow. I mean, I, you know, the father led me to do that because I'm like, I'm trying to get the new show together and everything else together. And um, the time's ticking. I got to get to bed. Uh, then, you know, the father just helped me out big time. So, uh, yeah, so let's just begin here. We're gonna, what we're going to do here is we're going to do a presentation. And we're going to invite you, the listening audience, to call into the show after the presentation. Call into the show or if you don't want to call, uh, you're more than welcome. If you're not subscribed to YouTube here, please subscribe now. And you get the chat in our live chat section. So you can present the questions or comments on there and also uh, call. We'll give the phone number out after the presentation because we've got a lot to talk about and a lot of material to cover. Uh, I'm telling you, a lot of material. <laughs> so again, the show is uh, Freemasonry, the darkness behind the light. Because Freemasonry is all about... Illumination, what they say. I mean, I almost joined Freemasonry myself. Uh, years ago, I knew a lot of Freemasons. I still do. And um, I almost joined myself. Because I was always American history buff and everything else. And um, I got told, well, you know, the Masons had a lot to do with American history, which is true. But they also lied about a lot of it, too. Uh, regardless of the point. You know, they did have a major impact in this country and many other countries worldwide. And uh, so that's what intrigued me to Freemasonry and also the mysteries and everything else And uh, at the time <laughs> before I knew any better. But, you know, what we're going to do again, I'm not, you know, going to sit there and demonize Freemasons. Uh, it's not them. It's the craft itself that we're trying to expose. You know what I mean? So let's get into the subject here. So what is a Freemason? And um, so... We're going to get to that because it's a long history with this stuff, guys. And a Freemason, uh, you see this all over the place. I mean, driving to cities and towns, you see these signs on highways, exits, uh, uh, buildings. Free and accepted Masons, they're called. And you see the, the square and compass with the G in it. And you see them everywhere. Well, uh, Masons, like, they, is, symbol, is the symbolism of King Solomon's temple. So if you know anything about the Bible, uh, yeah, because this pretty much is all about... Uh, a twisted version of scripture and the occult, big time, and Kabbalism. So uh, before I get to all that stuff, I'm going to save a lot of the confusion here. So I'm um, going to show you what, you know, they say, which goes beyond what... Hang on, let me get to the history here. So the history of Freemasonry, it's like, uh, you know, if you go anywhere, they'll tell you this. Uh, it's the teachings, practices of the secret fraternity, fraternal order of men only. They do have order for women. And um, in this show, I'm not going to get into all the specific orders. There are many, 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 many orders of Freemasonry. There's the uh, Order of the Eastern Star, uh, the Jake Jux de Malays, there's um, uh, Prince Hall for black folks. Uh, there's woman orders like uh, the Eastern Star, like I said. Job's Daughters is a woman's one, and uh, Jacques de Molay's are there for kids. 
Uh, but they have tons of different audits too. I mean, so many. And uh, the next show, um, we're going to continue this, obviously. But we're just going to get through the basics of Freemasonry today and show you the spiritual ramifications and significance of how this is very bad for a professional Christian. So anyway, their history goes back uh, back to the 1700s. And it goes beyond that, by the way. So we'll get to that in a minute. So it's a fraternal order of you know mostly men. And it's Free and Septon Masons, the largest worldwide free society, secret society, I'm sorry, spread by advance of the British Empire. Freemasonry remains most popular by the British Isles and other countries originally with the Empire. Estimates worldwide membership for Freemasons in the early 21st century range from about 2 million or more than 6 million people. And they say Freemasonry evolved from the guilds of stonemasons and cathedral buildings in the Middle Ages. With the decline of cathedral buildings, some uh, lodges of operation working masons began to accept honorary members to bolster their decline in membership. So this goes back, um, long story short, it goes back uh, when the first actual Masonic lodge was created. It was in 1717, I'm sorry. The first Grand Lodge called it. It's founded in England. And they were known as the Grand Lodge at the time, not specifically Freemasons. I mean, Masonry came later on, uh, the name Freemasons. So, let me get back to my slides here. I got a lot to talk about, man. It was a, it was a task putting the stuff together, I tell you. So, um, anyway, it resembles, uh, if you know anything about the King Solomon's Temple, uh, the building of it, the pillars. They try to mimic the halls, the Masonic halls, after King Solomon's Temple. And we're going to show you the significance. Now people think, well, it's King Solomon, man. This is going to be good. You know what I mean? It's uh, you know, King Solomon, the Bible and everything else. It's, no, it's nothing like you think it is. Trust me when I tell you. Nothing like that way. You know, so this is the Grand Lodge that was founded in 1717 in, in England there. So that's the Grand Lodge, the Grand, the first Grand Masonic Lodge right there. This, this building has so much history. So guys, if you're ever in that area... Um, if they allow you to, I would definitely suggest a tour because a lot of prominent people in history have been in that building. I'm talking about key historic people have been in that building. I don't know if you see that on the ground there. There's a star, a pentagram like on the ground. Yeah, that plays a lot of significance in this thing we're about to come. So for those of you about thinking about joining Freemasonry, because yes, uh, Freemasonry goes back... Deep in the 1700s, um, a lot of the founding fathers were involved with Freemasonry in this country. That country, uh, a lot of key people uh, were involved in Napoleon Bonaparte, a lot of people in the French Revolution, and uh, yeah, goes back. German, uh, Germany especially, you know what I mean? And yes, the Illuminati have a big, big, big part of this, okay? And that's for another show altogether, but I will explain a little bit as we go on, so... Anyway, so these are Masonic Lodges you might drive by. And you probably, most people don't even notice them. You drive by and you'll see the square and compass in the building somewhere. Most people drive by have no clue. They're right in your neighborhoods, your own, your own states. So they're all over the United States. And that's what some of these lodges look like. They look like a VFW or Knights of Columbus Hall and that, those sort of halls. That's what they look like. There's Buffalo, New York. Showing you a few of them here. And, you know, look at the significance a little bit of... And, you know, granted, they got other buildings that don't look like that, but inside they do. It's supposed to be a replica, basically, of King Solomon's Temple. And all the Masonic Lodges face the east because of the biblical verses about the certain temples that face the east. I forgot to bring that verse up, but we're going to get into the biblical verses in a little while. But it goes back further in the 1700s. Um, it goes back to the days of Babylon. And if you all remember, and this is all biblical stuff, um, all cultic and biblical stuff. So if you're not knowledgeable in the occult or the Bible or even history, um, you're probably going to be all over the place. And I highly suggest maybe you should turn the show off right now and go do some history, read the Bible, read. Um, yeah, because there's no atheists in Freemasonry. I'm going to let you know that now. You have to believe in some kind of a deity and people in the occult actually join Masonry and they exceed faster than people who are biblical. We're going to get to that in a little while. But it goes back to the days of Babel when we hear about this character named Nimrod. He was the ruler of Babylon. He is known as Osiris in Egyptianology. He was the ruler of Babylon. 
Okay, that's where it goes to the master builder's um, pay leg was one of his right-hand men that helped design and build this structure. Peleg was the grand architect of the Tower of Babel. And these people were very, and um, the Bible talks about Nimrod, how he was a mighty hunter and a, a person before God, not for God, before God, you know what I mean? So, and if you read the Bible, we'll get to who Nimrod was, and Cush beget Nimrod. It was Cush's son, Nimrod, and he began to be mighty one in the earth. And we talk a lot about the Nephilim at the time and the giants and all that. Now, Nimrod did come from the bloodline of Seth. However, something happened to him because all the ancient uh, texts and everything, I'll say how Nimrod became a huge man, like a Nephilim. Somehow he transferred into a Nephilim. Very huge, powerful, very mighty. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Not doesn't mean for the Lord. Before the Lord. That means against the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And Cush beget Nimrod and, and beget to be a mighty upon the earth. So, and there shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword in the land of Nimrod, and the entrances thereof thus shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and he will uh, trade us with our borders. And there's other uh, verses too. So, Nimrod is the son of Cush. So if you do the genetic bloodlines, Cush is a direct descendant of Seth, which was the third son of Adam, the bloodline of Adam. So something happened to Nimrod along the way uh, to transfigure him to some kind of a, a Nephilim, if you will. He became very ruthless. He was powerful. Though, I mean, the guy was stronger than anything. Powerful, like a genius. And he has many different names throughout all ancient culture. Many different games. You know, Gilgamesh, that's who Nimrod is. He's also known as Osiris and many other names. Depends on the culture. So um, just as some history, because you need to know the history before you even, can even begin to recognize what Freemasonry is about. And in fact, a lot of Freemasons in the Blue Lodge, which is the first three degrees, we're going to get to that in a few minutes, they have no clue about any of this yet. So anyway, um, Nimrod, which he had his wife Samaramis, and their son Tammuz. Now, Nim, you know, the, the old story goes that, you know, Nimrod was killed by his uncle Shem because he was a very vile person. His uncle actually killed him, ended up killing him all that. So Samaramis, which is Nimrod's mother, that's right, mother, she married her son, Nimrod, all right? And um, she became pregnant with Tammuz uh, before he was killed. So she came up with this, and there was an attempt to, because, again, these occultists, these people at the top know the Bible very well. And at the time, it wasn't the Bible, but they knew God's prophecy, you know, about, since the Garden of Eden, about the coming of the Messiah. They attempted to make the first immaculate conception to try to distort the whole, you know, immaculate conception of Jesus uh, coming to the earth. This is thousands of years before Jesus was born on the earth. So they, uh, she claimed that she had an immaculate conception that, you know, when Nimrod died, he became the great god, the sun god Osiris, and he impregnated her through immaculate conception, trying to mimic the Holy Spirit impregnating um, Mary, and gave birth to the virgin birth to their son Tammuz, which is also known as Horus. And he was actually born on twenty December twenty fifth, and that's the day you actually um, you know people in the world, you know today's Christianity, uh, even though Christians never celebrated the birth of Jesus, Jesus was not born in December. You're actually celebrating the birth of Tammuz, which is Horus. So anyway, um, it's a long story with these two with these people. Yeah, so uh, the story is Samaramis recovered his body parts, and um, this is will explain a lot of stuff. She, because his uncle killed him, chopped his body up and threw it into the Nile River. She claimed, Samaramis, known as Isis, uh, she claimed, we'll get to that right there. That's uh, exactly what the names are, are, and there's many other names for them. Gilgamesh and all this other stuff. So anyway, she claimed when um, Hor Osiris, okay, Nimrod, was killed. Uh, because uh, his uncle Shem cut his body parts up through the Nile. She got all his body parts. She reclaimed all of them. and Except for she could not find his male penis. You know, the phallic symbol. So she created an obelisk. And she claimed she got pregnant off that. But she was already pregnant ahead of time. And the thing is what debugs the whole thing of her being a virgin. Prior to marrying her own son Nimrod. She was a temple prostitute. 
she was a whore, you know, in temple prostitute, and she got pregnant with her, you know, and then ended up marrying her own son later. So she was not a virgin, okay? That, I just want to debunk that before people, because I know uh, people with the zeitgeist movement actually believe in this crap, you know what I mean, about him being you know, a virgin birth. It's not. So anyway, and that's where the story goes. So uh, they're known as Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And uh, then there's a, with Horus, okay, the so-called sun god, Tammuz, they say he was crucified and uh, a lot of, he had um, 12 disciples. No, he did not. Yeah, I just want to debunk any conspiracy theories about that. Uh, Tammuz, Horus, regardless of what the movie Zeitgeist and everything else says, no, he was actually killed by a wild boar. He tried to be a mighty hunter like his father Osiris, which is Nimrod, and he was killed by a wild boar. That's why they ate him on Christmas. That's all significant with all this stuff. So I'm not going to try to get to too much detail about this yet. This is a whole other show altogether. I just want to go to the basics of the foundations of Freemasonry. This is where it all started. They are great builders back 6,000 years ago. And again, they try to mimic, and in different cultures too. The Babylonian, uh, Mesopotamian, all that. These are different cultures that try to mimic. Which are the same people, by the way. So when you're in a Catholic church and you see an image of Mary holding... Um, Jesus, that's not Mary. That's Isis and Tammuz. Or Horus, if you will. That's what that is. It's not Mary and, um, you know, that Mary and uh, Jesus. So anyway, the, um, this goes back to because these are great builders. That's what it's about, okay? The Tower of Babel. And so if you ever notice these symbols all over the world, put up by Freemasons, by the way, uh, they're called obelisk. They're all over the world, especially the United States, embedded everywhere. That And there's one in, in the Vatican, in St. Peter's Basilica. That was dug up from the ancient city of the sun called On, O-N. And um, basically, it's to resurrect Nimrod. That's what it's for. From the dead, Nimrod known as Osiris. That's what it's built there to resurrect. And the Freemasons built all these. This one's called the Washington Monument. And it has nothing to do with George Washington. They actually scrapped the original George Washington Monument when they ran out of funds and the Freemasons took the project over and they ended up building this giant obelisk that's 555, degree, 555 feet tall. And um, un, from the ground under, it's 111 feet, which uh, totals uh, 666 feet. And it's called Nimrod's Golden Penis. That's exactly what it's called. And it's aligned with the star, uh, star systems, Pleiades and Orion, the blazing star known as, uh, which what I covered today, uh, the blazing star is known as Sirius. So, which is significant. So, uh, I'm, I just don't want to confuse everybody at first here because I know there's a lot of stuff to uh, grasp and understand. But these are some of the basics. I mean, I, I would be here all night just to cover the basics. I just try to limit it down to some of the most important stuff, especially for you people out there who would become Freemasons or just got into the lodge. You could be a first, second, or third degree. We're going to cover that in a couple of minutes here. But, yeah, uh, this is what Masonic lodges uh, generally look like. Now, when you go to a Masonic lodge, you have this altar up there, right? And on this floor, it's always like a checkerboard floor. It's either red or, I mean, sorry, uh, white or blue, or black or white, which represents an equal, uh, equality, as above, so below. That's what it stands for. So on that altar they have, which is a movable altar, and I'll explain why that it is in a minute, they have this giant Bible on the altar, and on top of the Bible they have a square and compass that's always placed upon it. They, you know, they use the Holy Bible. But, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, it's not what, you know, I mean, like, this is what you learn in the Blue Lodges, we're going to get to that in a second here. And I just don't want to confuse people. If I'm confusing anybody, guys, please, in the chat room, uh, by all means, uh, say, Dan, I don't understand that. You know what I mean? I'll try to keep up with the chat here because this is a lot to take in. And uh, it's trying to put, you know, just try to present this information without confusing the hell out of people. So if you walked into a, one of these Masonic lodges as a newbie, all right, you would think this is a Christian organization. Look, they got the Bible right on the altar. They talk about King Solomon's temple. Hiram a Biff, a lot of biblical characters, right? And they tell you you have to believe in the deity to join masonry. And they suck a lot of good Christians into masonry. And you would think, oh, yeah, this is definitely a Christian thing, right? Well, actually, if you actually read uh, the... 
the Freemasons that they all believe said uh, this is not um, Freemasonry is not a coincidence. Let me get to that. Freemasonry is not a Christian institute. That's what they say. Freemasonry is not a Christian institution. And though often it's mistaken for one. And they actually contain many elements of religion, which is true. But a majority in America, a lot of uh, Freemasons are Christians as well. You know what I mean? And um, there's a lot of um, Shriners, which were... I'm going to get to that stuff for some other time. I don't want to confuse everybody yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just so much information. I just try to, you know, word this in the proper way so it doesn't, you know, confuse people. So anyway, you walk in, you automatically got to think it's a Christian organization. Even though they don't claim to be one, but you, I mean, you tell they talk about King Solomon, Hiram of Biff, uh, the builders of those times, and uh, back to Babylon. Well, eventually, when you learn about that, and you see the Bible up on the altar, why wouldn't you think it's a Christian organization? And they also these are the uh, pair the the we they call the the uh, pillars. I'm sorry, if you look at the pillars right there, the B and the J, that's Boaz and Jashin. Boaz and Jashin are mentioned in the scripture. And these are the two great uh, pillars of Freemasonry. So if you go in the Bible, uh, 1 Kings 7, 15, and 22 talks about this. For he ca This is talking about the, uh, when they built the Solomon's Temple. They cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high apiece and a line of 12 cubits did compass uh, the, either of them apart. So, and it goes on talking more details about it. And it says, and he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple. And he set up the pillar on the right called, named thereafter, Jashin. And he set up the pillar on the left. They called it the name of Boaz. And upon the top of the pillars where lily work was like the work of the pillars finished. So, Second Chronicles 3 says, uh, Also he made before the house two pillars of thirty and five cubits high, and a chapter was uh, at the top of each of them was five cubits. And he made chains and the oracle and put them in the heads of the pillars and made hundred pomegranates upon them in the chains. And he read up the pillars before the temple, and one on the right hand and one on the left. And he called the name of the right Jashin, and the one on the left was called Boaz. So as you can see there. So, and they back this up. When you get into the, when you first join Masonry, they'll show you all the biblical scripture. Talking about all this stuff. But, if you actually look at it, that's not actually the, the actual pillars of Josh and Boaz. are a little tweaked compared to the actual ones in King Solomon's temple. And if you know anything about King Solomon, it's not a guy you should be revering. Because King Solomon became very, very corrupt and evil toward his latter days. That's why God allowed Israel's enemies to take over. And as, uh, we're going to get to all the symbolism there. And um, yeah, <laughs> nothing Christian about this at all. And this goes back uh, that the coffin ritual. Uh, that's, uh, I'm going to save that for another show because I'm uh, probably going to drag uh, David Carrico on uh, about that one. The dead man in the coffin ritual. Yeah, <laughs> wait till you hear this. Yeah, crazy stuff, man. A lot of Masons don't even know this until they actually get to that ninth degree. So that's what the pillars of Jachin and Boaz are. And, it, you know, they symbolize... Uh, hang on, I got to hear... Wait, 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 guys, one second. There's a monitor they have. It's called um, Duncan's Masonic Ritual Monitor. And it talks about the, um, the degrees. Hang on one second, guys. I I messed up a little bit. I was supposed to put the meanings of um, the pillars in. Anyway, but yeah, uh, it's so, just so much stuff. <laughs> so just bear with me, guys. And yeah, there's so much stuff involved here. And so basically, it represents. Uh, Equality, duality, that's exactly what it stands for. The earth are here and the earth above. Now, there's many other meanings too as you go up in the ranks of masonry. They teach you one thing and then, you know, a degree or two later they teach you something totally opposite. That's how it's led. 
So um, it's supposed to represent the you know the sun, the moon, and Sirius. Now um, I'm going to give you a little um, mystery here. Back in the day, ancient days of Egypt, the people in the land were told by the priests in Egypt they were told that the sun is God, you know, sun god Ra. But the priests never believed that. The priests believed the spirit that flew to the sun was God and the moon. But the echelon of Egypt didn't believe any of that. It was the dog star Sirius, the blazing star they call it, was God. That's what this whole thing's about. Now, when I talked about the the altar here, yeah, the altar with the Bible, well, the altar with the Bible is usually over the star. So when the, the lower rank masons come in, they barely ever see the star on the floor. Usually it's over, the, the whole altar is on wheels, it moves. So it's usually covering that star on the floor. Why would they do that? Why wouldn't the you know first three degrees ever see the star? It's called the blazing star, the dog star, Sirius. Because it starts getting into what their deity is all about. Then you got uh, the Blue Lodge here, and um, the aprons we're going to get into in a minute. The Blue Lodge is the first three degrees of Freemasonry. And let me get to Duncan's Encyclopedia here. And you can actually find this uh, encyclopedia in the Masonic Lodges, too, in the libraries. They have a great deal of books in the libraries. A lot of people don't even read them. It's crazy. So the first degree is called the Entered Apprentice. It's when you first join Freemasonry. And this is the little rituals that you do. And Lodge Enter Apprentice, Fellow Crafts, and Master Masons. So this is the first three degrees is called the Blue Lodge. Normally, it's like uh, Blue Lodge is mostly Christians in that Blue Lodge. It's the first three degrees, and uh, they do a lot of rituals and uh, oaths and everything else. We're going to get into all this stuff, and I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible. It's tough to do that because uh, trying to explain this to new people is very... Because I've been doing it all these years. It's so hard to articulate to the person that doesn't know anymore. Years ago, I was good at it because you always teaching new people. Now, you talk to a lot of people and your peers. You understand the stuff, so you could actually... You know, show it, whatever the case for what it is. So, so it's hard to articulate to new people. So the Blue Lodge in Freemasonry is the first three degrees. And when you get into the Lodge, you see this on the altar, a holy Bible with the square and compass on top of it. And the altar is usually over that dog star, the place on Star Sirius, which we'll get into a little bit more details in a second here. So the degrees, the first three degrees, is uh, the first degree is called the Entered Apprentice. The second is called the Fellow Craft, or the second degree. And the third degree is called the Master Mason, or third degree. Now, what they do is they give you these grander titles to make you feel important. To get each one of these things, you've got to go do a series of rituals. You have to learn uh, hand tokens, uh, secret handshakes, um, secret codes, and all that stuff to get to this thing, okay? And uh, you're always learning secrets, all the time. All the time, you're learning secrets. And then uh, Manly P. Hall, Manly Palmer Hall, we're going to get to that in a little while, too, uh, who he was. Philosopher, one of the most famous Freemasons of his time. He even says that it's intentionally, we're going to get to the quote later, it's intentionally that the Mason, the candidate, is misled every step of the way. They openly say the lie, literally lie to, up and you know, till they get you to that perfect cornerstone. It's like high school, you know what I mean? You're, in, you're a freshman, you think you're king of the world because you're in high school now. Yeah, <laughs> you're getting beat up by the um, the seniors. You know what I mean? And you know, you get the point from there. That's how it is. And uh, so when you're at this uh, grand title, you're a master mason. The name Master Mason sounds great, right? Well, <laughs> no, because you got 30 more degrees to go. <laughs> You're just starting, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you got the Entered Apprentice, the Fellow Craft, and the Master Mason's first three degrees of what they call the Blue Lodge. And you walk into the lodge, and there's a beautiful holy Bible up on the altar with the square and compass, which is an abomination when you find out what the square and compass is actually is. It's not... And I don't know how to express this right. Um, yeah. So when you first join Freemason, all right, everything you get told, everything is a lie. Just want to let you know that. When you join Freemason, all right, enter the apprentice, uh, even fellow craft, even master mason. Now the thing is, as you're going up, you're starting to learn more. They don't tell you everything right away. They don't tell you the truth right away. 
you learn that the square and compass has many, many, many meanings as you're moving up in the ranks. Same thing with the all and I. When you get towards the eye of providence, <laughs> not even close. And when we eventually get to learn it's the eye of Horus, no. Then, I know it's going to sound far-fetched, but follow me here. You will get told at the end that the all and I is the eye of Lucifer. We're going to get into this stuff here. Yeah? Everything you get told, in the first, especially in the first three degrees, is a lie. And they tell you, they say, well, nobody else knows this information. It's historic. They pump you up like that. You know, that's why they use movies like National Treasure to recruit people in Freemasonry. And I almost got duped into it, too, because it, it sounds so cool. It's about history, American history, all the secrets and stuff like that. And, uh, and they make it sound so cool, you know what I mean, which they do. They really, really do sell a good product, okay, plain and simple. And until you find out, yeah, you're learning things that the public doesn't know, but you're being lied to about the public, what the public doesn't know yet. Because the thing is, they're not going to pour all their information onto a new person. Their goal is for, um, to, which you'll find out later, about the cornerstone. Your, their goal is to shape you, you know, to them, you're a block. That's all you are. They want to shape you into that perfect cornerstone. And along the way as they're shaving you into that perfect cornerstone, they're literally philosophically changing who you are. That's why I said atheists, atheists don't go to Freemasonry. There ain't no atheists in Freemasonry. And if you're in the occult, you go through the ranks like no tomorrow. We'll get to some more about the ranks here. So now as you move into what's called the Red Lodge. You know, the Red Lodge is the fourth degree and up. And there's two, there's two sects to this too as well. Wait till you see this in a minute. So the Red Lodge is where you become the fourth degree. Which is called the Mock Master. And that's where your journey just begins. When you think you're a Master Mason, you think you're the, the cat's meow. <laughs> Not even close. You move into the Blue Lodge as a fourth degree. When you graduate into the fourth degree, you're called a Mock Mason. And that's one, just when your journey begins. <laughs> you start all over again, basically. So everything you got told as a Blue Lodge member is out the window, literally. You start learning the process all over again. Then slowly you start learning about, oh, what is that star on the floor mean? Oh, what could that possibly be? Then you end up learning, it's that called the Blazing Star, the Dog Star, they call it. That's why... You ever see Sirius Satellite Radio shows a dog for the promo? It's called the Dog Star. This is ancient. Back to the ancient days of Egypt. They actually worship the star Sirius. That's why everything's aligned in D.C. and the Vatican and all the major cities in the world around this constellation. It's called, the Masons call it the, seven, the sign of the seven stars and the three stars. We'll get into that to another show. That's a whole new ball of wax altogether to even talk about. And um, that's uh, Orion's belt. That's very particular with uh, Nimrod. So they believe uh, when you're looking up at that, the, the, that constellation is a Pleiades. It's Pleiades and Orion. Orion's within the star constellation of Pleiades. You're actually looking into the underworld. That's what they believe. And a lot of people believe is where a lot of the, um, the realm where a lot of the fallen angels are held. And they said that's um, Osiris, not a coincidence that's similar to Sirius, but Osiris, known as Nimrod, he went to rule this underworld. So, yeah, there's very significant, very creepy stuff, man. And uh, they built all of D.C. around this. All of D.C. was built around that. All of Egypt was built around that. All of Paris, France was built around that. All of the Vatican was built around that. Not a coincidence that all these major cities in the world built around this particular star system. So, uh, again, I'm just covering um, uh, yeah, the tip of the iceberg here. <laughs> and we're going to get to all this stuff as time goes on. So, this is what the general order looks like when we just talked about. Join masonry. Uh, right at the bottom, you see, it says... Uh, Entered apprentice, fellow craft, and the master mason is only the first three degrees of your initiation. Now, when you graduate or move on to a fourth degree, now you have a thing. It's called the Shriners Pass. And what you do is you go through, um, you decide to take the right path or the left path. The Scottish right is uh, known as the right path, and the left path is the York right. The York right, you move up a little bit quicker. The ranks are a lot quicker. 
there's less degrees to move up to, but ultimately uh, you move up to, you know, quick to the 33rd degree. It's the quicker way up. And the Scottish way, I mean, we're going to get into the stuff too. And uh, how Albert Pike created the 33rd degree for the Scottish right. And with the York Raiders, and uh, we're going to cover that mainly in the next show. I uh, just want to get to the basics of this. And the Blue Lodge is, again, the first and second, third degree. The the fourth degree and up is called the Red Lodge, in, you know, in which is you go the right path or the left path. And I don't know if you've ever seen uh, portraits, pictures of people in magazines, even B Pat Robinson, right? Pat Robinson, supposed to be a Christian, right? He was in Time Magazine. I should have put this up. You could go actually go look this up for yourself. Pat Robinson's in Time Magazine go like this. Who does that? Neil Armstrong, he's got a little pocket in this thing. He puts his hand in his pocket like this, his fingers in it. You see so many portraits, even uh, Prince uh, Harry. Every time he's taking a picture, he's got his hand in his sleeve, under his coat, or um, in the pocket, something like that. Why are they doing that for? You see tons of the stuff, and you won't notice it now. I mean, you notice it now that I mention it. And when you go out in public, you're going to see portraits and pictures of famous people, or TV, everywhere else, that happen to be doing this. In their sleeve of the coat. Or that well, their pocket, with their right hand or the left hand, and that's shown you. That's shown other masons around the world that what path they belong to, the right-handed path or the left-handed path. And if you know anything about the occult, the right hand, the path is supposed to be um, the lighter side, which is not okay. And the left-handed path is a direct path. It's pure evil, plain and simple. You worship Lucifer. The right-hand path is the longer way to Lucifer. That's, you know, we're going to leave it at short there. So there's the degrees, and I hope I'm making sense to people out there. And uh, stop me if I'm not. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, I just wanted the Haley and... Hey, Leanne, you, uh, you got um, the question you posed, and I know it's off topic, is the original Bible actually against gay people... I just wanted to uh, address that real quick. And yeah, you know what, Haley? You know what? If you want, call in at the end of the show. We're going to have open topics and all that. If you stay in the show, call in and present that question. I want you to. Because I want to show you the truth about that. It's not against gay people. It's against the sin being gay. You know what I mean? Well, I'll explain it to you. So, Haley, if you're still watching, I know you got timed out. Just wait for the end of the show, and I invite you to call into the show or propose that question again, and I'll answer it. Just wait until the show's over. Um, because that's a very important question that people um, that don't know the Bible too much should know. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm sorry, guys, moving back here. So and speaking of Bible, because this is all to do with, um, they use all kinds of uh, religions, Eastern religions. So basically what the Freemasonry is a combination of, yes, biblical, and which are not biblical at all, but they'll take anybody from any religion into the craft, they call it. And there's a reason why it's called the craft. And they build you up all the long the ranks there. And this is, um, this is, uh, we're going to get to this next week. This is something that's beyond, uh, you know, understand at this point right now for new people. So these are the, um, the Blue Lodge Masonry, the Scottish Rite or the York Rite Masonry. Then it goes higher. It goes up to actually, uh, I think 360 degrees or whatever it was, uh, the ancient right of Miseram, the Memphis Miseram. And there's other uh, sects of masonry that are much higher, ancient orders and everything else that go higher up the, the ladder. The OTO, them needs the different orders, the order of the trapezoid, the Illuminati, the Palladium, uh, the Nine No Men, the Seven, uh, the, you know, it's so entrenched. So when you're at that Blue Lodge of Masonry, you're at the very, very, very bottom. And the thing is, you I don't care if you're a master mason and uh, you're listening, you have no clue, like, other than the study manuals that they gave you for the fourth degree, no clue what you're getting into when you're moving to the, the Red Lodge. And whether you decide to go the York or Scottish right, you have no clue. Then a shrine, you're at, oh, wow. <laughs> Talking about uh, insanity. Okay, then you get to the Grand Sovereign Inspectors General, so that's the 33rd degree, uh, and the Supreme Council of Grand Sovereign Inspectors, then you get the Order of Trapezoid, that's where it starts really getting, occultish is no tomorrow, and it goes up, so I'm not going to uh, confuse people right now, just going to focus on the basics of Freemasonry and show you where, uh, you know, if you're a professing Christian, uh, you should not be involved in this uh, order. 
I'm not going to judge you for that, but you know what I mean? This is what I'm going to show you. And these are some of the groups here, the Rainbow Girls, the Job's Daughters, the Malays, uh, the White Shrine, the Daughters of the Nile, the Orders of the Eastern Star, these are for women here. Yeah? For youth is the Demoys, the Job's Daughters. So basically, let me go through this real quick. For young girls, young boys, I'm sorry, they go to the Demoys. Jacques Demoys was a famous Freemason. He was a, an, a French revolutionist. And if anybody knows anything about him, he was into the occult and pedophilia. So it's kind of you know weird that they would call their boys organization after one of them. So then for the girls, you have Job's Daughters and the Rainbow Girls. The little girls. So... The women's sect is the Order of the Eastern Star that was created by Aleister Crowley. The Daughters of the Nile and the White Shrine. Then they have the, um, oh, what's that one called? The Prince Hall for the Black Folks. It's called Prince Hall Masonic Lodge for Black Folks. But in the regular Masonic Lodges, uh, yeah, that's uh, for men only. And as you can see, the degrees that they go up. And uh, each uh, sect there, the Scottish Rite and the York Rite. And they go up those degrees there until they get to the 33rd degree called the Grand Sovereign Inspector General. He's the the head honcho of the lounge. Lounge, I'm sorry. He's like you know, literally the, the president of the lodge. And to get to that level, man, you got to spend your entire life in, um, in, in Freemasonry to even get to that. Thousands of dollars and dollars, um, tons of degrees, uh, you know, going up the rank there. You got to learn so many codes, uh, tokens, rituals. Uh, I mean, it's crazy, man. So this is what basically it looks like. I mean, right, you got the York right up there, the way up to the top. And everything's based off a pyramid thing. That's where um, you know those business where they call it the pyramid scheme. That's where this come from. And the reason why I say that for because... Each degree, like you're at the bottom, the very bottom, you just begun your um, entered apprentice, <laughs> and you're paying fees, you're paying dues, you pay fees for the degree rituals, you pay dues every uh, month or so, and what happens is um, your that money goes right up the ladder, it goes right up to the people at the top, they're collecting all that money, and it just trickles right down into the ladder. They got tons and tons of people at the bottom that pay the rituals and dues. The people at the top make the money. And it's the same scheme that the businesses use because they were Freemasons that designed all that, the pyramid scheme. They tell you, oh, come show, sell insurance or something. And um, and if you get people under you, you can make money off them. See how that works? And in the meantime, you're making them money at the top. And the people at the top don't even do nothing. They just sit there and collect your money you work for. So all those years you spend each degree, thousands of dollars of ritual fees and everything else, and you're learning tons of tokens. In the meantime, most of the time you're being lied to about everything. Everything. The true intent of the pyramids, I mean, uh, pyramids, I'm sorry, the true intent of the pillars of Jash and Boaz, the all C and I, the, um, the trowel, so many different things. The, I mean, it's crazy. And these are aprons they use. They usually use a lambskin. Uh, but yeah, these are different aprons because uh, a mason would have an apron to cover their loins from the tools that they use because they're, you know, stone masons. You know what I mean? That's where it really comes from. And no, uh, not every mason's a stone mason. And some people don't even know how to touch them, they wouldn't even know what to do with a brick or a rock and put it together or a wall. Uh, it's just a thing of called Freemasonry. In today's world, uh, most of the Freemasons are not Masons at all. You know what I mean? Because there's Masons out there. I mean, like people do construction that put up walls and stuff. Those are the original builders. You know what I mean? That's where uh, Freemasonry derived off of the ancient builders, the ancient temples. So why do Freemasons wear white aprons? So Freemasons wear a white apron to represent themselves as a Mason in a stated communication at Blue Lodge. The color white comes from the lambskin material in which was made from entered apprentices, fellow craft, and master masons wear, that's the first three degrees, wear the aprons in a different way to signify their rank in the fraternity. A master mason can be buried wearing the apron at his death as well. Now, if you notice too, in colleges, when you join a fraternity in college, right, what happens? You have to go through different rituals, right? Yeah, it's crazy stuff that you got to go through to be accepted into the fraternity. Now, granted, college fraternities are not Masonic lodges, but that's they get the stuff from these uh, secret societies. 
So what is the history of the white apron? And originally, the apron was worn by an operative masons to protect themselves from rough stones and tools. As a fraternity evolved into more speculative society where men free born of lawful age could join the Freemasons, the Masonic apron essentially was kept to remember the workmen of our orig- origins. I'm sorry. So again, most Masons today are not actually Masons. You know what I mean? So um, working Masons, I just say. But these days, the white leather apron... As a badge of fraternal brotherhood and a reminder of the lessons in the uh, three degrees of Freemasonry. It should serve as a reminder to uh, Master Masons that regular sit in the lodge and not their obligations or commitments they had promised to uphold the values of brotherly love within the craft. So, if you're actually looking at this stuff, and it's very um, a lot of biblical references that they use. If you see that stairway there, um, they refer that uh, from Jacob's ladder, if you will, the stairway to heaven. They had a song about that too. That's very significant with that. These pillars, with these different people standing upon them, there's very significance with that. The all C and I, um, the star, the blazing star. It's usually a pentagram, whatever the case. Uh, what they call the blazing star, the pillars of Jashin and Boaz. When you get into that, they'll give you false biblical interpretations of every one of those things. They'll tell you that eye right there. Oh, that's the eye of Providence, which, which is God. That's the eye of Providence. He watches us over us. Oh, those those are just the pillars of Jashin and Boaz, the same pillars that they used in the Temple of Solomon. Oh, that, don't worry about that. That's just the stairway to heaven. That's what they tell when you when you first join the Masonic Lodges, when you start going to the monitors. And for the record, I got tons of the stuff. I got several books at home. I'm like another David Carrico when it comes to stuff. I got um, tons of Masonic uh, monitors from the Masonic Lodges. I got study books, too, from... Um, this is a good book, uh, Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robinson. This is something totally uh, further uh, when we get to the other shows about masonry. But William Schnoblin, a uh, former Freemason... He wrote a book on uh, Masonry Beyond the Light. That's kind of where I got the title for the tonight show. They put Behind the Light. Uh, the Doctors Behind the Light. But yeah, William Schnoblin uh, reveals a lot of this stuff and more. Uh, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy by Gary Wayne. He talks about this, some of the stuff too. About the ancient builders and stuff. And um, now, Masonic material, like I said, I showed you that monitor. And these are books here I do not suggest anybody to buy. Uh, coming up. The ones I just showed you, yes, definitely. But... This book here, especially, um, it's called The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Uh, it's by Manly Palmer Hall. This is a very, very, we're going to uh, run some quotes by it, too, by the way, uh, when we get into the show. Uh, so this is a very disgusting book. Uh, Manly P. Hall was known as uh, a great philosopher. He was one of the famous Freemasons of his time. But, yeah, nothing great about this man. And this book, I mean... Uh, yeah, uh, I told my wife if something happens to me, this book and a few others I'm going to show you to, to burn these things because um, these things are evil as they come. Uh, especially this one here. This one is from the straight out of the gates of hell. And mind you, you can go into your Masonic Lodge right now if you're a Mason. You'll find these books in your Masonic Lodge. This one here is called Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. This is uh, beyond garbage, okay? This is uh, probably... Uh, one of the most evil things that were ever created. And you see on the front, that's the symbol of Mamun Ra, which is the Egyptian god of war and, uh, was it war and power. War and money, I'm sorry, riches and money. Power and money, whatever the case, power and wealth. So, uh, double-headed eagle, you see that in different places. And that's a symbol for the 33rd degree, which Albert Pike, he was the creator of the 33rd degree for the Scottish Rite. So, um, we'll explain that in a little while. Uh, so, notice how it says ancient and accepted right. Yeah, and this book is horrendous. All right? And I, I have these books because um, to know your enemy, expose them. To be, because I can tell people, hey, it's from your own books. This ain't no conspiracy theory videos, something off YouTube. This is from your own material. Then you got Albert Pike's, uh, Al- no, Albert Mackey's Encyclopedia of Masonry. Uh, you got um, more other books too by Manly P. Hall, other books by Albert Pike, books by Aleister Crowley. It's tons and tons of material that lie right within your uh, Masonic Lodges libraries. And most Masons will read them. And I guarantee if you are you claim to be a professing Christian and you're a Mason, I challenge you, I challenge you, 
Go into your, take a day off. Go into your Masonic Lodge's library. And I want you to read these books. And you tell me that this is a, uh, a place for Christians to be. And we're not even done yet. We've got tons of stuff. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Then you got to learn that's not the stairway to heaven. Then you got to learn, no, that's not the eye of product. <laughs> By all means, that's not God's eye. Then you got to learn that that God is not what who you think is. It's not the God of the Bible. It's the God of Kabbalah. That's uh, we're going to cover next week. <laughs> and you all see this on the back of the dollar bill. Yeah, we did a whole show, I mean, whole documentary on this. Me and David Carrico and uh, Doc Marquis. So there's nothing providence about that eye on the top of that pyramid. Nothing. The thousand points of illumination around it. This is what top of Freemasonry is. And masonry spelled out right in there. And we got that. We cover all that in that documentary. I'm just trying to go through um, the significance here. And you all get, again, you're told, oh, it's Aya Providence. It's, it's no Illuminati Dan. It's the Aya Providence. Then later on, when you you know start moving up the ranks, you get to the Red Lodge and everything. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's not the Aya Providence. It's actually the Aya of Horus, the so called sun god. It's, you know, because he watches over you. Then eventually you'll learn when you get to the very top, and don't take my word for it, but read it for yourself. You'll learn that's the eye of Lucifer, Satan himself. And now we get to a trowel. I mean, this is one of the tools, many tools that the Freemasons have. A trowel is basically used to for bricklaying. You put the bricks, put the bricks in place, and you put the, um, the you know, whatever the paste is, uh, the cement, uh, whatever they use. Uh, I'm not a bricklayer, so I don't know. Uh, the mortar, I should say. So you put the mo the mortar makes the bricks stick together. So you lay the mortar down with the trowel. So they get um, the ceremonial trowel for the rituals. And a trowel, and T is for the tools of the first three degrees. R is for every rule as each brother agrees. O is for the oath and masking all brothers true. Making all brothers true, I'm sorry. W is for... The work each one of us must do. E is for the effort to answer every call. L is, stands for love, the most important thing of all. These uh, let us spell trowel in a every brother knows spreads love and friendship wherever he goes. So that's um that's what the meaning of the, the trowel is in Freemasonry. And we, as a character, a couple characters you're going to hear mainly in Freemasonry. One is called Hiram Abiff. Now, the thing is, when you first join Masonry, yeah, you're a Christian, come on in. But you soon, real soon, start to learn that the word, the name Jesus Christ doesn't appear at all in Freemasonry. At all. Then you start to question, why is there even a Bible in here? Because they talk more about Hiram Abiff, more about Solomon, more about Tubal Cain. Tubal Cain was... um. They believe he survived the flood. He's one of the Nephilim that survived the flood. He was another Cain, a descendant of Cain. That's what me, Tubal Cain means, another Cain. Uh, so that's uh, all history altogether. But you start to learn about these characters. Yeah, they're biblical, but they're on the wrong side of the fence, okay? And you start to learn more about these than Jesus Christ. And you'll quickly see that, that you, you know, it's even condemned to even say such a thing that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Because uh, it's all about a universal religion. That's what they're about. So the legend of Master Builder, Hiram Abiff, is the greatest allegory of masonry. It happens that his figurative story is grounded on a fact of personality mentioned in Holy Scripture, but the historical background of his accidents and not the essence, uh, the significance is an allegory, uh, not in any point of history which may lie behind it. That came from the New England Encyclopedia, the New Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. So you you see not a lot. So you gotta see these uh, characters pop up and everything. Then uh, yeah, and uh, see there's stairs here, right? And we explain what the all three and I is. We round about what it is. Uh, the pillars of Jash and Boaz, and you end up learning that represents the androgynous god. The androgynous means. Um, in the long run, okay, we'll get to details later, uh, that they believe that 
God himself is both male and female. They believe the Holy Spirit is a female, which is pure blasphemy. That's the unforgivable sin. Then they believe that Satan and God are the same person. How stupid and blasphemy that is, that's what they believe. That square and compass, you see? Yeah, it's not just the tools. It's because you, me, um, get into this, right? And also, these pillars mean male and female too, sun and moon. They refer to the sun as a male and the moon as a female. It gets into a Diana goddess worship and everything. Uh, and <laughs> it's so occultic, it really is. So most people go to the lodge have no clue. No clue what the hell are they even looking at. They give them false interpretations of all this. Oh, how could it be bad? That's the eye of God prominence. That's the pillars of judgment, Boaz. And this is all biblical. You know, they'll lay biblical references down. Not even close. And um, the square compass, that is actually, if you learn, everything in the occultic world is perverted. The square and compass represents not only the Kabbalah style, but also represents a man mounting a woman. That's what it means in sexual intercourse. The G spot. Why do you think there's a G involved? People say, oh, it's grand architect in the universe. It stands for God when you first get in there. Oh, grand architect later. Then Gnostics God later. And the G spot is perverted. I mean, you all we're all adults here. Yeah? And uh, you all heard that phrase one way or another. Oh, you got to find her G spot. That, that's where it all comes from. It's complete perversion sexuality in the occult. You learn all this stuff later. You'll never learn any of this in the Blue, uh, the Blue Lodge. None of it. Then you get to these, um, these stairs, these ceremonial stairs. They have them in every lodge. What do those mean? Well, first you got the hearing, seeing, feeling, smelling, tasting. That, those are the senses a human being has. Then, as you go up, you got grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Those are called the seven sacred sciences that were allegedly taught to Adam by God. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Gary Wayne, in his book, uh, The Conspiracy Six, Genesis Six Conspiracy by Gary Wayne, he points this out uh, because there's two versions of this so called seven sacred sciences. So... Again, we're laid out the seven sacred sciences. Uh, you got grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. All right, and this is what we're all taught in school, right? These are the prime classes we're all taught in school, right? Uh, you know, in the education system. However, here's the thing about this: all that there is nothing at all what they teach in school, nothing. And these. Seven sacred sciences that God taught Adam. This or what we learn in school is nothing. Totally different from what, what the truth is. So what happened? Okay, I'll explain this. i try to explain the details. God, yes, he taught Adam and his descendants um, the, called the seven sacred sciences. And what the occult did, and everything in the occult is perverted and also opposite mirror image of what God teaches. This is ancient writings and all that stuff. And uh, they, they taught this, uh, which we call the bastardized version of the seven sacred sciences, completely twisted. It was taught to men by the fallen angels. And um, it was uh, Cain and the son, um, the evil Enoch. And one of his sons, uh, what text his name? Uh, Lamech, the evil Lamech. There's two Enochs and two Lamechs, uh, you know, on two different bloodlines. The evil Enoch and the evil Lamech, taught, um, before the flood, they preserved all that knowledge in tombs and made markers and all that for the people later on after the flood to stumble upon this knowledge and return it to the earth. And they were taught this by the fallen angels. They were taught this by the evil spirits who were on the earth. They were the bastardized version of the sacred sciences that God taught men. And through the bloodline of Seth, they preserved the real original seven sacred sciences. And in today's world, the seven sacred sciences that these occultists know, nothing, everything you learn in school, okay, all the stuff you learn in school, that's a, a splinter. 
a fragmented splinter, and most of it's a twisted splinter of what they know. But even what they know is uh, a perverted twist to the real seven sacred sciences. But they think they got the real solutions. They think they got the real seven sacred sciences, and the whole world doesn't know that. They know, and they, they're right. The world doesn't know anything what they believe. And if they did, it would be a whole different world. What is taught in the schools is, um, all right, their version, okay, their version, and they took a little micro fraction off of it, polluted it, diluted it, and all this stuff, and put it into the school systems. This is what the world knows. People got the GAD, I'm sorry, uh, PhDs and the diplomas and the doctrines on something off this. They know this, okay? And this is nothing but a twist and mangle version of this. That's all it is. But this is nothing compared to God's version. <laughs> you know what I mean? If that makes any sense. Uh... So, they think they got the sacred knowledge. And no, you don't learn any of that stuff in school or college. You could spend 50 years in the college or university and you'll never learn anything. And yes, there's more truth in that than what we learned in school. But again, there's a lot of twisted stuff in that truth. And the only truth you do learn is from God. True wisdom comes from the Lord. True enlightenment. And the thing about Freemasonry, here's the thing. It's all about enlightenment. It's all about uh, illumination. You hear that all the time. To carve you into that perfect cornerstone. To bring you to the light. What do you think that ladder's for? They call it a tracing board, by the way. Uh, we'll go back here. Right there on the right. That's called a tracing bud. You had a journey up to the light. And that light is not heaven, guys. <laughs> that light up there is the dog star serious. Complete Luciferian doctrine. And those are not angels you see. Those are, you know, they depict them as angels to lure good people into the uh, Freemasonry. Nothing at all angelic about that. Nothing. So if you're still drinking on joining Freemasonry, I mean, already I hope and pray that this, you know, I still got more to come, yeah. That you uh, second uh, thought this, because this is only touching the tip of the iceberg. And we got more stuff to cover here, so um, this is one of the encyclopedias, uh, it's called Albert Mackey, his uh, encyclopedia on Freemasonry. And Albert Mackey was a revered uh, Freemason, by the way. And there's some of the references here. You got Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry. And here's the thing about rituals, right? Uh, I'm going to go back there quick. Before you move any further. So, is the thing about Freemasonry, they do something called oaths and rituals. Yeah, as you can see here, Duncan's oath, and it shows you, like, uh, Enter the Apprentice. What they must do, and they gotta uh, learn secret handshakes and whatnot, uh, secret terms and codes, and uh, do certain rituals, and they take a blood oath. Let me see if I can scroll down to the oath here. Every degree accompanies an oath that if you give up its secrets, you could be killed. And back in the days, you were killed if you uh, exploit anything with Freemasonry. You uh, did any such things, you would be killed. And now today, of course, it's a little lighter now, but... And look at the certain uh, stance they have to make. I mean, there's so many of them. So many stance and uh, gestures you got to know. This is only for the first degree and such. <laughs> you got to know all these things. Different uh, signals. A Grand Halen uh, sign of distress. And that right there with his hands up, that's where uh, actually Joseph Smith... Uh, he was the founder of uh, Mormonism. He was a Freemason. Uh, when he was uh, killed in the Chicago prison, I think it was Chicago prison, one of the prisons he was killed at, uh, Freemason, uh, what they'll do is they'll hold their hands up like that, and they'll yell, is there any help for a widow's son? Now, who is the widow's son? It's uh, Hiram and Biff. That's a uh, grand hailing signal of distress. So anybody that's a Freemason in the area will come out and help you. That's what uh, Joseph Smith used when he was on his diet. Then he made, uh, my God, my God, I forgot uh, the rest of what he said. But, but yeah, he yelled out, is there any help for a widow's son? 
And not even the Freemasons wanted anything to do with him at the time because the guy was a complete lunatic. But yeah, that's, these are the things you got to memorize as... And it goes... Where, I mean, there's so much involved. It's only the first degree. You got to learn different codes and uh, alphabets and it's insane. And uh, rituals, you take a blood oath ritual... It's the Feldcraft degree, and uh, so you get the point. And uh, the oath they take, and this is the oath of the first degree. So tell me right now, and we're going to get to the Bible verses, though. Yeah, and those of you who know uh, the Bible very well, you already know exactly how bad taking oaths are. As Jesus said, you know what I mean? Don't swear upon any oaths. But check this out. Tell me this is what a Christian should be doing. A first degree Mason. When you officially become a first degree, you got to memorize this. Binding myself under no less penalty than having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out by its roots, and buried in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark, which is low tide, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in 24 hours, should I ever knowingly or willingly violate my solemn oath and obligation as an entered apprentice Mason, which is that, you know, keeping secrecy. So help me God and keep me steadfast and do performance of the same. But yeah, of course they say God because they want you to believe, uh, you know, there's nothing ungodly what you're doing. Because they lure a lot of good Christians into the craft. It's nothing to do with God. So the second one is by myself under no less penalty than have my throat, my breast, I'm sorry, torn apart, my heart plucked out and given to pray to wild beasts of the field in the fowls of the air. And same thing, similar thing here, uh, that if I violate my Solomon oath as a master mason, so help me God. And let's talk about, um, this is gross, man, and uh, penalty of having my body severed in two, my bowels taken and thence burned to ashes, and ashes scattered in the four winds of heaven. So no more trace of remembrance of me uh, so vile. Uh, that's That's crazy, man. And uh, no Christian should be doing stuff. Yeah, if you think it's a joke, oh, it's just uh, an oath I'm going to take. And, uh, yeah, it's no big deal. I don't mean anything by it. That, you know, you might think so, but the the lodge, it, this is very important to them. They take this to heart. You might think it's a joke to get on to the next level. And the thing is, they promise you all kinds of grandeur, uh, grandeur names. Oh, maybe you could get your, we'll get you a better job. And if you notice a lot of top people, Mason, so they'll snow you with all that to make you sound like the, your life will go, I mean, it'll be a life of luxury, basically. You get breaks from cops, you get breaks from judges, and they do. They do. One of the, um, the greetings of a, um, a Mason, they'll come in, if you suspect somebody else being a Mason, They'll go, hey, how you doing? And like, yeah, are you a traveling man? And I think the reply is, yes, I've been to the east or something in that matter. To let them know that you're a mason without saying that, you know what I mean? So if you walk up to somebody and say, hey, are you a traveling man? They'll be like, the hell are you talking about, you know? And a uh, mason would reply with something that I forgot exactly, something that he's been to the east. Confirm that he's a mason. Then the handshakes they give, it depends on what handshake is called a token. They grab a certain knuckle to let you know what degree they are, and they grab another one if they're a Mason. To let you see them all the time in celebrities and people on TV, where leaders will shake hands, and it's always a weird handshake. Something in that matter, you can see the handshakes, the Masonic handshakes. And when I said the hands on the sleeves and everything, to let them know what path they are, the right or the left hand the path. It's all out there, right in plain sight. And when you know this now, when you go in public, you got to start seeing these things. When you watch TV, the news, and all that, you got to start seeing these things. They don't hide it. Because the thing is, here's a, the point of a symbol, because it's all symbolism. The point of a symbol, it's to conceal to those who can't see and to reveal the, to those who can. And in, within every symbol, there's uh, exoteric meaning, which is, means many, 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 many reason, uh, um, uh, meanings, but they're all false meanings. The esoteric version of a symbol is, uh, it could be, you know, of course, a symbol, you could have uh, one, two, it could be a few, maybe a dozen real meanings of that symbol. But you'll never know that. You know what I mean? This goes into like, something like a monster energy drink, right? I don't even have one here. Um, 
to them it's just advertising, corporate advertising, shows an M, but it's actually three letters of the Hebrew word, letter Vav. Release the beast at 6XX, that's exactly what it is, a six letter in alphabet. You would never see that, and uh, it's a. And the thing is, the court they do this in corporate advertisement all over uh, uh, people's properties and uh, businesses. Because well, what they'll do is like a corporation, they'll they'll uh, lease out the work. You know, the way it's like uh, they'll go to a company, right? Say, hey, listen, I need a good logo design, a good phrase for my company. You know what I mean? So they'll outsource the work, and the advertising team will get together. And these are masons. They love putting their cultic agenda something simple as a Monster Energy drink. And of course it sounds cool. And it looks like M and everything else, like Monster and all. Yeah, they do that purposely. Because it, to the world, it's just the Monster Energy Drink thing. And it conceals to those who can't see it. To the ones who can see it, it reveals to them. And it goes for anything else, you know what I mean? Every symbol of that Volkswagen bug thing, I mean, it goes so deep into that stuff. Like I said with this symbol, yeah, the square and compass. Yeah, <laughs> It's a square and compass you use for stonemasonry, absolutely, and construction. But it goes further, gets into sexual occultic rituals, the man mounting the female the, hitting the G-spot. Then you know, the Kabbalah star. It's crazy. So, I mean, it's crazy what they're doing. Uh, yeah, this is something as a Christian. Why would you be taking blood oaths? And we're going to get to the Bible verses here. In Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 33 and 37. You know what I love about the book of Matthew? The book of Matthew is like the nuclear bomb to Catholicism. It's like the nuclear bomb to Freemasonry. It's like the nuclear bomb to most of these religions out there. And when I say Catholicism, talk about the catechism. Because the book of Matthew alone destroys the catechism. It destroys uh, the book of Mormons. It destroys uh, the watchtower. It destroys the book of the dead. It destroys Freemasonry um, oaths and everything else. In the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus says to John, uh, Matthew there, and again, you have heard it had been said of them all times, you shall not forswear thyself. They shall not perform unto the Lord, uh, the Lord thine oaths. Don't take oaths. By saying to you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne. Don't swear by the earth, for it's the, his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thy swear by thy head, because you, which is the uh, life and death or you know, on your life, because you can't make one here white or black. But lay your communication, let your let your be, communication be yes, yes, or no, no. Yea is yea, no is no. And whatever else is more than this is evil. Plain and simple. Now, um, this is why I stopped taking solemn oaths. Solemn oaths came from masonry. When you hear in a quarrel where you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth, though, and they have the Bible right there sometime, and they used to put your right hand on the Bible and raise your left hand and all that. The Bible left hand to solemnly swear. That's not biblical oath. I stopped doing that a long time ago. I uh, went to the court proceedings, uh, you know, uh, I that from another time. I was at court recently, twice, right? And uh, they wanted me to do it. I said, I don't do oaths. And I brought up Matthew f chapter 5. And I told them, it's like, my yes will be yes, my no will be no. Anything else um, is of the devil, says my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because they tell you, put your right hand on the Bible, take, you know, whatever the case, don't do any of that. Don't even raise your hand. Tell them, I don't take oaths. My yes will be yes, and they call it affirmation. Because they have oaths now, and they offer you affirmation. In other words, yeah, I'm going to tell the truth. Because they have a sworn oath, then, or affirmation. I suggest people to take the affirmation. Even when you, um, there's uh, a lot of patriot groups out there, like the Oath Keepers, right? Uh, the Oath Keeper, the, um, the good people, I love them to death. You know, great patriots. But to join an organization, whatever, they make you take a, a solemn oath. Uh, that's when I first started realizing, when there's something not sitting right with me, you know, with these oaths. Then, you know, come to find out, yeah, uh, Jesus says, don't swear upon any oath, plain and simple. Goes to several examples, don't swear on any oaths. So that goes for you Freemasons out there. Every ritual you go, I mean, degree, you swear an oath, a blood oath on your blood life. Regardless of if you think it's serious or not, you're still swearing an oath. Is that something a Christian should be doing? No. Not at all. 
Especially they say solemnly swear. No, you don't solemnly swear nothing. Because it says don't even swear by heaven. <laughs> you know when people say, oh, I swear to God. I stopped doing that a long time ago. I, I, uh, it's like, how could I do that? You know what I mean? You, you, that's an oath. Remember when you tell them, I swear to God I didn't do that, Ma. Don't say that. Don't tell people that because it's, I mean, it, you're doing more harm than good. Jesus says, that you yes, be yes, you know, be no, plain and simple. Anything else is of the devil, bottom line, regardless of what you're told. So Morals and Dogma, this disgusting trash bag book I just showed you, and um, this is one of the books I told my wife to burn, not give away or sell, burn, something ever happened to me. This this thing's putrid. Uh, so I'm going to get to some quotes, okay, and again, uh, the reason why I'm getting to these quotes for, because I challenge anybody who's a Freemason, I want you to go into your own Masonic library. Every Masonic library should have this. Albert Pike was one of the most famous Freemasons. He, after all, he was the creator of the 33rd degree from the Scottish Rite. He created the 33rd degree. Okay, Confederate General Albert Pike, and he's also the backbone of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, backed by the Democratic Party. Go figure, right? I'm glad they destroyed that statue, <laughs> man. Yeah, I'm glad people woke up to that. So again, the creator of the 33rd degree for the Scottish, right? And that's a symbol used, Maman Ra, uh, ancient Egyptian symbol of God and, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, ancient Egyptian symbol of um, war and money, wealth and power. With the crown upon its head. And also the crown upon its head symbolizes the duality and the cultism. And also represents the androgynous, uh, good and evil, male-female deity, which is Kabbalah. And Albert Pike was into big into Kabbalah. And if you actually look at every one of these uh, leading, revered Freemasons, you'll find out all of them were into Kabbalah. They don't tell you that to the very last, when they finally realize that uh, Masonry is a religion of Kabbalah. The dead man in the coffin ritual, it's uh, Rabbi Bar Yoshi. We're going to cover that some other time, but anti-Masons claim, Albert Pike wrote, that which we must say to the crowd, and it's not claimed because he actually did write it. We got the doctrines to prove it. It's right in, um, right in Morals and Dogma. So I got this off some site that says uh, anti-Masons because I found a quote instead of typing it out myself. But yeah, uh, that which we may must to the say much to the crowd, we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. To the sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of its initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. Adonai is another way name for Jehovah, another name for Yahweh, and so on. So, what are you, what are you seeing here? This is Kabbalah. And no, this is um, not an anti-Mason claim. And whoever put this out, you know, in derogatory. This is what Albert Pike stated. They believe that God, okay, is both Lucifer and Adonai, God. You know, or Yahweh, whatever you want to call him. They believe it's both Satan and God at the same time, and male and female. And they believe the Holy Spirit is a female. That's Kabbalah, plain and simple. That's the true religion of Freemasonry. At the very highest orders, it's Kabbalah. Ancient Kabbalah, which is pure Satanism. I mean, that's the, the highest form of Satanism or, or Luciferianism, whatever you want to call it, as it comes. That's what you're worshiping. And you don't, most people don't even know. And check this out. You got Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike right here, the book I just showed you. Page 63 says, It is Satan attempting to clothe himself in the angelic vesture of light. And go to page 245, 245 or 246. The apocalypse is to those who received the ninth degree, 19th degree, I'm sorry. So those uh, receiving the 19th degree, the prophecies of that subline faith, which aspires to God alone, and despises all the pomps of the works of Lucifer, Lucifer the light bearer. Strange and mysterious name to give the spirit of darkness, Lucifer. The son of the morning star, it is he who bears the light. 
and with it, splendors, intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual, and uh, selfish souls, doubt it not. For our traditions are full of divine relations and inspirations, and inspiration is not of age or, or one of creed, Plato, Plato, I'm sorry, and Philo. Also were inspired. And in, within this book, uh, Moral's Dogma, Satan's mentioned 22 times, Lucifer 6, the devil 8 times. Now, if you go to 2 Corinthians uh, 11, uh, verse 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself transformed into an angel of light. So, um, yeah, it's not anti-Mason. This is right in your own doctrines. Albert Pike was a Luciferian. Plain and simple. And he was into the Kabbalah. It is the religion of Freemasonry. And we're not done yet. If you go to the, this disgusting book, um, another revered Mason. It's called The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly Palmer Hall. This is him right here. He says in his book, Pages 35 and 36, the true Mason is not creed bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that a Mason, his religion must be universal. So, would Christians uh, acknowledge Buddha or Muhammad? He says universal. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the names mean little. Right there, the names mean little to them. For he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships every shrine. Bows before every altar, whether it's temple, mosque, or cathedral. You know, there's every religion you got to bow to. That's not something Christians should be doing. Realizing with this true understanding that the ones of all spiritual truth, all true Masons know that the only are heathen too, that they are, he I'm sorry, all true Masons know that they only are heathens too. Is that something you want to call yourself as a Christian? That you're a heathen too? Having great ideals, do not live up to them. They know that all religions are but one story told in diverse ways for people whose ideals suffer, but whose great purposes is in harmony with the Masonic ideals. And uh, page 78, it's the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. When the Mason learns that the key, and it's more to it, and it goes on to is the proper application of the dynamo of living power. He has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hand. This is prominent. For, this is more. A lot more. These are prominent Freemasons telling you that this is a Luciferian doctrine. 33rd degree Freemason. One of the most prominent Masons of his time. Uh, they called him a great philosopher. He wasn't. All talking about Lucifer. And the Kabbalah. And you go to page 18. It says Freemasonry is a philosophy which is essentially creedless. It is true for that it bows to the truth regardless of the bearer. It, let me read that again and highlight. It, it, it's brothers, right? Which is Freemason. Everybody in Freemasonry. Bow to the truth regardless of the bearer. Regardless of the bearer, I mean, Jesus is the only truth. So saying, you know, this is crazy. They're telling you anybody, is, you know, what they perceive as the truth. And they serve light instead of wrangling over the one who brings it. So it doesn't matter who brings it, they're saying, we're going to bow to the truth, what they perceive as the truth. That's not something Christians should be doing. And I know we got these uh, poor excuses of Christian churches today that bow to this universalism. Oh, uh, we all serve the same God. No, we don't. In this way, they prove that they are seeking to know better and will and dictates the invincible one. No truer religion exists than the word, the world, I'm sorry, comradeship and brotherhood for the purpose of glorifying one God and building him up, him a temple of constructed attitude and noble character. And again, the God they're talking about is an androgynous God, both male, female, Satan, and uh, God, and the same thing. They want you to believe that God is some kind of a hermaphrodite with split complexions and personalities. <laughs> that's not that's not the whole, uh, the God of, of the universe. It's not the God of the Bible. It's not the God of creation. That's the Kabbalah God. We're gonna cover more Kabbalah stuff uh, in another show when we do the part two to this. And if you go, uh, Anton Sandel Lavey, uh, he, he was the founder of the Church of Satan. 
Big time follower of Alistair Crowley. And we didn't even touch Alistair Crowley yet. Alistair Crowley was known as a beast. He was, um, he was very, I mean, he was worshipped, basically, in Freemasonry. He belonged to so many secret societies. I mean, he, he even said uh, he was having a hard time remembering all the handshakes, tokens, and gestures. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, he formed the Church of Satan. He created the thing called the Satanic Bible, even though they claim today they're atheists, which is a complete oxymoron. You don't call yourself a Church of Satan or a Satanist if you don't believe in Satan. It's just a couple, it's like me saying I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> a complete oxymoron. But regardless, Anton Sanders LeVay himself was a, a very prominent Freemason. He wrote the Satanic Bible, the Satanic Rituals, and this is what he said. And if you go to the book, and it's pages 144 to 46, he says. But now, even the most hardened of skeptics should be convinced that Freemasonry is Lucifer Satan worship. However, for those who may still need more convincing, let us consider the infernal names by which Masonry masks its many references to Satan. The Satanic Bible, we see uh, 77 names which pagans have referred to Satan over the centuries. Let us quickly review some of those infernal names of Satanism found within the missionary. So, because Anton LaVey is trying to He's not. He's not uh, talking bad about Freemasonry. He's a revering Freemasonry. He's exalting it and saying, "Yes, we have the same similarities." That's Anton Sanders away saying the religion of uh, Freemasonry is loose of worship. And it goes deep, too. I mean, it goes into history. So um, this was also the sixth president of the United States, John Quincy Adams, not to be confused with his father, John Adams. I think John Adams was what, the second president. Uh, but you regardless, okay, but he, he was around Freemasons, okay? He understood what was going on. Now, I want to uh, clarify some uh, confusion within Freemasonry here in the United States and the Founding Fathers. A lot of people believe because they were a Freemason, they were a bad person. No, no not, that's not the case. You gotta understand, uh, Freemasonry here in America didn't get corrupted yet. Now, granted, being part of Freemasons is not a good thing, okay? And people like George Washington, Freemasonry does love to make outrageous claims. George Washington never attended meeting after meeting. They aren't you know, he's like honorary Freemasonry. That's the way oh, oh, he was. He spoke at some lodges, but really never he wasn't uh a diehard Freemason. They said he tended all about maybe a, uh, maybe a dozen Masonic lodges in his life. That's about it. And it's even said that he denounced Freemasonry on his deathbed. Regardless if that's true or not, I can't prove that. Uh, but regardless, like, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. And uh, So a lot of these guys were on Freemasonry. And uh, Freemasonry, because George Washington, I should have put the things in here. He warned the Masonic lodges in America because he knew about the nefarious Illuminati, how they infiltrated the lodges and the Council of Wilhelmsbad, I think it was 1785. He warned the American lodges here that the Illuminati infiltrated all of the uh, France's and Europe's lodges, and they're coming here. They're doing it here. And he warned his reverend about that and other uh, Masons. And uh, so he sent a warn out to warn about the uh, infiltration of the Illuminati. That, we're going to cover that next week. Uh, so um, John Quincy Adams, he had he, he abhorred uh, anything to do with the Illuminati and Masonry. Because he at this time, the Illuminati completely took control of Masonic lodges. And to save face, okay, people say, well, we're not Illuminati. It's like, you're not Illuminati. I'm not saying you are. The Illuminati, long story short, uh, they hid themselves from extinction. And they hid themselves within the order of Freemason. We're going to show you that in a minute here. Uh, we'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, John Quincy Adams, he warned people about the Freemasonry. He said, Freemasonry is deceptive and fraudulent. It promises light. Its performance is darkness. Masonry ought to forever be abolished. It is wrong, essentially wrong, a seed of evil, which can never produce any good. Then he goes on to say, I do consciously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the greatest, is one of the greatest moral and political evils under which the union is now laboring. A conspiracy of the few against the equal rights of many. The many. And masonry ought forever be abolished. It is the wrong and essentially wrong, a seed of evil which can never produce any good. And again, he says, Freemasonry is deceptive and fraudulent. Its promise is light because, uh, I brought this up again, because Freemasonry promises light, illumination, wisdom, and knowledge that nobody else knows. 
and to be become that perfect cornerstone and to blaze like the LC and I with a thousand points of illumination. We'll explain all that in other shows too. Uh, but um, yeah, and he said, yeah, they promised light, but its performance is darkness. Plain and simple. And Adams warned that the lodges use of the Bible should to train Christians raise red flags. Because I showed you at the beginning, they have what you go in the Masonic Lodge, there's a Bible on the altar, Holy Bible, with the square and compass on it. His father was a Mason. He knows what he's talking about. And he warned that the lodges' use of the Bible should to be trained Christians be raised as a red flag. You know, it's like there's a red flag with this. If the candidate, he says, if the candidate has been educated to sincere and heartfelt reverence for religion of the Bible in the Bible, and if he exercises his reasons, he knows that the tales of Josh and Boaz, remember the two pillars we talked about? The tales of Josh and Boaz of Solomon's Temple, Hiram and Biff, and Jubala, Jubilo, and Jubalum are imposters. Poison post, uh, poured into the perennial fountain of truth. Traditions exactly resemble those prohib, uh, probated by Jesus Christ as making the word of God non-effect. Remember I told you at the beginning that um, when you get to Mason Lodges and all that, they, they give you all the biblical references to everything. But that that's not what those things are for. That's just to deceive you and lure you into the, the, You know how many Christians belong to Masonry? Yeah. That's just to draw good men into the occult. That's all that it's about. And it's the reason why it's a blue lodge and it separates from the red lodge. And um, there's more of this stuff here, but um, they have a the you know, sacred name of God called Jabulon. Uh, it's short for Jehovah, Baal, remember Baal, the Baal worship, and On, the ancient city of the sun. Yeah, Job Yuan. Uh, I think it's a ninth degree. Uh, don't mistake. I, I got it in my studies here. But um, what they do is uh, the elders of the lodge, they, you got to go through this ritual. And um, they open this chest with a key to reveal to you the true name of God, they say, right? And uh, so they open it up, and you got to look into the, uh, the thing, and you got to take this piece of paper, and on it is written Job Yuan, short for Jehovah, Baal, and the city, uh, the uh, the you know the the deity of the ancient city of the sun, all in as one god. Then you put the paper back in there, and you're not supposed to tell anybody. We're gonna cover that uh, uh, in, the, in the next show probably. But there's a book here, and I encourage people, please uh, get this book. This is one of the best books there. Uh, the Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robeson. John Robeson used to be like a a records keeper, if you will, for Adam Weissop, uh, the uh, the creator of the Order of Illuminati. I actually got this book here. Uh, what an amazing book. He actually exposes the Illuminati within Freemasonry and talks about the German Union and uh, the Jacobins and the whole nine yards. Uh, yeah, all the amazing stuff in this book. So I would highly encourage you guys to get this book if you want to learn about the Illuminati and Freemasonry and how it all intertwines with each other. This is a very good book. So within his book, Proofs of Conspiracy, uh, John Robinson on page 112, he says, The great strength of our order. Now the thing is, let me, uh, let me paint you where we're at in history, right? The Illuminati were, um, they were being hunted down. They were being killed and uh, because people finally realized what the Illuminati was about. They were officially formed publicly in May 1st, 1776 by um, Professor of Canon Law Adam Weissop out of Bavaria, Germany. So um, he formed the Order of the Illuminati. Now, the Illuminati was around a little bit longer before him. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on within the Vatican. Yes, the Vatican has strong ties, even though they say they highly opposed the Illuminati. On the front, they did. The secret societies within the Vatican, the Catholic Church, were the creators, of the, the real creators of the Order of the Illuminati. In fact, they say it was um, Ignatius Loyola. He was actually, in the 1500s, the actual real creator of the Order of the Illuminati. And he kept it hidden within the Jesuit order. Okay, the order of Jesus. The Society of Jesus, which is nothing to Jesus at all. So, um, there's a long history with that. When I do the Illuminati show, we'll cover all that. Uh, but anyway, Adam Vice up officially formed it. And um, so, and it was many, you know, many other secret societies being formed out in societies people. Because at the time, I mean, you had nothing else to do, you know. So, what happened uh, when 
one of their uh, couriers got struck by lightning. Uh, they the information was recovered, all the documents, and um, the the Russian government when they got hold of this man, they set out to hunt down everybody that belonged to the Illuminati and kill him, because you see the stuff that was involved in those records could talk about world domination. had gave names of Rothschild people at the time. I forgot the names are called, uh, but the world bankers that were funding and financing the world dominance. All the information came out. And Illuminati, just like the Knights Temple before them, they had to go underground. They never abolished or never disappeared. They went underground. So when this happened, I'm going to save the rest of the story for another the other show, uh, but they needed to hide all right, and conceal themselves. So at the time, we already had, the, in 1717, they had the Grand Lodge of England. And then again, 1785, they had this council called of Wilhelmsbad, where prominent Masons were in there, the Jacobins, the Druids, the Knights Templar, yes, they didn't go anywhere, okay, they were not abolished, and the Illuminati and many other secret societies, they all joined forces into one Congress. And they all decided to hide within the ranks of uh, secret societies within secret societies. In other words, uh, in a circle within a, a circle. In other words, even the people, like the Masons here, and it was the Blue Lodge, the first three degrees, that's where the Illuminati hid. And the first three degrees, these uh, guys don't know nothing. They have no clue about anything. And they hid with an order of that. So nobody in Ma the Mason Lodges knew who the Illuminati were. Now, yeah, they were uh, Masons themselves. But they had their own secret meetings and all that to hide within the order. And this is um, uh, what um, John Robinson said. This is what we said with Adam Weissap. And uh, that Consul Wilhelm's bad. Adam Weissap uh, came up with this plan. And he said, uh, and uh, John Robinson's quoting Adam Weissap. The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name in, many, in another occupation. So none is fitter than the lo three lower degrees of Freemasonry. That's the first three degrees, the Blue Lodge. The public is accustomed to it, expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. Next to this is the form of the learn of literal society is best suited to our purpose. And had Freemasonry not existed, this cover would have not been employed. And it may be much more than a cover. It may be a powerful engine in our hands. By establishing reading societies, which led to the German Union later, and a subscription, well, actually, I'm sorry, the German Union is already established. We'll get to that in the next show. And subscription libraries, and taking these our direction and supplying them through the, our labors, we may learn the public mind, uh, which we will... W way we will you know what I mean so it's been a long night sorry guys so what that means is like um, at the time you didn't have TV you didn't have radio of course so this is the late 1700s alright so they had to go on the ground they hid within the ranks of Freemasonry that nobody expected because <laughs> everybody knew about the Blue Lodges it was public it was still a secret society but not as secret as the Red Lodge it was like an entry per se you know what I mean so nobody would at least suspect the Illuminati being within uh, and in a circle within the Blue Lodge. That was uh, the best concealment that they used yet. And that's later on when George Washington caught wind of this and he warned the American Masons about this infiltration. So, that being said, uh, they concealed themselves within the Illuminati. Now, if you notice, again, like I said, they didn't have TV or radio. They used, they, which we'll describe, uh, we'll talk about the next show, about the German Union. Adam Weissap, and uh, he was known as Spartacus. That was his code name, uh, Spartacus. And Spartacus, uh, um, him and his, um, you know, comrades, or whatever you want to call them, okay, conspirators, they created something called the German Union because at the time, your form of media was going to a library, um, you know, a community place uh, where they had uh, newspapers posted up on the wall where you could read things and uh, public notices and the community town hall, whatever the case, and uh, libraries and authors and journalists. So what they would do, um, the German Union, they created this thing called the German Union. They took a bunch of people from the Illuminati, and had them go as journalists, uh, authors, and all that to infiltrate publication from books to news uh, to any kind of media at all they had at the time. And they would infiltrate these things to indoctrinate the German citizens with Illuminism, like the media does today. 
The mainstream media today is the modern day version of the German Union. Nothing's changed. It's trickle right, th- right through society to today. Wait till we get into that. That's a whole show altogether, man. Uh, but yeah, and um, f- there's a book here. It's called Foundations of Freemasonry Series, The Kabbalah of Masonry by W.W. Westcott. And um, I don't even need to bring that book up because I'm going to bring David Carrico on and uh, hopefully he'll come on next Friday. Uh, so it's going to be late. I hope he will because, um, yeah, <laughs> Like I said, every subtle level of Freemasonry, you learn something new. Then you end up like, man, that's not what I was told in the beginning. And I didn't even bring up the quote that a Mason was intentionally lied to. It's, um, I believe it's in this book here. Let me see if I can get this real quick. I know I noted that. Truth in the Shade of Mason. Oh, yeah, page 28 and 29. So, all right, so. This is, um, I, I didn't put the slide up, but this is, uh, for the record, this is from Manly Palmer Hall's book, uh, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. So if you go to page 28 and 29, it says, The initiated brothers, the initiated brother, that's the new people coming in, realizes that his so-called symbols and rituals are merely blind fabricated by the wise to perpetuate ideas incomprehensible to the average individual. So, yeah, like that symbol I told you about. The average person out there thinks it's whatever. You learn it's not that, it's something else. But however, he also realizes that the few Masons of today know or appreciate the mystic meaning concealed within those rituals. With religious faith, we perpetuate the, the form, worshiping instead of the life. But those who have not uh, recognized the truth in the crystallized ri- uh, ritual... Those who have not liberated the spiritual gem from the shell of empty words are not Masons. And uh, regardless of the physical degrees are not words on us. So anyway. I'll put it where it is intentionally lied to. So. I think I got the right one. It's page 28, 29, right? Initiated Masons are lied to. It's page 28. Yeah, I'm trying to find I wrote it down. I forgot to put it up here. But long story short, he uh, says that uh, it's intended that the uh, uh, masons are lied to every step of the way you know what i mean they lie to you about on uh, the beginning stages and they don't get told the truth about what these things mean until a higher degree so let me see if i can pull that i because uh, i like to show the proof you know what i mean it's in this book i can promise you that uh, i just like to show the truth here and let me see if i can pull this up real quick uh, um The Lost Keys of Freemasonry PDF, and let me get this up because there's a PDF file on it, and you go search for it. Uh, I hate uh, I'm not having quotes, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy, man, and they they openly say this stuff. And I, I'll have to get the quote for the next show uh, because so many other quotes I had running through my head that you know I was trying to dig these things up. But yeah, I promise you, it's in there. And uh, the, the Masons are uh, intentionally lied to, plain and simple. You know what I mean? And I think that's what I just read too. If I read it right, uh, there's just so many of these quotes, guys, and I apologize. The reason why you want to try and find it, because uh, in case of skeptics, oh yeah, you're making it up, you know. Yeah, well, it says it right there too, uh, page twenty-eight. The initiated brother, with some new mason, realizes that his so-called symbols and rituals are merely blind, blinds fabricated by the wise to perpetuate ideas incompre- incomprehensible to the average individual. And um, 
the you know yeah uh, it's it's right there too so I apologize about that yeah so I'll get um, other quotes next week uh, but when we get deeper into the stuff uh, I just wanted to get the basic layouts and um this guy here, the Diosophical Kabbalah, uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yoshi. Uh, David Carrico has done tons of shows on him. Uh, this is the Dead Man in the Coffin ritual that's done in Freemasonry. And you won't know that what that is. I think it's the ninth degree. Don't quote me on that. I'll get the information next week. Uh, but yeah, that's what the square and compass you see, right? That's what that really means. It's the Kabbalah star. And people say, well, it's the, the star of David. Uh, David never had a star. We did two shows on this, two full shows, me and John Hall, I believe it was, yeah, me and John Hall, or just John Pound is, uh, yeah, it was John Hall, two full shows on this stuff. There was never no such thing as a star of David. The Book of Amos even says it. David never bore a star, that's the, the star of Raphim, which is uh, the Kabbalah star. Moloch, that's what the book Amos says too. You know what I mean? And this stuff is uh, deeply embedded. We're, we're going to cover that in the Knights Temple. When you talk about the Knights Temple and the upper waters, you got to learn a lot about Baphomet. Baphomet was actually created by uh, a gentleman, Alephus Levi. He was uh, he used to lead the Knights Temple. It's supposed to be a Christian organization. <laughs> yeah, nothing Christian about the Knights Temple. Don't let Hollywood or TV or the History Channel or the Discovery Channel or the movie National Treasure falsely paint that these were poor Christian soldiers helping Christian. No, they didn't help. They were the, the Pope's henchmen. During the Inquisition and the Dark Ages, they've killed so many Christians, so many Jews for not converting to Catholicism, for possessing Bibles. And yeah, Alephus Levi, the head of the Knights Temple, Drew this up. He drew this up from an ancient Egyptian deity. The Baphomet, that's the, the Kabbalah God. They believe God is both Satan. Look at the, the the breast on her. Him, whatever. They in, As above, so below. The hands pointing up and down. Uh, the male and uh, female genitals. The sun and the moon up and down. Uh, yeah. Uh, they believe that that's that God. That's the God of Freemasonry right there. They believe God and Satan are the same, split personalities, and it's both female and male. That's the God they worship, guys. So um, before you get to phone calls, and I just want to lay out some Bible verses like it did in um, the last show. So these Bible verses just got to tell you everything. <laughs> and you want truth, guys, because people join masonry to get the truth. That's why I wanted to join it, too. I thought it would be so cool to learn history and all that stuff and secret codes and all that. It sounds so cool. And I loved the National Treasure movies. I, I really did. And that's where it actually inspired me to join Freemasonry. And that was the intent of making those movies. Because the membership of Freemasonry was on a rapid decline. They did that purposely to make people... Because at the time, you had to be asked to be a Mason. You couldn't just go join them. You had to know somebody. They had to ask you. It wasn't something you could just go join. Now, they are uh, doing a program called Ask a Freemason. Where you could actually ask to, uh, and they'll invite you to the lodge and everything, and of course give you all the snowball information. Uh, but yeah, if you want truth, you know, we are. I mean, the whole time when I realized I was looking for the truth, it was right here. The Holy Bible of well, us reading it through the inspiration of God, not through a church, not through a secret society, not through some uh, pedophile priest, not through some uh, false prophet, seven hundred club guy, or some idiot on um, the televangelist. Reading it yourself. All you do is I suggest all the time just get right with God, confess your sins, ask for the Holy Spirit to come in. You'll write because it's only nobody can write the Holy. I'm sorry, nobody can write the word of God on your heart unless it's the Holy Spirit. That's the only person, that, the only thing that could do that. Not a church, not a uh, university, not a secret society. And John in seventeen seventy says, "Sanctify them. The truth, your word is truth." And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8.32. And it's not the truth which Freemasonry promises. It's the truth through the Bible. And Jesus, and you know how they preach universal religion. There's many ways to Christ, I mean, uh, to heaven. That's what they say. We all serve the same God. Now we don't. Because Jesus says, I am the only way. I am the truth, the light, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Not the universal garbage crap. 
And John 16, 13 and 14 says, How about when the Spirit of truth has come and will guide you all truth? For he shall not speak of himself, but whoever he shall hear, that shall light, I'm sorry, that shall he speak, and he will show you the things to come. He shall glorify me, he shall receive of me, and shall show you unto you. So Matthew 10, 26 and 27 says, Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid, and that shall not be known what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, in what ye f hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the house steps. So long story short with that, it's like here, whatever, anything of the darkness is going to be, uh, be brought out to the light. All truth will be revealed. That's when I started the slides all over again. So we're done with this presentation for today, and there was so much more. I just had to cut. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I got to cut this because, wow, what a rabbit hole Freemasonry is in, in, in respectfully because it's thousands of years old, literally. The master builders, the ancient days, from back from the days of Babylon, and Masonry had different names through the centuries, the master builders. Yeah, the order of the snake. Um, uh, I mean, so many different orders over the years and centuries. And in the 1700s, it became the Grand Lodge and formed to which today is called Freemasonry. And within Freemasonry, is so many sex cults, and I mean, it's, it's crazy. I'm glad we got through this, and I, I hope I pray that I made sense to you guys. Um, because I know there's a lot of information, and it looked like it was all over, and it is all over the place. Because with this stuff, you can't, I mean, you, you it's impossible to present it in a perfect way. You know what I mean? Even the, the top experts will tell you that. You know what I mean? It's impossible because there's so much stuff, man. We didn't even get to the um, other stuff, you know, the, the little things they use. I mean, the ceremonial purposes with the gloves. and Oh, man, it's so entrenched. So much entrenched. All right, guys. I love you all. God bless. Shalom. And until next, well, Monday. Oh, tonight, the Midnight Ride at 11 p.m. Eastern. So Shabbat Shalom, everybody. God bless. And you are the resistance. Declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com Happy Shabbat, everybody, and welcome to the Spiritual Warfare Friday. And tonight's broadcast, the title of it is Masonic Occult, How to Witness to a Freemason. I am your host, Dan Badandi, and we've got a special guest for you tonight. And it is this, this gentleman here, David Carrico. We're going to be joining him in this, just a second. So um, tonight, we, you know, as I said last week, this is also a continuation of a Masonic series. So if you missed last week's show, we talked about the basics of Freemasonry. Uh, David Carrico is going to also... Um, talk more about that as well and how we explain how when you go into a Masonic Lodge as a blue, you know, Lodge Mason, first degree and such, it presents itself to be a Christian fraternity. But however, it's not. We've discussed that and David's going to show you uh, what we're talking about. 
And before we get to this, I want uh, to clarify one thing here. Again, like we did before the start of last week's show, that uh, just because somebody's a Freemason doesn't mean they're a bad person or an evil person. And you got to understand, many Masons are good people. In fact, uh, they're very good people, except the point that they're misled, they're hoodwinked, if you will. So we want to point that out, just in case your friend or uh, neighbor next door is a Mason, you're not going to go over there and be like, uh, you know, with the, um, <laughs> the pitchfork and uh, broom, whatever the case. Uh, no, uh, it, it, the thing is, like, just like anything else, anywhere else, you get lied to. When you first come into the lodge or the cult, wherever you go to, you get light, of course. You know what I mean? So, uh, so what David's here to do is uh, show you, uh, especially people who are Masons, say, hey, listen, um, yeah, there's a problem here. You know what I mean? Uh, big problem here. And, you know, what we displayed last week, that alone should say, you know what, I'm going to run from this thing. Especially those who are thinking I'm becoming Masons who are just gotten to Masonry within the first two, uh, one, two, third degree. It's, uh, you know, first three degrees is a Blue Lodge. So, uh, again, the Blue Lodge, uh, they have Bibles on the altar. They talk about biblical meanings of the things in the lodge and everything else, like um, the, uh, the, the pillars of Joshua and Boaz, King Solomon, Hiram of Biff, all these people along the way. You know what I mean? So they it, it, they present to be biblical, but it's not. We just demonstrated that. So David is going to do that as well. And also, guys, um, just to let you know, we um, this is pre-recorded. David couldn't be with us on our live show tonight um, because we broadcast so late. So um, this is pre-recorded from uh, uh, d two days ago. So we did this pre-recording, but however, uh, I will be monitoring the chat room and after the show, we're going to have a, a special live um, presentation of questions and answers. So if you got questions, you want to call into the show, please do so. But wait until the show is over, this portion anyway. I'll come on live and we'll you know get to the questions and answers. So without further ado, guys, let's get to our guest, special guest. He's the host of FOJC Radio. That's Followers of Jesus Christ, FOJCRadio.com. He's also a host on NYSTV.org with the Midnight Ride every Saturday night, which tomorrow night guys 11 p.m eastern you could catch him and um uh john pounders on the midnight ride uh he's a, a cult researcher biblical researcher all that stuff radio show host he's many things okay but uh tonight he's a faithful christian like always and a good friend of mine david carico how you doing brother well i'm doing fantastic dan and i'm honored that you would have me to come on and speak to this it is my great pleasure we're going to have a very good uh broadcast this evening and um i guess you'll have to move the slides forward on your end absolutely and, and as you uh if we would like to begin sure. uh just go ahead and we'll uh proceed with our broadcast this evening absolutely so the slides are there just uh tell me uh, when to switch them over this is going to be the uh, thrust of our broadcast this evening, and of course, that's what it's all about. We are about uh, speaking to people's souls to save them from the destruction and damnation, as we're going to see that in this uh, study this evening that Freemasonry does things that are absolutely damnable. Now, the next slide here speaks to the structure of Freemasonry. And Freemasonry is based upon the Blue Lodge. And the Blue Lodge is the first three degrees, the Entered Apprentice, the Fellow Craft, and the Master Mason. And after the Freemason is raised as a Master Mason, he has options available to him. He can go into the Scottish Rite, degrees 4 through 33, or he can go through the York Rite which has 10 uh, named degrees in the York Rite. And even beyond that, there are a lot of European degrees, the Rite of uh, Mizraim, which goes 97 degrees, the Rite of Memphis. There is a just a bunch of these degrees and occult orders that go above the third degree in the Blue Lodge. But here in America, the two that most people are familiar with is the York Rite, the Scottish. Now, in the next slide, we have the uh, book. Uh, we're going to show you the materials we're going to use in analyzing Freemasonry and helping you to witness to a Freemason. There's all kinds of things you can say about Freemasonry. It ties in with um, satanic ritual abuse. It ties in with the New World Order. But when you're coming to witness to a Freemason, 
you need to be focused. And if that Freemason professes to be a Christian, your line of uh, witnessing should be upon the fact that Freemasonry worships another god and Freemasonry preaches another gospel. We don't want to get off uh, certainly the relationship of Freemasonry with the Illuminati and all of these things, they're valid things to be put on the table. But these are things that uh, many of your your just average guy down at the lodge doesn't know anything about. So we want to stay focused. And this slide here of the Indiana Monitor, this is one of the, the materials we're going to be using in our study this evening. And every state has a Grand Lodge in it. And the Grand Lodge of Indiana, there's a Grand Lodge of Kentucky, there's a Grand Lodge of Rhode Island, wherever you're at. And that Grand Lodge publishes a monitor for that state. And that monitor is the Masonic Bible or authoritative document uh, for that state. And we have examined... Uh, all 50 Masonic monitors, and we also have one. There's one for Puerto Rico and uh, I think the Virgin Islands. But we, and they differ uh, a little bit, one from another, but the basic landmarks and the basic uh, language is the same in every monitor. So the, the what I would recommend is whatever state you're in, like here we're in Indiana, and we're just a few miles from Kentucky, so the Indiana-Kentucky monitors are those that we use the most. But when you confront a Freemason with the monitor from his own state, this is confronting them with the authoritative statements of Freemasonry that are binding upon them. Now, in this next slide, we have the Kentucky monitor. And the Indiana monitor and the Kentucky monitor are the two basic ones we're going to use. And I could have thrown these out and used two other ones, but uh, we're going to use these to document the fact that Freemasonry does worship another god and that Freemasonry does preach another gospel. And they are the things of the secrets. And in John chapter 18, 20, Jesus said, uh, Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. The ways of secrecy and the ways of darkness and hiddenness is not the way of our Savior. He said that men would not come to the light because their deeds were evil. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's what we're going to do this evening. We are going to reprove and expose the teachings of Freemasonry from their own documents. Now, in the slide here from the Indiana Monitor on page 11, this is really quite amazing. Um, it says here, it is not within the scope of this short essay to develop the substantial evidence which supports Freemasonry's kinship with such ancient cults and societies as the ancient mysteries of Greece, the Roman colleges of artificers, Roman collegia, or the Comocene masters, which are among the more prominent of many others. Now, there are many Freemasons that if we would tell them, you know, you're in a cult, you know, masonry is, is a cult, and it's a cult, they would be offended, but this is exactly what Freemasonry says about itself. Mm -hmm. Far from denying that it is a part of the cult world, it very much owns the fact that they are the spiritual brothers of all of these ancient cults and of all of the ancient mystery religions. And in the next slide from the Indiana Monitor, page 11, of what we've done here, we've taken the page right out of the Indiana Monitor, and these are the actual photocopies of the pages we're reading from, and there to the left, so that I can read it, uh, the, the print there and the verbiage that's underlined here is blown up. So we're coming point in line from their documents. There's no wiggle room here, and that's what we have to do. It's not 
of, I think Freemasonry is this, or I think it's that, we're confronting them with that which is actually in their own monitors. Right from their own mouths, right? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. I mean, and there's no way that you can get uh, two interpretations out of that. They proudly boast mm -hmm. about the relationship with the ancient cults, as they call them. That's their words, not mine. And in this next slide from page 11 of the NDI Monitor, such evidences of masonry share in the common stock of the world's cult phenomena, if rightly understood, make plain many things which have been obscure. And it certainly does. And they proudly claim to have their share in the world of the cult phenomenon going all the way back to ancient times. Now, on page 12 here in the next slide of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, modern Freemasonry is in the truest sense, a reservoir into which the cult lore and social experiences of countless eons of human experience have poured their treasures. Fortunately, for the peace of mind of the modern initiate, there are no arbitrary tests of faith in these matters, so there can be no trials for heresy or danger of sorcery burning. And what a statement! that Freemasonry is a reservoir. And all of the cult teachings from all of these ancient cults, just like water goes into a reservoir, they have poured these teachings into Freemasonry, and they are encoded in the Masonic literature and the Masonic symbolism. And it says here that, you know, you can believe anything you want. Uh, you know, absolutely anything from any of these cults. You're not going to be tried for heresy. You are free to believe any of these occult teachings uh, that now, you want to believe. That's something a, uh, a faithful Christian should not be doing. Not yeah. Being part of. Yeah, obviously. You know, if you mm -hmm. have to have a board meeting to vote whether this is right or not, you know, you're in trouble right there. <laughs> I mean, you have a group that says about themselves that we are a cult that we have assimilated all of the teachings of the mystery religions and cults from antiquity right in to our organization. And they're very, they're boastful about it. So this isn't something that, and certainly we say this about Freemasonry, but when we do so, when we call Freemasonry a cult and uh, the workings of the occult, this is nothing more than what they say about themselves. Yeah, now, now, you know, our gospel tells us to go by sound doctrine, which is this, this uh, book here, many people should know, uh, called the Holy Bible, the Word of God, you know what I mean, and uh, that we're supposed to go by sound doctrine, and this to me, oh, right off the uh, bat here, looks to me that this is not going off the sound doctrine that they, you know, put, you know display on the altars in the Blue Lodges there. Mm -hmm. And if we would close the broadcast right now, and not say another word, this should be enough for any man that professes Freemasonry to get out of the lodge and mm -hmm. to know that this is not of God. And it, it gets so, so much worse. Now, in this next slide, and this is again uh, from the uh, Indiana Monitor, on page 12, it says there are certain ancient doctrines known as the landmarks which every duly obligated Freemason is bound to respect. There are prescriptions of Masonic conduct which he is bound to obey. But if he chooses to believe that the fraternity descends by some uh, serious process from the planet Neptune, he is as free to do so as he would be to believe that Neptune itself is the ghost of a previous planetary incarnation of the world. Conversely, if he prefers to regard some of the ancient legends as pure allegories, there is none with authority to d deny him that privilege. In either case, the great symbolic teachings of the craft will remain unaffected. Yeah. And in language as plain as you can say that the Freemasonry is free to adopt any form of the occult 
that he wants to adopt teach any kind of occult doctrine, and he will be accepted and uh, be approved and above board as a good Freemason. Now, the father has an idolatry idolatry problem, and it's obvious from the get-go. Uh, we're going to see that Freemasonry promises salvation to a Freemason on the basis of his Masonic works. The God of the Bible and the God of Freemasonry is the Gaiato, the acronym, the G-A-O-T-U, the Grand Architect of the Universe, the Gaiato. And this is the God of Freemasonry, and this Gaiato it promises salvation to every Freemason upon the basis of his good works. And the Gaiatu is in reality Lucifer. And in the Bible, the God of the Bible promises salvation to those that place their faith in Jesus Christ for Amen. salvation. Follow the word of God. So there's a problem. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Every time a Freemason goes into the lodge, he is stowing the Gaiato in the face of the true and the living God. Every time the lodge opens and closes, there is prayer made unto the Gaiato. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, nor or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of their fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. It's a very, very serious thing with the Father to commit idolatry. And this is and, known as uh, the second commandment of uh, Ten Commandments in the Bible. Yes, and much to the chagrin of the modern evangelical church, those Ten Commandments are still very much real and valid. Mm -hmm. And they're still very much loved by God's people. Um, Psalm 96 and 5, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And that's all the Gaiatu is. The God of Freemasonry is nothing but an idol. And everyone that prays to this God and lifts this God up, you are guilty of idolatry before the Father. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 19 and 20, what shall I say then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. And it's impossible for a Freemason to enter into the Masonic Lodge to pray unto this Gaiatu and to go through these rituals that come from pagan Babylon and Egypt and not be affected by devils. Every Freemason comes under the influence of devils, and the degree of demonization will vary from one Freemason to another, but there is no such thing as someone that commits idolatry, even if you don't think it's idolatry, uh, you're, you're going to come under the influence of devils because it is the Father that sets the ground rules. Thou shalt have no other God before me. And I remember I had a discussion and I had a phone call about an hour long with the head of the Grand Commandery of the Royal Arch in the state of Alabama. And he was a Methodist Sunday school teacher and he was also a Shriner, and he had come to hear me speak on Freemasonry, and he wanted to talk with me, and I was very happy to talk with him. And what he said, and I am in the shrine, when you go into the shrine, you swear an oath on the Quran to Allah. And I asked this Methodist Sunday school teacher, I said, when you swore an oath on the Quran to Allah, did you commit adultery? I said, oh, no, 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 because I... I don't believe in Allah. I just believe in the true God. And I said, you know what? Now, wait just a minute. The Father says to have no other gods before me. You're telling me that you swore an oath on the Quran and this isn't idolatry? This is nonsensical. Hmm. And finally, after about 45 minutes, a 
pinning this guy down, I made him admit he committed idolatry. <laughs> I mean, this is this is beyond bizarre that we have men that profess Christianity, that lift up the name of other gods, take the name of, uh, even in the York Rite, the name of Baal is taken upon their lips in worship. This is idolatry, and this is where we confront our Masonic friends, that you're committing idolatry. The God of uh, Freemasonry is obviously not the God of the Bible. This and is just not a little bit wrong. It's real wrong. Jesus did say you can't serve two masters. you got to hate one and love the other or vice versa. That's exactly right. And, and the sad thing is that these men, they'll hear someone like you and I will get on here and will expose Freemasonry, will tell them the truth from their own documents. Then they'll go back in their churches, and their pastor will say, oh, that's okay, there ain't nothing wrong with it. And he's probably in the lodge too. And they enable them in their idolatry. And these false shepherds, they're certainly going to, to be held accountable for what mm -hmm. they do. Now let's go on to the Kentucky Monitor. And uh, the Freemasonry worships another god which is idolatry, and Freemasonry also preaches another gospel, which we're going to see from the Word of God, it has a curse upon it. Now here in the uh, Kentucky Monitor on page 95, it makes no profession of Christianity. Now, so many Freemasons, they think that Freemasonry is a Christian organization, and here clearly, uh, in the Kentucky Monitor, it makes no profession of Christianity and wars not against sectarian creeds or doctrines, but looks forward to the time when the labor of our ancient brethren shall be symbolized in the erection of a spiritual temple whose moral grandeur shall be commensurate with civilization. Absolutely, Freemasonry says, they are not. They are about building this temple. And it goes on on page 95 to say this. A temple in which there shall be but one altar, but one worship, one common altar of masonry on which the Veda, Shastras, Sade, Zend, Avesta, Quran, and the Holy Bible shall lie untouched by sacrilegious hands. Now, in many lodges around here, we are in rural uh, southern Indiana and Kentucky. We're right on the river here in Tell City. Indi Kentucky is just across the river. And in a lot of these rural lodges, you're not going to have uh, Hindus or Muslims. Mm. Uh, well, and I tell you anymore, there's a huge amount of Muslims that are coming in very near in our area, so I don't know if I can say that for much longer. But many of these lodges, they only have seen the Bible on the altar, and they think that Freemasonry is a Christian organization. And the minute that a Muslim or a Hindu would come in, and you can pick your book, when you're initiated into Freemasonry, you can put whatever book you want. The Bible will come off, and the Quran or whatever book you choose will go right on there. And the Word of God is not lifted up in Freemasonry. It is denigrated, and it's brought down to the level of the Quran or any of the books that any of the religions would uh, deem to be holy. It goes on to say, and at whose shrine the Hindu, the Persian, the Assyrian, the Chaldean, the Egyptian, the Chinese, the Mohammedan, the Jew, and the Christian may kneel and with one united voice celebrate the praises of the supreme architect of the universe. Now here we see the great architect of the universe identified. Yeah, he's the God that says you can have whatever holy book you want. You can have whatever religion you want. We'll all worship at the same altar. Now, this is obviously nothing but rank idolatry. And beyond mm -hmm. that, this is the religion that will usher in the false prophet, that there are many ways that lead to God, that Jesus isn't the only. Jesus is a savior, but he's just one of them now. Sounds there are like many other saviors in addition to Christ, you say. 
Sounds like uh, the Pope's uh, ecumenical movement they got going on. Well, the UN adopted for their universal one world religion. That's exactly what it is, Dan. It's the exact same thing. Uh, they're all singing out of the same hymn book, and they're all working together. Mm -hmm. They're all working together to bring this in. Now, uh, a fellow by the name of Manley Palmer Hall, he um, was called when he passed away. He was eulogized in the Scottish Rite Journal as Freemasonry's greatest philosopher. And in the Lost Keys of Freemasonry, this is the way that Manley Palmer Hall states it. He says, the true Mason is not creed bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge. Now, just think about that. He is claiming that the Masonic Lodge has divine illumination. Well, if this illumination is not from the true God, and it's not from the exclusive uh, word of God, where is this illumination coming from? And uh, certainly Albert Pike, I'll just read the quote. Uh, this is some another one of the deadly teachings of Freemasonry. On page 321 of Morals and Dogma, one of the most famous quotes from this horrible book, Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness lucifer the son of the morning it is he who bears the light and lucifer is the light bearer uh, in freemasonry and uh manly palmer hall in the same book that i quoted earlier uh, he said this uh, on page 48 of the lost keys of freemasonry he said, when the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. Now, do we have to have a board meeting here and have a vote, a <laughs> vote whether it's right or not? I mean, what are we talking about here? This is this is outrageous. Um, Mr. Hall goes on here in this quote, and he says, The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed, the name means little. Now, if you're not getting just a little bit angry, at this point, you should check yourself. Hmm. And the name means little. And we have to say to our Freemason friends that the name means everything. That only by the name of Jesus will anyone be saved. And to denigrate Christ to the level of Muhammad, Muhammad and Buddha, to say that his name means little, this is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. It's blasphemy that anyone that has the Spirit of God in them they have to recognize this as rank blasphemy and run from it. Uh, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. The Freemason worships at every altar. The Christian will only bow the knee to our Lord Jesus Christ because he knows that the King commandment says thou shalt have no other gods before me and this is blatant idolatry it's not maybe it is it absolutely is in John chapter 3 in verse 3 Jesus answered and said unto him that except a man be born again, and I'm going to read this because my my printout here is faded, and I I could quote it, but I just want to read it. I don't want to get it wrong. John chapter three verse three. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we're going to show from these documents how Freemasons interpret new birth. And one thing that all cults do, they redefine terms. And if you would ask a Freemason, uh, do you believe in born, being born again? They could say, oh, yes. But to them, we're going to see from Masonic literature, it could mean something completely different 
than from what you and I would say when we say, yes, we believe in being born again. Now, in Galatians 1 and 8, but though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. There's a curse on people that preach another gospel. And as we said before, and you know, it's like the father's doubling down here. If you didn't get it the first time, we'll give it to you again. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. There's a curse upon all of those that would preach another gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go on here in the Kentucky Monitor. Now, this is from page 26. Freemasonry teaches new birth without Jesus Christ through Masonic initiation. Those are my words. Now let's read their words here on page 26 of the Kentucky Monitor. This opening unto you and your reception within the lodge is a symbol of the disruption from the ties of the world and your introduction into the life of masonry. It is a symbol of the agonies of the first death and the throes of a new birth. They absolutely tell the Freemason, as he's coming into initiation in this monitor, you're coming into new birth. On page 26, it gets even clearer. There you stood without our portals, on the threshold of this new Masonic life, in darkness, helplessness, and covered with the pollutions of the outer and profane world. Now, let's just think about this statement for a moment. How could anyone that is a born-again child of God say, I'm in darkness, and I have to come to Freemasonry to get the light? That's blasphemous mm -hmm. in and of itself. You came inquiringly through our doors, seeking the new birth and asking a withdrawal of the veil which concealed the divine truth from your uninitiated sight. And Freemasonry is telling every Christian that they initiate into the lodge, you don't have divine truth. You're in darkness, but now you're coming to the light of Freemasonry for the divine illumination, and this is just nothing but the light of Lucifer. In the next slide, this is also from the Kentucky Monitor. It says, there was to be not simply a change for the future, but also an extinction of the past. For initiation is, as it were, a death to the world and a resurrection to a new life. The language here is unmistakable. It, on page 31 of the Kentucky Monitor, it says this mental illumination, this spiritual light, which after his new birth is the first demand of the new candidate, is but another name for divine truth which constitutes the chief design of all Masonic teaching. Masonic teaching claims to be divine truth. Wow. It claims to be light, but it's not the light of Jesus Christ. Nope. It's the light of Gaiatu, and as they proudly claim, it is the light that has been in the ancient mysteries and the ancient cults even back before the time of Christ. In 1 Timothy 4 and 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times men shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And this is nothing less than what this is. In Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God and the Holy Spirit is our light, not the divine truth, so-called, of Freemasonry. Amen. Back to the Indiana Monitor. And in the third degree, the Freemason plays the part of the Masonic hero, Hiram Abiff. And in the third degree, they bring him in, and they go through all the ritual, and they tap the candidate on the head with the setting ball. 
and they'll fall back into like a bed sheet and they'll catch him in the bed sheet and the candidates blindfolded during all this and he falls back and they catch him and in some uh places in europe uh europe is even more serious about masonic initiation and in some rites in europe they actually put the candidate in a coffin but it says this on uh on page 130 uh yeah, 134 of the Indiana Monitor, and I'll just preface it just a bit more, that when the Freemason falls back into the canvas, the worshipful master comes and raises him from the dead in a mock resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ, and he raises him from the dead with the strong grip of the lion's paw, and then he whispers in his ear the secret Masonic word. And, Dan, that word is so secret, I can't even tell it to you. <laughs> now, nah, I'll tell you. That, that word is Mahabon. That word is Mahabon. And it is explained uh, by Manly Palmer Hall as being the phallus of Osiris. Now, I think sometimes that the Father has just given us Freemasons to uh, enjoy. But... Uh, Many times when you witness to a Freemason, uh, they'll say that, you know, we don't have any secrets. When people say we have secrets, that's just not true. And what I will do, and one time was there uh, eating and it scrolled on a napkin the words M-A-H hyphen Ma-Ha-Bone. And I would just say, you know, tell me how you pronounce that. <laughs> and I guarantee <laughs> They ain't going to do it. And I said, no, wait a minute. I thought you didn't have any secrets, you know. And if you've got a York right, Mason, you can write out Ja Bull An. And just ask them to say that word. They can't do it. And Ja Bull An, in the York right, it means the, you, the uniting of Yahweh, Baal, and Osiris in a three-headed Mr. Potato Head God <laughs> that is the God of the York right decree. You know, I mean... What are we talking about here? I mean, this is just nonsense. And it's and one of the things that is one of the biggest deceptions of Freemasonry is they think that nobody knows what they do down at the lodge, that it's a big secret. And while they are sworn to secrecy on what they do, it is very easy. Well, it's not easy. It takes uh, time and money to collect these Masonic documents and a little work studying them. But anyone that wants to can find out every little thing they do down in the Masonic Lodge. And anyone that examines this, you will find out very, very quickly that Freemasonry is not only unchristian, but it is an abomination to God that it teaches another gospel and that it worships another God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, on page 134 of the, of the Indiana Monitor, it says this, God's holy book, his revelation to us, is the guide in our search for light. To the Jew, the holy book is the history of Israel, substantially the Old Testament. To the Christian, it is the Old and the New Testament. To the Mohammedan, it is the Quran. To the Hindu, the Veda. But whatever book it is, it is the holy book for the seeker of light and that which he believes to be the word of God. You see, not which is the word of God, but whatever you believe is the word of God. Any holy book you want, take them all. Take a little bit of out of each one. Any ancient cult you want to pull something from, it's all good. It's all good. It's all divine light, but it is so the it's light of the cherry picking festival of doctrines. That's what it is. <laughs> Yeah, it's the smorgasbord. Every way leads to God. Just pick whatever you want, and it's all good. It's all good with us. Um, he said, the holy book, together with the square and the compass, are the great lights of masonry, representing the leading principles of the Masonic philosophy. But Jesus said in John fourteen six, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Manly Palmer Hall said the name means little. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And again from the Indiana Monitor, uh, 
it is in total agreement with that which is uh, the Kentucky Monitor that the purpose of the third degree of Freemasonry is to teach Masonic salvation to the candidate. And I have witnessed to many Freemasons that have said, the Lodge is all the church I need. The Lodge no. is all the church I need. And there are, it's, it's not just a, maybe it's true, but there are many men that die trusting Freemasonry for their salvation. And it's, it's, there's this organization, and this is why we must speak. This organization is sending people to hell. And much to the uh, surprise of the modern day American church, there will be no idolaters in heaven. They will be cast into the lake of fire. And uh, just because you think you're doing it in secret and your pastor tells you it's okay, it's still idolatry. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously so. Absolutely. Um, on page uh, 144. Okay, thank you, Dan. Yep. That print's a little small for me. Uh, it says, this is again from the Indiana Monitor, Freemasonry promises salvation without Jesus Christ for its members. It was the single object of all the ancient rites and mysteries practiced in the very bosom of pagan darkness. Listen to that language. The ancient rites in the bosom of pagan darkness, they embrace it, shining as a solitary beacon in all that surrounding gloom and cheering the philosopher in his weary pilgrimage of life to teach the immortality of the soul. This is still the great design of the third degree of Freemasonry. Reading on, it says, this is the scope and aim of its ritual. The master mason represents man when youth, manhood, old age, and life itself have passed away as a fleeting shadows, yet raised from the grave of iniquity and quickened into another and better existence, by its legend and all its ritual, it is implied that we have been redeemed from the death of sin and the sepulcher of pollution. The unmistakable language of the promise of salvation to the Freemason. And this is one of the passages that I like to share with Freemasons. You know, look right here. You know, you're, um, you know, this is just, uh, this is just terrible. You're teaching salvation without Jesus Christ. That's another gospel. You're worshiping another god, the Gayatu. You're denigrating the word of God down to the level of the Quran or uh, the Vedas, or take your pick. So, you know, it isn't maybe Freemasonry does these things. They do. And it's not like maybe these things are abomination to God. They absolutely are. Um, the Indiana Monitor on page 145, it says the conclusion we arrive at is that youth properly directed leads us to the honorable and virtuous maturity, and that the life of man, regulated by morality, faith, and justice, will be rewarded at the closing hour by the prospect of eternal bliss. And over and over, the Freemason is told, be a good Mason, whatever religion, whatever holy book, you're good to go. This is obviously another gospel. In Ezekiel 8, 14, then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the dying God in this next section. And the dying God was the one that was worshipped with the at the spring equinox and the winter solstice. It was, uh, they would celebrate the birth and resurrection, and of course, uh, for those that have studied the mystery religions, that this is the, uh, celebrated in the uh, American Evangelical Church as Easter and mm -hmm. uh, Christmas. And yep. these are pagan, they're deeply pagan, they're tied to these ancient mystery rites, and um, it's just amazing. Now, in this next book, uh, The Master Mason, and this book is used 
of in many grand lodges and and it says this it says this on uh, page eight it says the idea that lies behind the Haramic legend is as old as religious thinking among men. The same element existed in the story of Osiris, which was celebrated by the Egyptians in their ancient temples. The old Persians told it concerning Mithras, their hero god. In Syria, the Dionysian mysteries had the very same elements in the story of Dionysius. For the Romans, Bacchus was the god who dies and lived again. There is also the story of Tammuz, older than any of these. And in every nation of whatever name you call it, Adonis, Bacchus, take your pick, it was all the same story of this god that died and rose again that was worshipped at the equinoxes and the solstices. And the first one, that was Nimrod and Semiramis. And Nimrod because he was a blatantly evil man, he was killed. And in the book of Jasher, it says that he was killed by Esau. And then his wife Semiramis claimed to uh, have conceived uh, miraculously and have brought forth a virgin birth that would be Tammuz. And so it was, uh, was Esau, right? I'm, I'm sorry for people who watched the last show. I thought it was uh, his uncle Shem. I, I apologize. So it was Esau, not Shem. Um, uh, my apology. Yeah, and it, that's according to the book of Jasher. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other traditions. Of, there are variations of the story of Nimrod and, Nimrod and Semiramis from ancient documents. The details of some differ one from another, but the basic story is there. Yeah. And in the uh, book of Jasher, uh, it does claim that Esau killed Nimrod, which I would very much be inclined to believe. Yeah. Um, in uh, the book called Who is Hiram Abiff by J.S.M. Ward, he is a 33rd degree British Freemason. This book is sold in the McCoy uh, Masonic Catalog. It says, as every initiate in Freemasonry represents Hiram and so Tammuz, it naturally follows that in taking on his character, the initiate takes also the title of son of the widow. So Semiramis, her husband, Nimrod, was killed. She became a widow, and Tammuz became the widow's son. Hmm. And every initiate in Freemasonry plays the role of the son of the goddess. It is goddess worship, which is just another one of the, the abominable things. It naturally follows that in taking on his character, the initiate takes also the title of son of the widow. The widow being originally Astarte and later Astarte. In this later form, in this later form, the candidate then becomes the representative of the Savior by a perfectly natural process of religious evolution and the teaching of masonry to be a mystic allegory of the development of the Christ spirit within us. And this is just nothing um, short of blasphemy. Now, in this next uh, picture here. It is a slide that we find in many monitors, and we see here the goddess weeping over the broken column, and behind it, Father Time comes to console her, and this symbolizes the goddess weeping over uh, her slain husband, and uh, this is the, in when women were weeping for Tammuz, they would weep and they would uh, lament the death of, uh, of their hero, the dying god. Now, in this next slide uh, from the Master Mason, it says this, these are collectively referred, referred to as the ancient mysteries. They were celebrated by secret societies, much like ours, with allegorical ceremonies during which the initiates were advanced from one degree to another in these old societies. Read these old stories for yourself and marvel how men in all ages have taught the same great truths in the same effective 
way. And doesn't matter what country, what name you call the God to them, this is the one great truth that always lead to God. Now, in this next slide, I put forth the question, do we want revival? Uh, and one of the great shames and the great blight upon the American evangelical church is, and as you, as you see here, it doesn't take a lot of time to find out Freemasonry is an abomination to God. It just takes anybody that would just examine the documents that we put forth in this brief broadcast. It, it's, it's an abomination. It, it's not maybe it is. So the problem is that we have these pastors that are filling pulpits rather than speak the truth and confront sin. They open their arms wide to these Freemasons. They call them brother. And to embrace a Freemason as your brother, you might as well embrace a Muslim or a Hindu. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, there's no difference, and these uh, pastors, like on every issue that they should speak out on, you it gets crickets. Now, First Kings eighteen twenty one, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him; but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. And that's what we get today when we call some. Uh, call for a decision from these pastors or action, we get crickets, not a word, in almost every case. Now, this next slide is the cover of a book by Charles Finney, The Character Claims and Practical Workings of Freemasonry, and it says here, Charles G. Finney died in 1875 at the age of 83 years. He began his public life as a lawyer and a Freemason. He closed it as one of the greatest evangelists this country and Europe had ever known. As a president of a great college which had grown up under his administration, he was widely known as an abolitionist and as a succeeding Mason. Two of the issues that uh, many people uh, would threaten to kill Charles Finney. Mo three times I know of, he speaks of people that came in the service to kill him, became convicted of the Holy Spirit, and laid their pistols on the altar. It wasn't uncommon at all for knives and weapons to be laid on the altar. He, in the middle of a cholera epidemic in New York, in about, oh, uh, around 1835, I might not have the year just right, but in that period, in the great cholera epidemic, uh, it hit London and Europe the year before, and it came across, and it hit New York the next year. And he was preaching in New York City in the middle of a cholera epidemic, and he was preaching against Freemasonry. And there in the north, Charles Finney said, if you think that you can own another human being, I will not serve you communion. And he would not serve communion to a slaveholder or a Freemason. And it became so intense that he was doing a meeting in New York City, and they set the building on fire he was preaching in, well. and the fire department would not even respond to put the <laughs> fire out. I mean, that was how intense it got. But he wasn't some little wimp that wouldn't stand. I have no respect at all for the pastors that fill these pulpits every Sunday. No respect. Not even a little bit of respect Same I have here. for them. Because they won't stand up. That's what I like about you, Dan. Something's right, you'll stand up for it. Thank you. You know, well, we're, you know, we're gonna. Well, we'll we'll catch the the Dickens over it. Well, that's all right. It doesn't matter what happens to us. What matters is the truth, and we're gonna stand up for the truth. And these cowards won't do it. And that's why Freemasonry has taken over the modern evangelical church. Because, and if you've got a pastor that's like this, you tell him David Carrico said that you are a sniveling coward mm -hmm. that acts like a man that has had their male organs removed that is totally incapable of standing up for the truth. Yeah, they and what happened, the courage, and, you know, uh, the spirit of our Holy Father says, fear not what men could do to you. You know what I mean? Behold, I give you the power to tread on uh, serpents and scorpions and no harm will come upon you. So many of these verses that assures us if he's got a mission for us, it doesn't matter what they could do. And then, you know, people ask me why I have all this courage and all that. It's like, because I trust the Father. If he wants me to go to do something, I don't care what happens to me because they'll just be sending me home sooner. You know, they'll be doing me a favor if you ask me. But um, yeah. 
that's why they can't, these evil people, they can't um, grasp the concept or the reality of how people like us function. Like me, you, no. um, uh, David, um, I'm sorry, me, you, John, and John, everybody at NIAC TV and FOJC Radio, uh, they can't grasp the concept why we're so bold. It's not because we want to be these, you know, stick our chest out and be these big, brave people. No, we're just out here as servants for the Father. That, you know what, if we got the almighty, and this is the passage that. If you got the Almighty on your side, what in the world could who could be against you? As he says, if I am with you, who could be against you? That alone should give you courage of steel. You know what I mean? And the same thing with these people, the Puritans back in this country, the early Christians and all that. That's why they had guts to stand up against the law, largest, the strongest stand army in the world, because they knew they had God with them. You know what I mean? And it goes a long way, all the way back to the scriptures and everything. Same with David, he stood up against a. a uh, Goliath Amen. that was what, two, three times the size at least no, yeah. with no fear because he could, and sham God, we could want all these people through the scripture that had no fear standing up against the enemy because they knew the Father was with them. And today we Amen. have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with us. And uh, you, you got that right, David. And these people are cowards. And I second that motion right there. Yeah. And I, they disgust me. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they disgust me. Uh, and Matthew 10 and 28, and fear not them which are which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, I am not afraid of speaking the truth. I would be afraid if I wouldn't. Amen. <laughs> you know, that's what would scare me. Uh, these people that are afraid to speak the truth it is because they fear man more than god just like you said and it's uh we, they just need rebuke and i rebuke them openly unequivocally uh there's nobody even in just the material we presented this evening it's more than enough for anybody and certainly any believer to say freemasonry is not of god and if you uh and we're going to speak to this in just a little bit but if you are not a freemason and if you are in a church that is giving the right hand of fellowship to Freemasons, you are in sin. Mm -hmm. And you are obligated by Scripture to get out of that church and stop supporting it. Now, I want to read a little bit from what a real man of God. I greatly admire Charles Finney because he stood for the truth, just like any uh, just like any believer should want to do. But this is what he wrote in his book on Freemasonry. He said the murder of William Morgan and the publication of Masonry consequent thereupon in the books I have named broke upon the churches fast asleep on this subject like a clap of thunder from a clear sky. And if anyone doesn't know the story of Captain William Morgan, he was uh, he wrote an expose of Freemasonry. We have a copy of it in our library called Masonry Illustrated. And because he published this book, they took him out in a boat on Lake Erie. They put iron shackles on his legs, and they threw him into Lake Erie to see if he could swim. And, of course, he couldn't. And uh, he died uh, because he revealed the secrets of Freemasonry. But when this became Paul, this is what he's referring to, Captain William Morgan. He said the facts were such, the revelation so clear, that the Baptist denomination backed down. Now think about that. Now, the, I think that anybody that's listened to what we've said so far, that the things we've said are very clear. Mm -hmm. It's not that even people like us that aren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, we can even figure this out. Yeah. You know, nothing hard here. This is wrong. This is <laughs> bad wrong. And when these facts just like Brother Finney said, were so clear that the Baptist church backed down and, and, and took the lead in renouncing and denouncing the institutions. Well, God bless you, Baptists. And it goes on to say their elders and associated churches almost universally passed resolutions disfellowshipping adhering Masons. The denomination, to a considerable extent, took the same course throughout the northern states at that time. And from this revival, about 85% 
of the Freemasons left the lodge before the Civil War. And after the Civil War, Albert Pike rebuilt Freemasonry. There was an anti-Masonic political party. And uh, Willard Fillmore, who became president, he ran... Uh, he didn't run for president on the anti-Masonic party, but he ran for office several times on the anti-Masonic party. And our Hoosier, uh, not Mike Pence, but William Henry Harrison, he also was a member of the anti-Masonic party and a man that had many, many things uh, admirable about him. And he mysteriously died it wasn't even a month into his office. Uh, he died mysteriously. Um, so I, I, and I believe he was killed. I really believe it was killed, but that's another story. Uh, but he goes on to say the elders. Okay. I've, I've read that, but, and you know, back in the early nineties, when I first began to learn these things about Freemasonry, I actually was so excited, I couldn't wait to go tell the preachers, the look here what I've found, look at this. <laughs> and I thought, well, boy, we're going to have a revival. They're going to throw these masons out. We're going to have a revival. Well, boy, was I fooled. And I finally learned that they weren't about to throw the Freemasons out, that the Freemasons owned and controlled them, that uh, the fact that these Freemasons would put money in the plate and I know that uh, the way they work in denominations, they'll donate scholarship money. I know a small uh, General Baptist College down in Nashville, and they put up thousands of dollars for scholarships. Now, you can't reach out and take money from the lodge and then turn around and criticize them. You've got to either choose the truth or the lodge's money. And they buy these they buy their way into places that's exactly what they do it sounds and, like me uh, oh man when i um first started to learn more about freemasonry i went into my church at the time i started speaking out and i got dirty looks from certain people come to find out uh the woman they were part of job's daughters and um two of the elders of the church who actually ran the church other than the pastor they were freemasons and uh they ran me out of the church literally uh because they don't like what i was see you know they said we don't like what you see on your shows what you're teaching and everything else and uh yeah, and yeah, I could see the rings and everything. You, I mean, they, they were Freemasons, and they took highly insult to what I was saying. Yeah, and and during the days of Finney, it was men of God with integrity mm -hmm. that rose up and said, you're going to either choose the lodge or the church. Now, today, if you <laughs> speak out against Freemasonry, and you're uh, one of many examples, they'll show you the door. Yeah. You know, yep. this is where we come. It's apostasy. Mm -hmm. It's apostasy. It's uh, it's twisted, evil apostasy. And I'm, I'm to the place now to where, as anyone knows, listens to me, that I just tell people, get out of these 501c3. Yep. Uh, corporate. Just get out. Just get out. <laughs> Run for your life. Um he goes on to say, I believe it was almost universally conceded that persistent Freemasons who continued to adhere and cooperate with them ought not to be admitted to Christian churches. Now, it is worthy of all consideration and remembrance that God set the seal of his approbation upon the action taken by those churches at that time by pouring out his spirit upon them. Great revivals immediately followed over that whole region. The discussion of the subject and the action of the churches took place in 1827 to 1828 and 9. And in 1830, the greatest revival spread over this region that had ever been known or this or any other country it was called the second great awakening and charles finney was the main figure in it and uh you know do we want revival you know there are a lot of these churches they're in this uh i call it the phony revival movement and they'll talk about revival and they'll want to bring in the the big worship band and all this and make a lot of noise but and they'll talk about repenting from certain things, but they're not going to talk about the deep evil that has the church in its grasp, the actual grasp of Lucifer upon the church. They'll do nothing to release that grasp because uh, they'll talk about some things, but they'll talk about some things they won't. And uh, uh, Freemasonry is the F word that they won't utter mm -hmm. because they're just rank cowards. Um and it, now here in 1 Corinthians 5, this is the text 
that um, I use, and it, well, it, it just says what it says. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. And this forbids us to give the right hand of fellowship to someone that says they're a Christian and yet participates in these idolatrous rites. And I have gone from the early 90s, I begin to see this so clear in Scripture that I refuse to acknowledge any assembly as legitimate that would allow any Freemason to function in it in any way at all. And today I'm to the point where I just tell people, run for your life. Things have been so corrupt that uh, you just need to follow Jesus in him only and uh, get out of these corrupt corporate churches. Amen. In Joshua 24, 15, And if it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. And I, I think that's what we got to do. Mm -hmm. Everyone listening to this broadcast, you're going to have to decide who you're going to serve. Are you going to really obey the Word of God? Or are you going to ignore it and just keep continuing to support that which you know is wrong? Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Do we want revival? The scripture again. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. But let's give answer. Let's say, Yes, we will follow Jesus. We will witness to our Amen. Freemason friends. We will take a stand and witness to those that are in Masonic churches. And it's all just about repenting and believing in Jesus. In 1 John 1, 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And it is not the light of Lucifer. It is not the light from these pagan cults of antiquity. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So I, that's the, uh, the end there of our slides there, Dan. And I just, um, I, I, I think that we've made it very clear here that there are definite decisions everyone has to make and there's definitely uh, a uh, foundation here for anyone to witness to a Freemason. I might also say that uh, we have a book we've written called The Guide for Ministry to Masons which has got 33 chapters in it that deal in detail with um, uh, every, well not every aspect, but with all of the important aspects of Freemasonry quoting their material just like I have here and giving the scriptural answers for it so uh, that's also available for anybody that wants but it's all about standing up for Jesus and witnessing for him and this broadcast is a good way for you to uh, get in the game so to speak and to be able to equip yourself to witness to a Freemason that they do worship another God, that Freemasonry does preach another gospel, and this is eternally damnable in the eyes of the Father. It is, and if you want to follow David and Donna Carrico, just go to FOJC Radio. That's Followers of Jesus Christ Radio, FOJCRadio.com. And you can see here, I mean, you got up on screen here, this site is jam-packed with all kinds of resources uh, where you can buy the DVDs and their books. I mean, the books are amazing. They really are. Tons of outstanding information that exposes the deeds of evil. I mean, they got everything from tracks to, again, um, videos, uh, books, all kinds of things you need for an awesome ministry. And uh, I highly recommend, guys, uh, FOJC Radio, which the link is in the description. And also check out, what's uh, your radio show on every Friday at 7 p.m., is that correct? Eastern time? Yeah, 6 p.m. Central. 6 yeah, the Central. Uh, FOJC Remnant Gathering is at 6 p.m. Central, and 
there on our, our, our homepage at FOJCRadio.com. We have links to our uh, Rumble, Brideon, and Underground Church YouTube channels. Absolutely. It's um, yeah, one, one of the best websites I've been on, man, I tell you, because the amount of information that you need to dig up, you need prayers, you need um, anything like this such, you know I mean, anything to do with spiritual warfare and the biblical studies and all that stuff, it's all on this website. Amazing stuff. And I highly encourage you guys to get out there and support. And they don't even charge that much for the, uh, their uh, material at all. You know, bottom prices, uh, just uh, you'd be able to print more. And it's amazing, good stuff. And uh, thank you, David. Now, if you, actually, if you want to, uh, anything else you want to disclose before... Like, basically, what would you tell a Freemason or a person who's a Christian thinking, because they got friends and everybody else are Freemasons, what would you tell them uh, before that, the, you know, before them going into the lodge? Well, don't, obviously. <laughs> uh, you're getting yourself into something that's right out of the bowels of hell. You're, you're getting in, and these are the words of Freemasonry itself. You're yoking yourself with an organization that, admits to being in league with the ancient mystery religions and with all of the pagan cults, they proudly admit that. Mm -hmm. And it's a no-brainer. Uh, this organization is cursed because it worships another god and preaches another gospel. So don't let anyone deceive you into joining Freemasonry. It doesn't matter if your pastor tells you it's okay or if your friends tell you tells you that it's okay. The Word of God says it's not okay. Absolutely. And from just the information, which is not even scratching <laughs> the tip of the iceberg, I have to laugh because the amount of information, like I said last week, we, we'd be here for hours on and probably days uh, just talking about it. But the amount of information out there, it's incredible. And uh, David just scratched the surface. Like we, you know, both our shows combined, we scratched the surface. There's so much more. And it, at this point right now, I mean, a professing Christian, that should know the Bible, should know what the scripture says. At this point right now, you should be hightailing it fast as you can. And actually, uh, why I got you on the air, David, because uh, I actually got approached by um, a mason asking how to uh, get out of this. You know what I mean? So your recommendation right now, how would they spiritually and physically be able to remove themselves from this lodge? Well, of course, you pray and you ask for forgiveness and cleansing for that which you've done. And the Father is so free to forgive us of this and all of our sins. And then we have a form that you can get from our ministry called a demit form. And this is a letter uh, that they, it's a form they just fill out. It just basically says that uh, I come out of Freemasonry because it's incompatible with Christianity and they take that and they mail it to the lodge that they were initiated in and that is the the way to spiritually break the ties uh, with Freemasonry to openly renounce it to let them know we've broken that tie and we have no more uh, affiliation with you and in the lodge they'll there's another one of their little cliches once a Freemason, always a Freemason. But this is just another one of their lies. Mm -hmm. You can be free of the the grip of Freemasonry, and there's terrible iniquity uh, in the passage we read in ex Exodus. There's iniquity that is passed down. There needs to be the cleansing of iniquity. There's the curse of another gospel. And there's prayers that the Freemason needs to pray to break free from these things. But it's nothing that uh, the Father can handle. And it's just a matter of wanting to repent from a heart of obedience and then to take that step to officially let them know we're out of here. We have nothing to do with you and letting them know why. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Carrico, I want to thank you for your time and uh, such great information. Uh, God bless you and shalom. Thank you so much, Dan. Take Bye -bye. care, David. I'll be in touch. All righty. So guys, that was FOGC Radio host uh, David Carrico. Please check them out, guys. And uh, yeah, and uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, doesn't matter what cult you've been into, what kind of ritual you've uh, been in through, what kind of um, degrees, what, anything that's thought, okay? Whatever you think that's, you know, I can't go back now, right? The blood of Jesus Christ, okay? Whatever contract you made, right? Whatever cult or Satan himself, 
The blood of Jesus Christ could break any of those. Literally, it, it, it would laugh at the contract. It would take that contract that you signed the spiritual in a spiritual way. You know what I mean? Take that up, and yeah, your contract's null and void. All you have to do is call upon the blood of Jesus Christ, and you know, say, "Lord, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, forgive me for me partaking in the occult." And you say, "I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to serve two masters no more. I'm going to serve you only, Jesus Christ." And please help me denounce any and all affiliations and ties and spiritual ties and so on with the Masonic Lodge, the craft there. And just, you know what I mean, uh, pray your heart out. That's all. And you can't go wrong. There's no certain words to say. You know what I mean? Uh, just use those kind of things in general. Just say, you know, tell Jesus you want out, plain and simple. You want out and you want to follow him directly. And let your lodge know with a letter, like David said, uh, where you can print out on FOGCRadio.com. Let them know. It's like, you know, respectfully. Thank you for your time, everything else, whatever. But I'm um, following Jesus Christ from this day forward. And I am f officially denouncing any and all ties to the craft. And turn over your material, guys. Actually, burn it, to tell you the truth. Any material, you got monitors, you got books. And if there's going to be a problem, whatever, just give it back to the lodge uh, to save any problems. But even your uh, ranks and the signatures, especially the symbols they give you and the pins and all the little doodads with the uh, aprons and all that. Uh, give it back to the lodge or just burn the stuff. Just, you know, cut your ties away and, you know, do away with it, plain and simple. Declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com And welcome everybody to Spiritual Warfare Friday. We got a house full of people here today. Um, we got Trey, we got um, uh, yeah, Brian, we got Jason, and me, Dan Badandi here in the house. So we got an awesome show for you guys today. And today's broadcast is The Gods of Freemasonry, The Craft of Darkness. And there's a reason why, there's a low case she, by the way. It's not a mist, it's not a grimace uh, typo, or whatever. There's a reason for that. So we're going to get into that. And, um, so I want to thank, uh, like always, uh, ShakeAndWakeRadio.com for carrying this show and all our shows. She carries my show, Trey's show, Brian's show, and probably Jason's show soon, all in a, all on her network. And if you want to subscribe to them, guys, go into the description. All of our channels and our backup channels and the rumbles and all this other stuff are all in the description. Or if you go to TruthRadioShow.com, I got direct pages for everybody. So <laughs> one-stop shop, uh, TruthRadioShow.com. And also for Shake Awake too. So check out BeforeIt'sNews.com as well. And tonight's broadcast is brought to you by WattsLeather.com, where your custom leather project becomes a reality. So please check them out and play, check out NYS TV as well. So yeah, we got a lot to talk about tonight. And um, yeah, I don't even know where to begin, man, because um, I know. Um, I mean, I, I just got to know Brian over a year, so but um, I don't know how much he's familiar with this kind of stuff. But as far as me and Trey, uh, we could go on for hours on end by ourselves about Freemasonry. So today we're going to prove beyond a shadow of doubt that and uh, the God of Freemasonry is not the God of the Bible. Regardless of what you told in the Blue Lodge. So I want to reach out and I encourage in my post that if you know a Freemason to have them watch. Now I want to go out and, you know, I speak for all three of us here, all four of us, I should say. Uh, we are not at all, at all criticizing Freemasons, right? Uh, in fact, most Freemasons are great, wonderful people. But do know the people at the top, regardless of what, you know, the other Masons think, the people at the top are not good people at all. They're in there for a reason to mislead everybody underneath them. So we're going to get into all this stuff. So to those Freemasons watching out there, and uh, hopefully you watch the show, God bless you. And we are not in any way trying to um, ridicule you or anything like that. And again, I have to emphasize this because I don't want people going out with uh, uh, torches and, you know, fork, you know, pitchforks or whatever at somebody's house because they're a Freemason. You know, it doesn't mean they're an evil person, okay? They're just misled. I have to put it that way. So the gods of Freemasonry, we're going to prove today beyond a shadow of doubt, it is not the God of the Bible. It is not Jesus Christ. And we're going to do that today. So, and I know uh, for some people who belong to Freemasonry in the second, third degree, and they'll be like, well, what are you talking about? It's all about God. It's all about the Bible. Well, yeah, 
so you think. <laughs> We're getting into this stuff. And uh, so, um, yeah, um, let's hear from Brian and Trey. What's up, guys? What's going on, Dan, Trey? Uh, welcome, everybody, to Spiritual Warfare Friday. Uh, the winds are blowing. The train <laughs> tracks are popping off. Um, it's pretty crazy. I'm, my prayers go out to everybody out in Arkansas and, heck, I mean, all over the south, Tennessee, I mean, Illinois, Indiana. I know that's up north, but, uh, yeah, some – horrendous tornado activity going down and um it's pretty bad it's pretty rough stuff so i know it's even even out my way we have a tornado watch and stuff so i'm like come on now so i don't know if everybody remembers two not or a couple weeks weekends ago uh i literally was doing a show and literally the roof was coming off so uh well bobby hale yeah. in the chat room he said uh, the roof of his bond just blew off just oh, now <laughs> wow well we're gonna be praying and then i heard uh what was it the hippie hebrews in the in the chat uh, making commentary about the house vibrating and all this stuff. I think I've seen that where it was bad and they still got power. Uh, praise God, you still got power. And then, uh, Bobby, uh, hang on, man. Don't let you, um, don't get stressed out. I know how it is. I watched all that go down and I pray it doesn't go down my way again because I, we, we still haven't got any repairs done on the roof. So I can only imagine it can't take another hundred mile an hour wind. <laughs> so <laughs> just with some patching, but yeah. So that's all I got. Um, just bless everybody for being here. Um, and I'm glad to have Trey Boy in the house. Uh, and we're all just coming together in one body and one accord. And I'm thankful to be here. So take it away, Trey. <laughs> well, guys, thank you for having me yet again. It is always a pleasure. Uh, it's always a blast, really to be here and honestly i'm very excited about tonight's show because uh for those of you out there who have followed me for a while you know that this is one of those things that i think it was like literally for about 12 weeks straight we just kept hitting you know uh how this topic the gods of freemasonry uh what well, yeah by the way spoiler alert one of them is the antichrist that first beast and really that second beast of revelation they're both going to be involved mm -hmm. in this secret religion that goes on within freemasonry so i'm super excited mm -hmm. to be able to talk about this with uh two of my favorite people tonight two of my favorite people outside my household let me add that because i'm gonna get slapped upside the head later if i don't clarify that so <laughs> Uh, we're just going to tear your mailbox down, remember? The yeah. conversation oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I told you, it'll hit you back, so just be warned. <laughs> a little inside joke. We're not, we're, me and Dan are not <laughs> destructive beings. We're just... <laughs> <laughs> and we live far too far away to destroy your mailbox. Yeah. But um, we was making some sarcastic remarks about some... Uh, Dan mentioned a movie, and I was making sound of, you know, impre you know impressions and stuff. But, yeah, we're not, we're not going to destroy uh, uh, poor Trey Boy's... Uh, mailbox so yeah absolutely not that would be a federal <laughs> offense <laughs> yeah. we don't, yeah we, we don't yeah. condone violence here. Yeah, exactly exactly right. unless yeah. you deserve it no i'm just kidding no we uh, don't do that we don't do that <laughs> no, I'm just that was all inside joke and that's just nothing but love yeah <laughs> well a couple of nuts before you get going to um first of all i had a little poll going on in the chat room it says uh what god does freemasonry serve and uh, the answers were god of the bible lucifer satan brian's milk jugs or nimrod osiris so well, and I should have put the we read the questions, but yeah, no, eleven people percent people said Brian's milk jugs, and nobody said God of the Bible, so that's good. But I guess there's really no wrong answer because Lucifer, Satan, Nimrod, all uh, some of the deities that's worshipped up worshipped in Freemasonry. So yeah, so um, that's the end with the poll. And also, guys, we got a we're gonna mention this once. We got a donation page to help support this ministry and broadcast. It's right there in the chat room. It's a Ko-Fi page. You go there. You don't have to sign up for nothing. You donate what you want, and it goes to the operation you see here. So we thank everybody that's donated. And most of all, we thank everybody that's prayed for us. And I want to thank Jason, Valerie, and Uncle Obvious in the chat room there, rocking the chat room and moderating for us. Thank you so much. And thank everybody out there. And thank you, Harold McCain, for plastering all those Bible verses nonstop. He's awesome. Uh, we go on for five hours sometime. He's still there. Bang, bang, bang. God bless him, you know. And uh, so thank you, everybody, for listening to the chat room. So before we get going, let's start off with a prayer. And uh, so Yeshua Messiah, Jesus, we come to you and ask you to forgive us all of our individual sins. Make us pure before the Father. Father, we come to you tonight and ask you to 
just guide us, Lord, and protect us against the forces of evil because what we're about to expose tonight is going to be, uh, <laughs> we're going to become spiritual targets real quick. And anybody out there that is a Freemason or thinks I'm joining Freemasonry, I pray that you can reach them, Lord, touch their heart, and help us disseminate this information to them so they could go research the stuff and find out for the truth. And we ask you to touch their heart to get, this, get them out of the craft, get them out of the occult. And anybody else in any uh, kind of secret society or cult, we ask you to deliver them away from the clutches of the devil. And we ask you to comfort everybody here that's going through problems like, um, who is it? Um, one of our uh, listeners here uh, got their roof blown off here uh, in the barn there. So we ask you to comfort them, Lord, and comfort everybody that needs uh, help. In your precious name, amen. 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 So, yeah, uh, good stuff, man. So um, I got a load of stuff, man. I'm probably never going to finish it tonight. But um, I yeah, I always, like, get more than I need. <laughs> but um, and I do, ex you know, follow-up shows with that. But uh, tonight, you know, Trey's the guest. So I figured let's start with Trey. You know, let's let, let Trey talk and Brian talk. And I can go all night, and I know Brian's got limits because uh, – his eye, eye vision, and uh, he's got a family to take care of, and uh, Trey's got stuff going on too. So it doesn't matter me. I, I mean, you guys go first and uh, take it away, man. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still yep. here. So I had to reach up. I forgot about a book <laughs> I wanted to reference, and I realized I didn't even have it out. Oh, and uh -oh. I knew he was going to call on me first, so I needed to be ready. Um, <laughs> so here, look, here's the first thing I want to get into because this is something I've talked about. We lost you on camera, by the way, Trey. Oh, he's back. Yeah, uh, it, sh it should be back now. Okay, yeah. no, never mind. Um, yeah, I, I intentionally turned it off. Uh, okay. Because I knew I was going to knock my light down on my head, and I did. So Dude, Don't hit your you head, know. Trey. Don't hit your head. We don't want your vision going <laughs> no, out, man. Come on. No, now. We only yeah. want to hit mailboxes, right? Yeah. We, no, no, we don't want to do We don't want to fall <laughs> milk trucks. We don't, have, we don't want to have cameras hitting no, us in the head. No, no, yeah, I, no. Just, I didn't yeah, say, yeah. I didn't say, I just want to clarify yeah. for everybody. I said yeah. mailboxes, not milk yeah. trucks. We don't want anybody yeah, to I call voted, milk truck. By, by the way, I voted for Brian's milk jugs on the on the poll. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Anyways, y'all continue on. Trey, you got the floor. I actually did not vote for that for once, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's good to know you did. <laughs> yeah. So, look, this is this is what I want to talk about. Um, when we get into uh, – there's this picture right here. I'm not sure if you guys can see it, and I've marked this up a lot. Let me pull it back. So what that is is that is the, that is the Master Mason as the capstone on the pyramid. Now, this is from the book The Luciferian Transmutation. Uh, the Luc Global Luciferian Mass and What It Means to You by David and Donna Carrico. One of my absolute favorite books to reference anytime we talk about this subject hmm. because this book proves that Freemasonry will be implicit in this end times abomination. Uh, and if, if, if you haven't read it, you need to. You can find it on FOJCRadio.com. It is worth the read. I finished this literally the day that I got this. Uh, we left, I think, the next day from Indiana, um, and I finished it before we got home. Granted, it's an 11-hour ride, and it's not a huge book, but it's it's a page turn. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what it says. It says, in this picture is concealed the allegory of the lost word. The master mason, having completed his labors, becomes a worker on a higher plane, that the one in which the ordinary builder is permitted to work. Like So he's, he becomes a worker on a higher plane than that which the ordinary builder is permitted to work. So if you're in the blue house, you would be considered the ordinary worker, right? Um, and you got to understand that the third degree of Freemasonry, even though it's called the Master Mason, uh, you're nowhere near a master yet, hmm. really and truly. Um, you've got uh, quite a few more degrees to go. Um, and I highly encourage you, if you are a Freemason reading this, uh, read Morals and Dogma. Uh, you need to be familiar with your own literature because um, it exposes itself. Um, but this says the master mason becomes the capstone of the universal temple. Mm. Um, so here's the thing. Um, when you read, and this, and here's what this really comes down to. So this universal temple. For those of you who don't know, Freemasonry, uh, ends their all their lodge meetings with a prayer to what is known as the Grand Architect of the Universe. Now, here's the thing. You can be a Muslim. You can be a Christian, supposedly. Um, you can be of any religion, and you can still be a part of this group because all you have to do is believe in a God, and you can pray to this Grand Architect of the Universe. 
Well, the Bible says that, uh, you know, he, the, 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 the biblical Bible, he says, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, he doesn't say those two necessarily right at the same time, but he does say that. He says, I'm a jealous God. So let me ask you how a jealous God would let Muslims and all these people that don't believe in him and deny his son because, you know, Muslims deny the, the deity of Christ. They say that, you know, uh, you know, that Allah is, you know, one God like, you know, he, Allah, Allah has no son is what it is. Um, so. How is this God who gave his son to die for the sins of the world going to let him? He's not because Jesus says, I am the way I am the truth. I am the life and no man comes to the father, but by me. So therefore we can already understand that we're dealing with a different God. So when you see that this master Mason is the capstone of this universal, which by the way, another word for universal that means universal is Catholic. The word Catholic actually means universal. Uh, so we've got already got a similarity right there. Uh, not necessarily that these two groups see eye to eye um, because traditional Catholics do not. Um, but this universal temple is an antithesis to this where Peter says that you are living stones. And, you know, we are all make up that temple of God. This is the absolute antithesis to this. So if the Freemasons are all a part of this universal temple, and this guy is the capstone. Well, we know that Christ Jesus is our chief cornerstone. We're dealing with the Antichrist here. This master Mason, who exists on this higher plane, which would make him an ascended master, by the way. Uh, that's where that phrase comes from. Um, this is the Antichrist. This is that beast, right? And see, what you need to understand is when you're dealing with this system— the, the, the term separation of church and state, made famous by Thomas Jefferson, right? What people don't realize is that is not a, and, and I'm going to make, there's a chance I could make some patriots real mad, and, and I get that. Um, but uh, uh, separation of church and state is a, an Illuminati term because the Illuminati believed that, and here's the graphic for it right here. Um, so what you have, and I'll, I'll walk you through it, is here we have, uh, during the Lemurian Epoch, we have male and female, uh, each being a complete creative unit. So this is where androgyny comes into it. Well, after, uh, after humanity falls, uh, you enter the Atlantean and the Aryan Epochs, mm -hmm. according to these alchemists, um, where humanity is divided into two sexes. The male ideal is Hiram Abiff, who, by the way, is the ascended master, the, the, the master mason. Um, and that's who you play when you become the, uh, when you're in the third degree, you play the role of Hiram Abiff. Um, he's the male ideal of it. And then you have the Virgin Mary or the uh, Madonna, if you will, uh, who is the, the female um, but this is also known as something uh, called the separation of church and state. So because the you have the male who represents, you know, you have Hiram, who was this kingly figure, right? Mm -hmm. He represents the state. And then, of course, you have the Virgin Mary, whom the church, the church lifts up. She is she plays. She is the role of of the church. Right. And this is what it says. Um, I've got to find out where it's at because it's. There's actually this this book does a great job of breaking it down. Um, you have, yeah, the statecraft. This is a quote, by the way. Um, it says the statecraft employed by the sons of Cain holds up the male ideal, Hiram Abiff, the master craftsman, the son of fire, while the sons of Seth as priestcraft hold up the female idea in the Virgin Mary the Lady of the Sea, which, by the way, is a tarot card. If, if For those of you who aren't familiar, the Lady of the Sea, you know, um, this, all this stuff feeds in together. So you literally have right here, they have male and female, which would be, uh, you know, the king and priest. So when you see Melchizedek, not everybody who talks about that is, you know, uh, is a good guy. I mean, we believe the true Mel line of Melchizedek goes through Christ, but these weirdos believe in it, too, um, and they believe they are that. And then, then you have this separation of church and state, but what they want to do one day is bring this androgyny, this male and female, this church and state back, 
And that's what we're dealing with right now. That's where these ideas of transgenderism and non-binary and all of this. That's why you see the Baphomet set up in all these satanic temples, uh, because they're bringing back their God, their androgynous God, this this um, this. Uh, which, by the way, it, it, yeah, so uh, that's and then I'm sure that's another God we'll be talking about the the Baphomet and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I just wanted to point that out is that, you know. These the, the this is this is what we're dealing with. This is and look, America, I believe, is going to play a a a pretty central role in this when we already are really. But, uh, I mean, when you've got, even got Thomas Jefferson talking about the separation of church and state, and I believe there's, there's good anecdotal evidence to suggest that, uh, at least later in his life, Thomas Jefferson was without a doubt involved with the Illuminati, um, and his ties to Lafayette and the French revolution absolutely proved that in my mind, but you guys need to do your own research and make up your own minds on that. So um, that's just a little bit of some of the things we could get into. Um, but that, I believe, is the biggest part because, you know, this is the guy, these two, the, where I was going with this was these two guys, the first beast and second beast of Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> like these, this is that. This is the reunification of church and state. And, 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 and it, it ain't going to be a good thing. So actually, when I start seeing all this stuff about Christian nationalism and all of this stuff moving up and like the MAGA movement and things like that, yeah, my wheels start turning because I know I know how this stuff works. And then you've got General Flynn who's into all this crap, too, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, he did that. He had everybody read that prayer, right, with the sevenfold light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so what a lot of people don't realize and. I know most people listening to this that have been around now, you see TV for a while, will understand that he took that from Elizabeth Clare Prophet, who channeled it from one of these, quote, ascended masters. So uh, all of this stuff absolutely ties in together. And if you know what you're looking for, you'll see it going on in our own country right now. Well, it's interesting, Trey, you mentioned this one chime in real quick. And I'll let you get back on it here. Um, you mentioned Atlantis, like oh, Atlantis, King speak, Atlantean. Um, yep. So my, my gears are turning when I'm listening to you here and we're talking about this, uh, this very serious topic. Um, Emerald, Emerald tablets come to mind. Uh, yeah. the character, uh, Thoth comes to mind and that alone, what you're talking about, these deities and this, uh, you know, well, what you would say in, in masonry would be harnessing Osiris, you know, the, the, uh, presidential thing that they do, the ritual, the ceremony they do and all that. Um, Absolutely. That, it's the same. So, you know, Dan was saying earlier, I know you and Dan know a lot about this. I, I'm coming at a different perspective. I'm the guy yeah. that's coming at the archaeology standpoint, looking at to it uh, with the uh, when these gears, my gears start turning about this Atlantis, these ancient gods and this, uh, you know, they, they talk about reincarnation. And that's the same thing with this Os Osiris spirit. And um, it's very, it's very, very dark and scary. I mean, it goes way back. Yeah, it goes way back beyond the Egyptian stuff, and we're talking about ancient Samaritan, or excuse me, ancient well in Mesopotamia and ancient Samaritan. In my yeah. opinion, in my no, opinion, I agree. So uh, I don't know if uh, I mean I'm sure people are familiar with it, but you know, back in the day, Rob Skiba wrote a book called Babylon Rising, and the first shall be last, and that was basically the premise of his book was that you know Nimrod, in some form or fashion, could very well possibly be reincarnated as the Antichrist. Mm. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with a physical reincarnation, mm -hmm. but that spirit, that Osiris spirit is definitely going to lay upon this guy. Um, and I believe second Thessalonians says that with the, you know, when you talk about the man of sin, mm -hmm. it said whose coming will be after the working of Satan, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we know Satan has ties with Zeus. Um, I believe that he played an implicit role with Nimrod, who I believe mm -hmm. uh, is who Osiris is based on. And it's really interesting because when you get into the Genesis 6 conspiracy, Gary Wayne does a really good job of showing that That yeah. really. I don't think he comes out and says this, um, but he does a really good job of showing that, um, you know, Thoth or, you know, Hermes Trismegistus, as he was called, you know, Hermes the Thrice Great. Uh, yeah, he was this false prophet guy. And him yeah. and Nimrod had this, they tried to bring about this reunification of church and state, if you will, at the Tower of Babel. 
goes through well, the DNA it, because, like, um, remember during the Gulf Wars, there was reports of all these countries say the United States military they're going and taking containers home of archaeological remains, like from these tombs, like the Nephilim tombs and all that. And they said yep. they got into the Pyramid Giza, and they also got Nim, literally uh, Nimrod's uh, de- his remains. So uh, could they use his, you know, through DNA and stuff? We can't mention too much because of YouTube, but yeah, uh, use the genetics from Nimrod, you know, the seed of the serpent. To bring by you know fought the Antichrist, and that was what twenty years ago the the Gulf War. So right now this uh, genetic creature <laughs> that person they created, uh, if if that's the case, you know the Antichrist, whatever, that could be very well the bloodline and also part of the bloodline of Nimrod. You know, so because uh, Nimrod's Absolutely. a very revered figure, Nimrod is also is Osiris, and some also believe it's the same character as Gilgamesh. So uh, yeah, you know, yeah. So this guy, the ruler of Babylon, he is one of the top dogs of Freemasonry. And uh, we're going to get to all the stuff with that too. But um, man, it, this is a wild, wild rap hole, man. So sorry to yeah. interrupt you guys. Good. <laughs> no, uh, real quick, uh, both of you guys, you know, we were talking about Thoth, right? Trey and Dan, uh, you mm-hmm. know, like uh, he, he, he started showing up in Atlantis. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you look into the great war of Atlantean, uh, that, that stuff is six fingers, six toes. There's, oh, yeah. there's giants involvement and everything. There's like a big, there, this is a huge war that the mm-hmm. great war of Atlantis. So, but get to, just to summarize it here in short, short uh, comment here. Um, Thoth was in that time, and then shows up in Egyptian time, and the Egyptians literally sought him out to be. He's all over the Mason, the Mason's Bible, and everything. Mm-hmm. The imagery of Thoth. It has the uh, what's the what's the bird's name? The bird. Uh, I can't Mom think of. The, yeah, I uh, think is no. Is that the double-headed eagle? No, it's the other one. Um, it's like a I, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head right now. My mind is uh, I'm losing my train of thought on that. But anyways, he was sought after is like a with with uh, not was it alchemy or maybe not alchemy, mm-hmm. but a rim- alchemy uh, too. Yeah, alchemy and there was yeah. one other like writing and stuff like that, different languages. Scientific. How's he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he show he shows up, and and what I re- remember looking into the Emerald Tablets, he. It was the pho- uh, philosopher stone. That's it, the philosopher mm-hmm. stone, yeah. and he he yeah. was able to make it, and uh, supposedly he was successful, and that gave him what it gave him immortality. So when you yep. look in the Knights of the Templar, uh, you got you like you was talking about uh, Herman or not? Uh, what was it? Hermes, right? You Herm- said Hermes. Hermes, yeah, yeah, Hermes yeah, is Herm- one, and then uh, uh, the other one is Merlin. Merlin, the Knights mm-hmm. of the Templar, King Arthur days, and all that. In yep. that in that narrative, they say that he was Thoth reincarnated. I've mm. heard that Merlin was a, a reincarnation of Thoth. Well, it's so funny if you, you mentioned all- Atlantis. Yeah, and, you mentioned and, Atlantis, and, and, right? Because um, well, Sir Francis Bacon, he was tied with the secret societies, right? He called this land the yeah. New Atlantis. So that's what Freemasons yep. is about, bringing forth the New Atlantis. So it, it's all yeah. connected. So uh, you're, you're matching right in with this, Brian. I'm yeah, sorry, Craig. So- <laughs> And no, you're fine because I was just going to clarify that's exactly so. Merlin isn't a name, Merlin is a title, absolutely. So, and once again, Merlin is also a bird. Um, so it's right in with that. So, um, and people don't understand King Arthur, even though there, there, there might have been a historical figure that you know he's tied to, he is absolutely 100% the romantic, the romanticization of Nimrod as this master mason see the whole thing about you know when you get into arthur and merlin and the holy grail and all of this stuff you 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 have to understand you're dealing with a code not somewhere uh, i can't remember where it's on one of this in this mess of books i've got uh the lost symbol and uh the da vinci code by dan brown mm-hmm. um but i also have the books with the histo- like the essays that you know, because this guy doesn't just make up these stories; they're they're based in what some people believe are fact. Um, but you get into the Grail, you start looking at bloodlines, and you know we did a whole show on this. The three of us did. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think it was the first show that all three of us ever did together. Yep. Was we oh, talked yeah. about the King Arthur stuff. Um, but you start getting into this stuff, and look, that's what I was talking about with the lost word. You know, they believe that that's what the Philosopher's Stone is. By the way. Uh, they cool. believe that 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 this this elixir of life is this lost word that, you know, and, and I've done a whole show on this and I actually tied in, believe it or not, I tied in Delta. I'm about to say some things that are that might get us in trouble, but I, I there's no way I can beat around the bush. I have to say it. 
uh, Delta, Omicron are both symbols that are used in alchemy. Mm -hmm. And then you have that, that, uh, that infinity symbol, right? Um, that's commonly, you know, tied into the Ouroboros, mm -hmm. um, that meta uses, yeah. you know, and all, all of these happen at the same time. These, these two ver ver uh, variations of this, this, you know, illness that we're going around um and then all of a sudden facebook changes to meta and that's their new symbol um well i started noticing that that was a sim those all three of those are commonly used in the symbol of the philosopher's stone so um you know we did an entire show on that went down uh the rabbit hole of you know how that was tied into and you know we've been inundated with this stuff when you talk about conan the barbarian I don't even know if people realize this, but pay really close attention. If you read those stories, mm -hmm. the seven races that are there are actually the seven root races of theosophy, mm -hmm. which is absolutely 100% tied into Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, well, what we're talking about, what we're talking about is uh, according to the Emerald tablets, they talk about when you talk about the philosopher's stone, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm understanding it right, the key ingredient, to this, this lovely uh, rock is urine. So it's, I know it's ridiculous. It takes a chemical compound. You have to be a chemist to pull it off. And I think it's like three to eight years to pull it yeah. off. We can't, we can get yeah. it. It would take forever to get into the details of it. It's complex. Yeah. But anyways, for so, the record, for the record, they said Thoth figured out a way to reincarnate every hundred years. That's how yeah. it was. So that's why he pops up in Egypt. That's what, that's the example of it. It's kind of strange, but. Well, yep. that yeah, and that's why, and not to cut you off, but I I, I agree with you. Um, yeah, Thoth and Hermes. That's why their names are used interchangeably, and that's why Egypt has a Hermes, and you know, Greece has a third her Hermes, um, because they're all tied to the same being. And you know, here's what's really interesting: when you get into the Emerald Tablets, the Emerald Tablets are just like anything else; they're coded. What you have to understand, and this is something that I've st I haven't heard anybody else talk about this, but this philosopher's stone, it can physically exist. Um, but using urine, um, by the way, is uh, you may take this stone and actually turn it. But so, what was it that the devil, uh, th th that Satan told Jesus? He said, you know, if you are, if thou art the son of God, take this uh, stones and turn it to bread, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the emerald ta or the philosopher's stone isn't a actual stone; it's bread. Um, and it's something that Aleister Crowley had called the cake of light ritual, which involves urine and period blood and a bunch of other nasty crap put together. And then they eat this stuff and they believe it helps them ascend into Godhood. See, that's what people don't understand. When you talk about the Holy Grail, it's the womb of Mary Magdalene. That's where the period blood comes in, not to get too graphic. Um, but yeah, that's that they believe that this stuff is the elixir of life. So they put it inside this piece of bread, this cake of light or this philosopher's stone, if you will. And they believe it to, instead of turning a base metal into gold, it takes a human soul and will turn it divine. That's what they believe. Mm. Yeah, man. It's a, <laughs> uh, yeah. If you guys ever, uh, this is Alistair Crowley here. So I was actually just on the phone with David Carrico and um, we got something done on the back burner, like a couple months from now, whatever. Hopefully, we'll be doing a show called The Crowley Connection. Wait till you see that. Whew. You know, wait till you see all the stuff that Crowley was directly or indirectly connected with. False religions, mm -hmm. a lot to do with Freemasonry, man, and everything else. So, yeah, but, um, yeah, the Cake of Life, and uh, if you study Alistair Crowley, uh, they had, you know, did stuff with adrenochrome, too, which uh, what they do is they scare a kid half to death. When the kid's adrenaline, you get the fight or flight adrenaline going through you, that's when they would sacrifice the child and use the blood for sacrificial things. And they believe that this adrenalized blood, the adrenochrome, gives them everlasting life because they take, you know, here's the thing, does it sound familiar? Life is in the blood. And we, uh, Trey was saying about the bread of life and all that. Yeah, it sounds biblical, right? Because what they do is they take everything from the Bible, the occult does, right? Everything from the Bible, they take what God's done and did, right? They take it and make it their own, but pervert it nastily. Complete mm -hmm. mirror image pervert of what God's done. So a lot of stuff, yeah, yeah like I said, it sounds so biblical. It absolutely does. And that's how they trick Freemasons. Good people who join the yeah. Blue Lodge that are Christians. Oh, look, oh, we talk about Hiram Biff, Thomas Temple, a temp, a temple and all that, the bread of life, this and that. Then they come to find out later on, it's nothing to do with what they think it is. You know, it's. Um, real quick, too, uh, Oops. Trey, uh, real quick, and Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, you, tell me, we, you know how they, you know, the biblical narr narrative, it talks about manna 
you know, so there's an also, I remember uh, something to do with ancient, it might've been ancient Samaritan maybe, or Atlantean. Um, they call them milk cuts. I think it's called milk cuts, I think, or milk cuts. Uh, I think it's how it's pronounced. And it's almost like a, hmm. a yellowish white substance and almost looks like a bread is what I remember hmm. hearing the depiction on it. And that also would talk about, they said it gave them a super ability, like a cerebro, te- uh, you know, cerebro, you know, like uh, telepathic, uh, just like off the chain, being all intelligent, all you know, literally beyond beyond anybody else. There's a lot of uh, like they could be able to rejuvenate and healing. And it might be the same kind of stuff that we're talking about tonight. I just want to chuck that in there and throw it into the into the mix. Mm. But uh, right. it's there's I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, Trey. Some priests, the real stuff, man. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that specific thing, I feel like I've heard somebody mention and I'm not too mm-hmm. familiar, yeah. but the Starfire ritual, they believe that did the same thing and that feeds into the blood part of what I was talking about. Um, once again, I don't want to get too graphic. I've already said what I needed to say on it, but that's why they do it. They believe it opens mm-hmm. their third eye. Mm-hmm. And that's what they mean when they talk about taking something that's base and turning it into gold, which is, you know, it was re- represented purity, right? I mean, watch Indiana Jones in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, right? You know, they yeah. gifted the city of gold. It wasn't gold they wanted. It was knowledge, Yeah, right? That was their treasure. And it's the same thing. They want this divine knowledge. That's well, it is. It goes back to Gnosticism. But they believe they do these rituals. And, it, yeah, it opens their third eye and gives them. You know, I like the way you put in the Cerebro thing because, I mean, that's what, like, Professor X would do. He would expand his mind beyond normal human capacity right so he had these great psychic abilities um so i mean yeah i mean it makes perfect sense to me um and it definitely the way you described it totally sounds like a um a blasphemous counterfeit to mana which by the way would feed into the lost word because jesus is the word right he is the logos um and that's what they believe it is they believe this lost word they can attain that's why you know, in the third in the third degree of Freemasonry, the uh, once once the um, once the guy rises out of the the casket or whatever when he's being playing the role of Hiram Abiff. I don't know if it's a physical casket. I've I mean, it's been a while since I've studied it, but you know, basically Hiram Abiff is raised from the dead. Um, you know, he's raised from death to life. Another mm-hmm. blasphemous thing, and um, you know, they whisper that word Mahabon in his ear right mm-hmm. that's the secret yeah. word of uh scottish right freemasonry um and they believe that all of this stuff all of this really and it, let's call it what it is all of this stupid silly stuff is going to make them do this right and that's where that whole lost word thing comes in it's it's just um there's always a go there's always a go component yeah with, absolutely. with this stuff and then you know remember you speaking of uh you know uh uh, Professor X, all right, um, Xavier. Remember the movie? Uh, was it the Apocalypse or uh, X Men Apocalypse? Yeah, yeah. Was it was it the future? Something of the future? It's a time travel. It came out like 2016. The yeah, Apocalypse. So they did. They did uh, Days of Future Past, and then that fed right into Apocalypse. Yeah, Apocalypse. Remember when he said he goes, "I've been called many names," right? And there was a lot of biblical uh, quotes and slow. They 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 yeah. slowly they slowly pushed it into the into the uh, lines of the actors. I don't know if you noticed that during that movie. I haven't watched it yeah. in years, but uh, he talks about, I've been many names throughout time. He even says, I think he even says Nimrod or maybe Osiris, maybe. He and says look, Osiris. Osiris, yeah. And you remember yeah. how he's laying down into his little temple with his little down to the ground, and mm-hmm. he has to have another, uh, he basically gets the essence from the prime, like a, a prime, you know, in his prime state human being, you know, a, a strong, yeah. strong man. And there's a gold, uh, yeah. there's a gold narrative, right? There's this gold that incorporates with it so he can, you know, harnesses his power, the yeah. cerebro and all that. It's crazy. I, you're mm-hmm. just making me think, man, this conversation. Yeah. So, so when they suck the energy out of that sacrifice for him, I believe the energy itself is gold. Yeah. Before it transfers, they do the body transference. Um, I believe it. And it, look, it's only been like a matter of fact, I think me and my wife, because when we first got married, we were really into those movies. So we went back and watched them. We we're like, all right, we're going to watch them with open eyes now and see what we see. And I told her it was insane, this stuff. Um, but yeah, no, you're spot on. Um, well, uh, one other thing to throw in there too, Trey, is uh, have you ever heard, you know, since we kind of touched like 30 seconds on the Genesis 6 narrative, you're talking about the sons of Seth and all that too. Uh, 
Man, I'm, I'm finally waking up 44 minutes into the broadcast. So uh, welcome to Spiritual <laughs> Warfare Friday. I'm awake. Uh, but anyways, the uh, uh, RH, RH negative uh, blood type, I'm not anybody that's out there that's like that, uh, that has that blood. I'm not putting anybody down or trying to offend anybody in shape or form. Uh, the only reason why I come across is to look at the giant, ne- you know, the Nephilim, the Rothim narrative. But I have, yeah. I have seen that that is called literally like the golden blood. Like it takes a long time to be, I'm talking like 500, 500 years plus, it can actually start forming into particulates of gold. No joke. That's, I've heard that. That's interesting. It like um, uh, in the river, like in lakes and rivers, if, you, if you're buried close to it, I have heard, I've been looking into this on an archaeology standpoint. If, if it's true, if it's not, you know, if it's just a folklore, if it's just all just theory, I'm still keeping it on the shelf for a rainy day. You know, if, yeah. if it's a possibility, if the chemical compound throughout years of, you know, how the process, if you're going, you know, however it works in the elements and however the blood and everything works in, 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 uh, the great, you know, like your different types of materials in the ground and whatever, you know, rain, all these different, you know, if you got 500 plus years and that's what I have read and heard. So I just want to throw it in there. Mm-hmm. Get your yeah. take on it. Yeah. So uh, that, that's interesting. Um, and uh, I can't remember. I can't. It's been a while since I've looked at my blood type, but I believe my blood type feeds into RH negative. I'm so sorry, everybody. I um, know, uh, everybody in the chat, I was not trying to offend anybody. I just want to let everybody know that. So, yeah. I'm just, yeah. Well, here's, <laughs> here's what it comes down to is, you know, blood was spilt so that people could be redeemed. So whatever oh, type of blood type you have, just as long as you're in Christ Jesus, your blood type does not matter. So I wouldn't even Amen. focus on it. Um, well, I'm just saying for the standpoint yeah, of uh, no. like later on, years down the road, yeah, well, this is what the tie into the gold. And I thought that was so interesting. Yeah, oh, I, I do too. Yeah. yeah. Then to clarify, when I say don't even focus on it, I'm mm-hmm. saying, you know, focus on what Brian's saying, the cool facts of it. Don't start focusing on, oh my gosh, I have RH negative blood, yeah, uh, yada, yeah. yada. Don't go down that. That's the devil trying to attack you. Mm-hmm. It's all that is because the only blood you have that matters is the blood of Christ. Anything beyond that, just leave it alone. Um, uh, Jamie, I won't say your last name, but uh, just for that, I guess next week I got to do uh, Bermuda Triangle Part 2. Just because I I might step on your toes, forgive me. Continue on, Trey. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, you're good. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you know, and and look, nothing wrong with knowing where you came from, because it will, at least in my case, it reminds me and makes me thankful of where I am now. Mm. So, on my mom's side, both of my mom's sides of the family, um, one comes from like the Erickson Viking side, and the other comes from from what I can tell, a rich Ashkenazi Jew side. So, um, and you know what? Absolutely none of that matters because it's cool to know, like to see where the family went. Mm. But at the end of the day, what here's Wait. what matters. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, uh, there could be a great case made that both of those bloodlines could have potentially been Nephilim bloodlines. Um, because Erickson, I don't know if you guys know this, but that was uh, Leif, Eric, that, uh, Leif Erickson, like... Um, the real you know, explorer of America. Unlike, yeah, uh, the real, America. yeah, the real explorer. I've been trying to tell people that my whole life, um, but nobody would believe me. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, but, like, you know, that's uh, – and keep in mind, I haven't done blood tests, so I can't confirm this, but that's what I've been told my whole life is that we were descendants of him. So, uh, yeah, you could definitely argue that there are. And you know what? I still believe – today more so today than i did yesterday and the day before that i am a blood-bought believer and i am a follower of christ and mm-hmm. you know it's it's that blood every day well look at the that, blood documents that right have. like uh and the other side of the argument too right you have certain hebrew i'm not going to get into that but certain hebrew people who believe that just because they Bloodline Hebrew, the automatically guaranteed a spot in heaven. Automatically, it doesn't matter yeah. what they believe. Automatic because what their blood is. No, They're like your blood does not determine your soul. Your blood does not determine where you go. The blood of Jesus Christ does, and I have to uh, say that a lot because some people believe, oh, I'm royal bloodline. I heard them, uh, you know, the he- Hebrews people, oh, I'm blo- royal bloodline, and uh, you know, we're entitled to the kingdom of God. No, you're not entitled to nothing. <laughs> you're entitled to yeah. hell, literally. Yeah, all of us are. But yeah, um, <laughs> because of the oh. blood of Jesus Christ, we are, you know, uh, Amen. saved. You know, so through the blood of Jesus Christ, and yeah, I got Italian blood of me, American Indian blood, probably a little English and all that. None of that matters. My blood belongs is now because uh, we're born again, right? Now we get the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Absolutely. And for those of you who think your royal blood's going to get you somewhere, um, Solomon was of royal blood, and God still took the kingdom from him for oh, disobedience. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. um, and you could argue this was like, the Bible even says it, nobody would ever have the wisdom like Solomon did again. Now, we could sit here and debate all day whether or not Solomon repented. None of us will know that for sure till we get to the king, uh, the kingdom of heaven. What matters is, is the fact that because he disobeyed and he did not repent in that particular instance, the kingdom was ripped away from him. Like, you know, actions have consequences. Um, so if you think, if you're relying on your blood to get you through it, you know, what did, you know, the, the Pharisees said, we have Abraham as our father, right? And, mm -hmm. our, and what did, uh, that's what they told Jesus. But even before that, John the Baptist said, think ye not that, that, you know, uh, or what, well, I can't remember the exact way he said it, but he was basically like, look, don't rely on the fact that you're sons of Abraham because God could make sons of Abraham out of those stones. Yeah. Which, by the way, was an allusion to uh, Ezekiel, uh, not only with the dry bones coming back to life, but also where he says that he would cut away their hearts of stone. I think that was John uh, 5 and 6, right? Something like that. Uh, one of those chapters. Because I know yeah, it was, doing it was early on in one of the Gospels. I want to yeah. say it was like Matthew chapter 3. Hmm. Um, but yeah, that's what he says. He says, look, God can make sons of Abraham out of those stones. Because that's 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 the power of God. Like yeah. it doesn't matter where you came from. The fact of just what Paul says in Galatians chapter three is: if there is neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Greek. He doesn't say it in that exact order, but he says, um, you know, he says there is neither uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ, and if you are in Christ, you are a, uh, you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. And let that be a lesson to uh, people in uh, higher levels of Freemasonry because you start learning an awful lot about Solomon and his temple and everything else because that's what the entire lodge is made of as a resemblance yep. of the Solomon, uh, Temple of Solomon. So, yeah, and I know they you know, they start to revere King Solomon. They start to revere Hiram and Biff and all these characters uh, within Freemasonry. But you got to understand that this is not... <laughs> the biblical aspect we should be going down. You know what I mean? They, they glorify men who who went against God. Absolutely. Not well, only a, that, but why denigrate yourself to the the, the temple of Solomon when mm -hmm. you could have the heavenly temple of God? Absolutely. Like, you're shortchanging yourself here, and you think you're doing this great thing, and I'm telling you, the devil and his minions, they're just sitting back laughing at you. Mm -hmm. It's like the older brother... That, you know, and, and for any of you who have siblings and you're an older sibling, you know I'm telling the truth. You get your younger siblings to believe something because they're gullible, and then when it gets them in trouble, you sit back and laugh. And that is what that is what these fallen angels and all of the demonic realm does every time we shortchange ourselves because of what Paul said. What did Paul say? He said, I fear that you have become corrupt by the simplicity that is Christ. Absolutely. People want to overcomplicate everything, but this is the thing. Yep. First Corinthians 15, Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, and now we can have new life in Christ. Absolutely. That's it. That's yeah, it. Amen. And as long as you're obeying him, Jesus said in John chapter 8, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, if a man keep my saying, he shall not see death. So as long as you are believe, you 100% believe in the the power of the finished work of the cross, and you are doing everything you can in obedience, seeking after God to follow his ways and letting the Holy Spirit work on you as you do it, you're good to go. It's that simple. You don't need all this secret esoteric stuff. It might make you feel good for a while, but I'm telling you, fire is hot, hmm. and hellfire is hotter than any fire that's ever existed. Yeah, it has yeah, to be. Man. That's the only reason something could burn forever. And you're playing with hellfire, being in the craft like that, because, and we even get to the seat, the oaths you take, you know what I mean? And the Bible talks about, actually, let me bring that slide up too, because, hang on a second. Um, real quick, Dan, while you're yeah. finding that. Um, oh, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to tell you real quick. Uh, on my end, too, I have like a lot of uh, history with uh, Cambridge College. Uh, I have a lot of uh, uh, bloodlines and everything that's mm. that came up out of that area. Uh, I have a descendant. Or, I mean, excuse me, an ancestor that uh, uh, was one of the Declaration of the Independence signed on the back. And, uh, yeah, and I have a lot of Cherokee, Indian, all this other stuff. There's all kinds of, I mean, we could go down a big rabbit hole, and that does not define me. 
I mean, uh, I used to have a guy, the old coworker used to say, man, you look like you're from Spain, man. You got some Spaniard in you, you know? And I'm like, yeah, man, maybe I am. Maybe I do. But uh, either Spaniola. way, I was. Oh, the Spanish. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Ever, ever. Any way you look at it, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. Um, God moved all your ancestors. Uh, it doesn't, you know. You think about if they was doing pagan religion or they was worshiping idols or whatever. He moved each and end of each individual so that you could be born in this day mm. and this time. And I just think it's so miraculous that His hand. Even though the sins of our fathers, our grandfathers, our great, you know, you know, the ancestors of old, he moved them to all that through all the hardship, blood, whatever it is. And here we are gathering together on Spiritual Warfare Friday and we're shouting to the rooftops, Jesus Christ. And I think that's just so miraculous how God, the father can literally move his hand and take individuals, mm. you know, different and, you know, the fruitful and multiply and they just you know, you have all your offspring and it's just a, it's a beautiful thing, his creation. So I just want to throw it in there. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dan. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, man. No, I'm glad you, let you guys continue, but um, just want to bring up a fact too, uh, that Freemasons, I mean, anybody that knows anything about Freemasons, they, every degree requires an oath they take. Now, most of it's life-threatening oaths that are if you reveal secrets, whatever the case, regardless of what the oath is, right? doesn't stop a Freemasonry, too. You ever notice this? Because I remember you take an oath on the Constitution, you take oath, this and that, you know, even though it's a Constitution, whatever, you take an oath, right? And uh, when you go to court, right, they put the Bible uh, there, right? And say, well, put your hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, not the truth, but the so help me God. That's an oath, right? And I yeah. stopped doing it. I stopped taking oaths and even on the Constitution, right? And and I stopped taking oaths on the Bible. I stopped taking oaths in the courts. I said, no, it's against what Jesus says. And people said, well, what are you talking about? And I'm not disrespecting the Constitution, nothing like that, or uh, the Bible. That's not what I'm doing. What that's doing, with their, and what people don't understand, when you take Solomon oaths, right? Solomon oaths, you're disrespecting Jesus. And I'd rather disrespect people than disrespect Jesus because this is what Jesus says. Now, regardless of your Freemasonry, any oath you take in anything at all, even the military, right? Uh, this says Matthew 5, 33 and 37 says, Again, this is Jesus saying, You have heard that it had been said by the old time, right? Referring to the Old Testament. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thy, uh, but thy uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, but shall perform unto thine Lord oaths, right? Don't take any oaths, he's saying, right? But I say unto you, swear not at all. Don't swear at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. In other words, people say you swear to God to tell the truth. No, you don't swear by the throne. Nor by earth, you don't swear about nothing on earth, right? And nor it is footstool. Neither it's Jeru uh, by Jerusalem or for the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head. In other words, don't give light, um, death, you know, or we call that um, death oaths. You know what I mean? Like if you reveal secrets, you could be killed. You know what I mean? Don't swear in your life. That's what it's saying, right? Because you can't make one hair white or black, but let your communications be simple like this, right? Your yes is yes, and your no is no, plain and simple. For whatever more is this is coming of evil, and uh, the translations say it's the devil. Anything yep. more than yes or no is simply from the devil. So don't take no oaths in court. Don't take no oaths on the Constitution. I, you know, I'm not disrespecting these things, but don't take any oaths at all. Don't take, especially in Freemasonry, everything's required an oath. Every degree you go up, and most of it's on your life. You don't do that, okay? Even if you say, well, take, take an oath on God right now. It's like, no. <laughs> that yep. Jesus says, don't do this. Plain and simple. Not of heaven and earth. And, to say, and what this reminds me, too, is what Christians break every day, is the, uh, the second commandment. And it's idol tree. This is a form of idol tree. Because here's the thing, right? Uh, it says, do not make any graven images, anything like that, of heaven. You know, and you got people... They, you know, see these um, statues of Jesus on a cross or something like that, angelic. They buy these statues and they go, oh, make amen. You see them clicking the post, right? And they're liking it, right? And same thing in the Freemasonic free Lodges. They have statues and images of these biblical people, right? Same thing. And this is um, basically a portion of the second uh, commandment. You know what I mean? You don't take oaths. You're plain and simple. That's another form of idol tree, I believe, but regardless. You know, you don't take oaths at all. Plain and simple. Doesn't matter what it is for what it is. You know when like um you know you get somebody thinks you're lying like when you're a kid and you say well say swear to God if uh, you're telling the truth right you don't do that you, yep. you don't swear to God that's what this says you don't do that 
Your yes is yes and no is no. That's it. If they don't believe you, oh well, who cares? And that's why I told the people don't call. I don't take that. I'm uh, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I told them right now, I don't take oaths on the Bible. My yes will be yes and my no will be no. Anything else is of the devil. They should see the looks on their face. They're like, yeah, all right, whatever. Like, <laughs> they have to honor that too, by the way. So um, I just want to point that out, especially people in Freemasonry, especially when you first get in, you, right away you take an oath on the first degree. It's an the apprentice, then um, the fellowship degree, then the third degree is the master mason. That's a blue lodge, right? When Trey was talking about earlier, I just yep. want to go a little explaining this, right? Now the blue lodge, right, is pre, pre you know, they have a Bible on the altar, make it look so Christian, right? But <laughs> it, that's where it stops. When you get into the Red Lodge, right, you go to the right path or the left path, that's the York right or the Scottish right, right, you'll never, ever hear anything about Jesus Christ ever again. Nothing. And in fact, you're frowned upon for even talking about Jesus. Don't believe me? Go into the lodges. Mm -hmm. Actually, don't do that at all. But um, this is where it goes, you know what I mean? So what they do is they take you from most of these people to the Christians, right? And they'll take you from a God-fearing Christian, right, then they'll morph you into more of a um, new age type, like you're your own God. Then when they get you yep. there, now they broke you down because their goal is to break you down and form you into a perfect cornerstone, right? And you're a block to them. They're going to form you into a perfect cornerstone to do that. And yes, yeah, a cornerstone like that. <laughs> and uh, to do that, right, they're going to break you, strip you of your individual sovereign right? I mean, your individuality, your philosophical belief, right? Make you feel like your own God. Then when they got you there, then they start carving you to realize, oh, yeah, we worship in Lucifer. And don't yep. believe me, guys. That's right in your own manuals. Me and Trey got tons and tons of slides and all the stuff to prove to you. And, you. and here's the thing, too. Don't take our word for it. I want you to go into your Masonic Lodge. Every Masonic Lodge has a library. These books are right in your own lodge. And you open them up for yourselves and you're like, What? What the hell am I doing here? I'm a Christian. I have no business being here. Yep. And um, David Carrico, if you go to FOJCRadio.com, he exposes Freemasonry like nobody's business. Right? I, me yeah. and Trey both learned so much from him. And, um, you know, there's, there's so many others out there who do this stuff and uh, that were Freemasons. David wasn't. But, I mean, the people are out there exposing this because they're like, wait a minute, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. You know, and so this is very important that we need to understand what this means. You don't take oaths, first of all. That alone, right, this this alone, okay? Anybody that says to be a Christian right now that's a Freemason, read this alone, Matthew chapter 5, 33 and 37, right? Read that. And tell me what you're doing is what? You can't serve two masters, right? Yeah, you don't. Serve, you can't serve mammon and God at the same time, which is very relevant to the 33rd degree. We're going to get to that much later. But yeah, uh, you can't serve two masters. So you take an oath on your life, and especially any kind of solemn oath, yeah, that's a violation of Jesus' own words and part of the uh, second commandment as well. Well, here, here's a good, here's just a good, just me listening to what you're saying, Dan. I'm agreeing with you 100%. And then people out there that are uh, partaking into this, these organizations, here's something to think about. If, um, if it's worth putting all your treasures here on earth, and not laying up your treasures in heaven, hmm. like not just, you know, basically giving over your soul for a little coin. I think it's very scary. Um, I, I, there's just, it, it just, it, it can't work. And a lot of people, you know, and I think about this too on a, on a dumber scale, just the way I think, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a, I didn't mean to call myself that, but I mean, if you, if you look at it like this, if you have, just for example, if you have an old, you know, very things that are put in front of you, vanity is very tempting. You know, if it looks if it looks shiny, looks all sparkly, and it's got a big price tag on it, and you get very tempted to uh, be pulled to go into debt or credit card debt or take out whatever you have to do to get the shiny thing, but you have something in the driveway. I'm just I'm using an analogy. I'm using the scenario here with an automobile, but you have something that's paid off. And it's not shiny, but it still gets you back and forth from A to B. Uh, it's the kind of what we're, that's kind of what, what Dan's saying. Like, I, I think about this on just a, in layman's terms, like Jesus is the way, the truth and the light. It's, it's, it's narrow path, mm -hmm. but it's freely, we're talking about salvation and we're talking about Christ when he laid his life upon the cross. It's a free, it's free gift. It's a gift. And we're, 
you know, with this, these organizations, these, this Mason narrative, I think it's very scary when they put all this stuff in front of you and they dangle the carrot in front of you and then they get you to slowly submit. And then before you know it, you're involved in it. Like you're, you're signing up for it. And then it leads to a destructive path. And, you know, and I'm a lot of people don't understand that and what, what Trey's bringing up and what Dan's bringing up, they don't understand it. They get bamboozled into the van, into the shiny things. And then before you know it, you're thinking you're doing a good service, but then before you know it, you're worshiping like tonight's broadcast, you know, other gods and Mason there are literally, you're literally worshiping other gods and it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Mm. And it's very scary. That's just the way I see it. I know that probably sounds a little, yeah, I hope that made sense. What I mean, what I'm getting, hope y'all get the point. Um, yeah. Be content with what you got. Don't, don't try to go out and go above your means and, you know, and try to conquer the world with the world. Mm. Do it. You know, that doesn't, you know what I mean? If you want to sit up on a high mountain and have all your gold and silver, What's it going to matter when your soul's damned? I hate to mm -hmm. use that on here, but what, what's going to happen, right? And I think that's, uh, that's I think that's, some, I think that's something we all need to look into. Yeah. And now, you know, either either way you look at it, red book, red red book, blue book, hot cold water, red wire, blue wire. Uh, you know, we could go down the matrix uh, <laughs> scenario on that, but everything is, you know, this whole red and blue narrative. Um, yeah, I get it. And that's why we was talking earlier, Trey, with Atlantean. I think a lot of this stuff, those red and blue books that we're referring to, especially with on this broadcast with the Masons, I think that mm -hmm. all comes to the uh, mystery schools of Babylon. I mean, it goes way back. It even goes past. We're talking about and Deluvian, in my opinion. In my opinion, it goes probably back to the Samaritan. There's way, I mean, it's just probably further. Uh, you know, Samaritan text is all, you know, technically, you know, when you look into all that stuff, they can get very controversial. But I think it all goes back to I've even seen Retilian. I've seen Retilian narratives uh, that doesn't even have the little G, but it has the compass. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I, even into the astronaut theory, I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole, but I kind of wanted to bring all that up. I hope that I hope that scenario, what I was bringing up here, I hope you all understand what mm -hmm. I'm trying to articulate for you all in the broadcast, because being content, the Bible talks about being content and uh, just don't don't fall for the the witchcraft. Let's just say, how about that? Because that's basically well, what it all is. So, yeah. I, I agree with you. And isn't it funny that one of the first, quote, astronauts to land on the moon was also a Freemason? Yeah. I mean, this stuff does. And look, they they admit it. I mean, you heard it earlier. They talked about the sons of Cain, right? Being the, um, you know, what, what was it it said? It said the statecraft employed by the sons of Cain. See, what people don't realize is that uh, the, 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 esoteric inner circle of freemasonry absolutely traces this back to cain and enoch um and gary wayne once again does a great job of that but look when we get into this i got a quote here this is from the meaning of masonry by wl wilmhurst uh, wilmshurst he says in a word hiram abiff is the christ principle eminent in every soul crucified, dead and buried, and all who are not alive to its presence, but resident in all as a saving force. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Sounds pretty good, right? And everybody will say, well, see, the Hiram Abiff is just a symbol of Christ. Oh, how sweet. Here's the problem. Let's read this. This is from the Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly P. Hall. The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. By the way, that was uh, that quote I read earlier about the universal temple and the master Mason was also Manly P. Hall. Um, he realizes his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the names mean little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing his truer understanding, the oneness of all spiritual truth. So these guys don't believe when they talk about the Christ principle, they're talking about this, this universal Christ, this Christ consciousness. Like this, this is where this stuff comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's, well, I have, uh, let me get fired up here real quick and throw it out. I know you, <laughs> you two know a little bit more about this, <laughs> but when you get into the DMT, let me just get this, this hits a nerve for me. When you get into the DMT stuff and the ayahuasca stuff, and they communicate with evil, like, like it, it's crazy. These guys are saying we're having this knowledge, like this veil through this, 
it's almost like the plane of existence. They'll talk all this crazy stuff like they're astral projecting and they'll say that they're getting information from these great kings and all these different things, guys. It's insane. And this this is this is in a, a masonry. I've, I've heard and read literature and, and even there's another uh, another uh, organization we could talk about, but that doesn't fit the uh, well, it does. But I'm not going to get in there. But there's another one that talks about this stuff, too. And they were talking about worshiping um deities and, and stuff that's ancient and it was so if you cross reference it it almost there's a lot of uh, similarities into uh what the indians was writing down and, and on tablets and higher whatever you know and, and and carving into caves and the imagery looks very similar to what it was back in uh, atlantis or back into samaritans so it's yeah. so if they're if they're taking and ingesting and getting on this D, DMT LSD and they're able to communicate with beings, that's what we're is that what we're talking? I mean, literally, is that in the masonry uh, code here? I mean, they do do stuff like that, right, Dan? Mm, yeah. Uh, do they try? I mean, and they're 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 getting information, they're exchanging information. Am I, am I correct on that, or am I wrong? Uh, so it really depends on you know what right you go through so like when it comes to uh hallucinogens and hard drug use the biggest advocate for that was alistair crowley who was a part of the right of memphis and a few other extremely egyptian sounding um rights he was like the 96th degree of the right of memphis or something like that and he was absolutely um really big into hallucinogenic drugs he was addicted to things like heroin Um, He encouraged people to use marijuana in their rituals. Um, So I would say, yes, as far as some of the other ones, um, I haven't seen them write about it, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, Well, I'm not not, not, not saying I'm talking about on different, like I'm not talking about the lower degrees. I'm talking about on the higher levels. Right. And I'm thinking about the shamanism. When you look into shamanism, it's all and just the witchcraft and looking to witchcraft and their uh when they uh, uh uh initiate the initiations of masons and the initiations of witchcraft and warlocks if you cross reference them they're very yeah. similar they're dead so, on similar so it's yeah and you look into shamanism which we're talking about a little bit but we haven't met, mentioned the word shamanism we're talking about uh you know uh telepathic we talk about the uh, cerebro and stuff like that and shamanism we're talking about clairvoyance I mean, we can go some down some deep rabbit holes but what i'm getting at i think it's all there's names just like thoth was changing his name hermes whatever you know all these different names nimrod gilgamesh i think they do the same thing with their their so-called goal their mission they just change it throughout time and it's identified as a different word but it still sets the same goal like it's still the the end game they're still headed for the same track if that makes any yeah. sense well I mean, yeah it, and, it, and it makes people confused people are like yeah they well we can't understand what that is but you know i mean they're 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 cognitive distance they oh yeah that doesn't mean this what do you mean brian you're not spelling that correct you're not saying it correctly so it it goes all over the place right but then it leads to mm-hmm. the main origin but the origin has yeah. been split off into a tree of all just oblivion. It could go on down all kinds of rabbit holes, but it all leads to one path. And that's the broadened path, right? Broadens. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. Let's do, let's look at it this way. So if, if you're familiar with how Kabbalah works, there's the Sephiroth tree, right? Mm-hmm. And the Sephiroth tree has 10 different symbols on it or 10 different degrees, if you will. And what they call this is that this is the tree of life is this re- literally what they call it. They call it the tree of life. Um, the problem is, is you can find a a version of that with a serpent intertwined in it, and they believe this serpent is the spirit of wisdom, right? So it's it, it baffles me how they can believe this because they sit there and they have this text right in front of them in their own Tanakh that says that the serpent came to them and got them to eat of the tree of knowledge, right? So, um, but you know, the point I'm trying to make with this is that this one tree has ten different branches that split off of it so it i think you're absolutely right and you know even i haven't read this book too much yet but i've noticed some of the some some of the things you're talking about this is called um earth medicine a shamanic way to self-discovery and this is literally they have brought shamanism into the new age i literally got this book in a box from my local library. Uh, once a year they do clean outs. And I walk, kid you not, I walked away with four boxes of books and a TV for $4. Huh. And this was in one of the boxes. Show the book so, again. Um, I'm sorry I had the screen off. Uh, that's all right. It is Earth Medicine, A Shamanic Way to Self-Discovery. 
Um, and this is literally all about how you can use shamanism as your branch of new age. So um, it, I've only read bits and pieces because shamanism really freaks me out. Like that, I think when you get into like dark black magic kind of stuff, shamanism is about as black as you can go. It's like voodoo almost. Yeah. Yeah, well, voodoo would I would argue is a is a version of shamanism. Yeah. Because when you get into shamanism, you can find shamanism in the Native Americans. You can find it in the old tribal, uh, the tribal customs of like you know Siberia. Um, you can find shamanism just about anywhere because all a shaman is is literally, um, it, it's it's similar to a witch doctor. Like a witch doctor is a form of shamanism. I think my light just died. Give me just a second. Um. <laughs> But it's a form of shamanism, uh, you know, where basically there's this one entity that speaks to the uh, this this spiritual being. Right. And it'll let the mm. spiritual being take over it. And that is basically what whatever village or tribe or whatever it is, it's this is their their person that communicates with the gods, if you will. So, um, you know, you can find it almost anywhere. And it's a really freaky religion to me. Like, um, it's just, I mean, it's scary watching these people get possessed. Um, I heard a wild, a really wild tale. I don't know if this is true or not. Shamanism, no joke. I heard that the first origins of that, I, I don't know if this is true or not. I remember hearing it. <laughs> it's going to sound really bad, but if the, the so called gentleman or whatever uh, at that moment of time was, in a cave system in Israel, under Israel, in the cave system. No joke. It was, I, I don't remember much about it. I just wanted to ch chime in there and how ironic that it all, you know, there's some type of Israel connection to that. Take it for what it's worth. I don't know if that is legitly true or not, but I just want to throw that in there since we've been talking about shamans. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Shamans. Woo. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's interesting. Um, for sure. Like under, uh, literally, literally underground. He came out of underground. And this is what I'm saying. You said something earlier, uh, Trey, about seven. What did you say? The seven root races? Yeah, the seven root say? races of theosophy. You know, the Atlanteans, the Lemurians, yeah, uh, the Aryans, yeah, 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 things yeah. like that. Well, in an interesting, uh, I think it's seven tribes of Indians that come out of the center of the earth that uh, uh, when you look into the Aztecian culture, isn't it kind of interesting that that all, there's uh, once again, once again, here we are talking about uh Inner, you know, inner earth, whatever. Well, that's what it all you know, goes down just, to, even Freemasonry. That's what it's all about. Uh, the ancient knowledge and everything else they're trying to, well, they think they know 100%, whatever. But yeah, they, they do know a lot of ancient knowledge, of course, but they withhold it from the public. But man, it, uh, you know, that's where, you know, it's all connected. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I think, like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think it all has just been manipulated and twisted throughout time. And there's all like, they just like, for example, you know, they used to have milk glass bottles, right? Now, now they have milk jugs, you know. So it's like the, you know, what I'm saying like, you, what do you mean you got glass bottles, right? It was too dangerous. It's the same. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make everybody. I know it sounds, uh, what's the word, uh, ignorant, but how I'm bring that up. But there's, there, there's something to that. To me, that's how I see things. And then when you start putting in and in, in compiling the info together, they you can cross your T's and, you know, A through Z, you know, it looks, there's very highly compelling information that you can cross reference and they almost look like the same story in some cases, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of strange to me, but anyways, well, yeah, I'll just was saying too about shamans too, uh, because he's a cult researcher himself too. And, uh, he says shamans worship nature and nature spirits, like elemental spirits. And they make mm -hmm. deals with, uh, these spirits. And we, we did shows on this, uh, actually uncle obvious was on, one of the shows we did uh, on elemental spirits, and we also had David on from one of them too. But um, and it's all connected. We, you know, all this stuff we talk about, guys. Because if you tune in, it's like, oh, I thought this was about Freemasonry. This is all about Freemasonry. All of it. We could go literally for ten hours, and then not even touch the 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 first level of Freemasonry. That's how in depth this stuff is. You remember these people got thousands of years since the days of Babylon, right? Thousands of years of esoteric knowledge under the belt. So we couldn't even cover this with a 10-foot pole uh, in, in, in the massive size of it in a reasonable amount of time. So if you think, all right, this sounds like way off the, the rocker or, no, you know, off the path, it's not. And what Brian's bringing up, too, is because what he's listening, 
Uh, he's not too knowledgeable with the Freemasonry, but he's listening to me and Trey. He's like, he's making connections because when it comes to ancient knowledge and all that, Brian is like one of the best, uh, if not the best when it comes to mounds and um, all the historical stuff like that. So he's making these connections because it is all connected. That's what it's all about. Freemasonry is about the ancient knowledge. And Brian's already got a lot of that yep. ancient knowledge. So he already has a step above them. You know what I mean? But he knows the true part of that through the bible whatever the case but you know so you, as you can see all the stuff is all connected with freemasonry yep if that makes sense to everybody <laughs> i hope i explained yeah, well, that right and that's that's why things like atlantis always come up in freemasonry because freemasons uh have their philosophy is really based on a form of neoplatonism mm -hmm. and you know plato was one of the people who made atlantis famous to the exoteric world um but you'll also see things in there when you start dealing with it. When the reason it connects to the elemental and nature spirits is because so that's the you know, when you look at alchemy, you have the the elements, right? Earth, water, wind and fire. Well, those are those are the elemental nature spirits, right? So it absolutely all feeds in together. And really, this is where when you look at and you want to you want to apply this to the modern day, when you look at Francis and the way he's meeting with these imams and they're having this Chrislam center, why can why can a Jesuit and a bunch of Muslims get along, even though their religions on paper should be clashing with each other? Because alchemy and Rosicrucianism, which is absolutely tied in with the Jesuits, believe the same thing. They both had alchemy. That's what Rosicrucianism is. It is a form of Christianized alchemy. When you get into the Golden Dawn and, you know, mm -hmm. the Alpha and Omega school of, you know, I, I guess it would be witchcraft. I don't think that's what they call themselves. Mm -hmm. But that's the American version of the Golden Dawn, by the way. Um as I told Dan this before, I actually um, subscribed to their YouTube channel. Uh, really weird stuff they do. Um, but when you get into this, that's what they believe. They believe they are just, you know, basically Christians who are in the deeper searches of these lost sciences that Jesus was a part of. Um, well, mm. the other famous form of alchemy was Islamic alchemy. So therefore, and that I believe evolved into Sufi mysticism, which is what uh, if you're an uh, Islamic mystic now you would do Sufism or Sufi, mm -hmm. um, and you know the, these all tie in together. Why can the Jews get along with the Catholics, even though the Cat? Because by the way, the Chrislam Center will have a synagogue in it too. Why can they go in it, even though the Catholic Church was who? You know, murdered the Jewish people. The Ashkenazi Jewish people were absolutely murdered by the Catholic Church during the Inquisition. Why can they do it? Because uh, Kabbalism feeds into this elemental stuff as well. It's all just one giant mystery religion, and it doesn't matter where it's at, what part of the world, how remote, whether they're the biggest technological advanced society like Atlantis, or if they're, you know, completely uh, primal cannibals that folk do this shamanism it, it's all the same religion it doesn't matter which way you slice it it's still the same loaf of bread you know so i'm hearing you i'm hearing you trey and dan thank you earlier for saying kind words man um no problem, man. Hey. yeah um but now you know my sight has been taken i'm not 100 percent like it used to be hit my head but uh i critically think and uh might have all this a little bit of ancient knowledge rattling off in my head man but mm. You know, could you imagine just unorthodox thinking, you know, crack it down in bulldog on the milk truck, just plow to a mound, don't use nothing else, no detonation, just bam, you know, and then there you go, instant ancient knowledge. <laughs> but <laughs> and artifacts. But yeah, I just want to just goof off there and kind of chime in. If you haven't subscribed to Dan Badoni show, please hit that like button, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed to old Trey Boy here. At course correction please help the the guy out man he's killing himself out there working all the time and he's giving out good content god bless you trey subscribe and if you want to subscribe to visual disturbance uh, it's just me it's just the broken down milkman hit that subscribe yeah. button if y'all don't uh, subscribe to the milkman i will personally come and smash your mailbox <laughs> we don't condone violence or any kind of thing to do with uh, your Except lovely mailbox mailboxes. yeah <laughs> I, did i say smash i mean i would redecorate it yeah. i'm sorry Wrong Listen, word. <laughs> I had a buddy of mine one time hit a telephone pole in his milk truck, and it, 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 he was going about oh, 60 no. miles an hour, and it came off the ground. He, <laughs> he was dodging some old lady in a BMW, and the 
and he hit the top of it and it grabbed him and it yanked the whole front of the frame up and he came off the ground and um it wasn't good the telephone pole stayed in the ground but uh let's just say that was a bad day but anyways <laughs> let's stay on topic <laughs> but uh, there's my little bit little chiming in there yeah get everybody <laughs> Oh, good, God good. bless you too. Yeah, it's been. A, I'm. I'm enjoying the broadcast. I'm. Thank you, Trey. Again, I know you've been going through some infirmities and stuff like that. It's all kinds yeah. of plagues or whatever it is going on over in North Carolina. No, that's so, exactly uh, what it is. It feels <laughs> like I'm under a plague right now, man. It's so crazy. Yeah. So just yeah, just pray for all of us. Yeah, me and Dan's gonna be getting together, coming down there and harassing Trey in North Carolina, and we'll be down there in Tennessee. <laughs> Everything's gonna be good. And uh, yeah. Oh, we got a good great. week planned out, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, like, um, the, the Freemasonry goes so far in depth. And we, you know, there's so many rights to Freemasonry. They have, uh, just for the black folks out there, it's called uh, Prince Hall. They have one, two of them for the women, I believe, right? It's the Eastern Star and Job's Daughters. I think that's yep. for the little girls. Little boys is for uh, uh, the D. Malay. The D. Malay Society. Isn't that kind of weird? Because um, I heard, like, D. Malay was into... We, uh, freaky stuff with children. So is that kind yeah, of ironic I've, they would name that boys? I, yeah. I've heard that too. Um, and I think it's even weirder that Walt Disney was in the Demolay Society. Mm. And, look what and Disney now he has, today. now there's this famous Club 33 in Disneyland and Disney World. So, huh. uh, a coincidence? I think not. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if you guys have ever looked into it. This is a tangent, but just to show you how much of a Ponzi scheme is involved with this stuff, too. You know, it's like almost half a million dollars a year to be a member of Club 33 at Disney World. Wow. It's like 300 and some odd thousand dollars last time I checked. It was absolutely ridiculous. I have no idea why I went and searched that out, but I guess I was bored one day and I found that out. So, um, you know, I mean, who's worse, Scientology, Joel Osteen, or Club 33? You decide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's some crazy stuff. And yeah, religious <laughs> leaders too. Uh, a lot of them are Masons themselves. And you see, see, um, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland yeah. is a Mason, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah and that Pat Robinson, right? Let me see if I get that cover up because I want to show you guys something. And this is right in your face. It's still, hang on, see. Pat Robinson, um, cover of time. Pat Robinson. He's on the cover of top, um, hang on. Time Magazine, let me see, right here, let me get this here, so I want to like ask you folks out there, right, who does that when you pose for a picture, who who does that, who puts a hand in the, in the, um, the shape of a paw over the left heart, you know what that is guys, and um, you gotta, when once you open your eyes to this stuff, you gotta see it everywhere, right, when you, uh, so this is Pat Robinson, right? So-called Christian, you know, all the, you know, the big mega church he's got, whatever the case, right? This here, guys, when you, when Masons pose, right? Why do you think Prince uh, Edward, whatever his name is, uh, him and Megan, right? When he's out in public, he puts his hand in his jacket purposely or like this. That's, um, this is a lion's paw degree. I forgot what degree it is. But in the lion's paw degree, right, when they pose, right, they put their hand as a paw over the heart because in the, the blood ritual, right, when you become, I forgot what degree it is again, they rip your heart, literally rip your chest open, take your heart out and feed it to a wild beast. That's the lion's paw degree. That's what he's displaying, right? And, uh, That's and like the Temple of Doom kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> well, yep. you know, uh, but yeah, and you, when you see portraits everywhere, guys, like you see portraits of famous politicians, whatever, you gotta see this, right? The hand, them yep. sitting there posing for the painting or picture. And now, the hand in the coat. I, I have to say this because I am by no means a fan of Pat Robertson mm-hmm. at all. Um, you know, I think the 700 Club is, is if at best, lacks serious discernment. They were yeah. the biggest ones behind the push that this Asbury revival was a move of God, even though at the National Day of Prayer, they brought in Rick Warren. Um, oh, you know, one of the biggest, like, uh, you know, he's probably the biggest butt kisser of the Pope in the world besides Kenneth Copeland. Um, but also at the same time, um, I just have to say, now this could Prince be Harry. something, but you can't take the picture necessarily at face value because they said the same thing about Spurgeon and Spurgeon was very spoke very openly against, um, you know, Freemasonry. And they always got him with the hand in the jacket thing. Now I agree. The the picture has just come across my screen. So I agree. It does look like that, but at the same time, 
it, you know, it's not always the person. Sometimes it's the photographer saying, all right, now do this. Oh, yeah, that's because true. the photographer yeah. might be a Mason. Um, you know, they get a lot of people like that. I think that's why you see so much uh, occultic uh, iconography on Christian music, which Christian music is by no means, you know, a, a godly business. Um, but, you know, it's just... I always like to tell people, you know, exercise caution. And, you know, this has been my kick lately. A lot of people are mad at me um, or, you know, confused right now because that's my big kick is, you know, I've been encouraging people like let's really like let's let's not come to any conclusions until we know for sure. But, you know, and, you know, that just long story short, you know, always use your discernment, but never run with it till you know for sure. I just. I don't know why I felt like I needed to say that, but I, I take that for whatever it's worth. Mm. So, yeah, man. So, <laughs> and now uh, this book here, I highly recommend people to get. I got it. It's a big, big textbook, and I think Trey's got it too. Uh, it's by Tex Mars, the late Tex Mars, uh, Codex Magica. Now, regards to the title, it's full of biblical scripture. What he does is he exposes symbolism and exposes a heck of a lot of Freemasonry hand gestures and tokens and all that. That uh, thing is loaded, okay? When you actually read this book, you you got to drive down the road, right? You know, you go drive by a strip mall, you drive by all your life, right? Read this book, and when you drive down the road again, you got to see it for the first time ever in your life. Like, stuff you drove by f for years. You see and you know what it is. And when you drive by, you got to see it for a whole new different perspective because you have no idea the symbolism that's literally embedded within corporate signs. And, and like, the, you know, what you, uh, Trey was saying, too, uh, could Pat Robinson be a Mason, or could the photographer had him done that? So we got to give him the benefit of the doubt, absolutely. And uh, so we don't know. But regardless, that's what they do. And I did a video not too long ago on Monster Energy and Red Bull and all that. And I said, yep. just does mean you know people work for the company, or if you drink it, doesn't mean you're evil. But it's the corporate yep. advertisers who purposely put their occult symbolism because this is heavily when it comes to symbolism. Masonry uses symbolism like nobody's business, right? They have, um, you just say one symbol like you all see an eye, right? There's tons of different meanings and the, the exoteric meanings for the symbol, right? But there's maybe one or two real esoteric meanings, right? But you'll never learn that until you get to where they want you to believe. And um, Manly P. Hall said too, it's intentional that they lie to you. Throughout the degrees. You're lied to every step of the way. So if you're a Mason out there, you're third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, third, uh, probably 29th degree, right? You are lied to. And as you see, if you're a 29th degree, you, if you look back, hmm, yeah, I was lied to about the all I when I was in Blue Lodge. A little different meaning in the Red Lodge, and I started going up, depends if you go to the York or Scottish, right, or Scottish, right? Yeah, it's a little bit different. Then you're going to end up learning, yeah, it goes from the Eye of Providence to... Um, the all-seeing eye, which is uh, the, the third eye, I'm sorry, to make you believe you're God. Then it's eye of Horus or Osiris. Then you end up learning out is the eye of Lucifer with the thousand points of illumination. That's what George Bush's famous speech he did. Talk about the thousand points of illumination during the Gulf War. Yeah, ancient. He said the, the vision of our founders. He wasn't talking about the founding. Uh, they was talking about the founders. I'm talking about the vision of their founders with the thousand points of illumination. This is... Illuminism, guys, and uh, people had no clue what the hell he was talking about. He was talking about an angel in a whirlwind. Yeah, this is Kabbalah stuff, man. And that's why George Bush signed, um, what was that, uh, Executive Order 33, I think it was, to honor Freemasons. He had a bunch of the top level Freemasons in his office. And yeah, it he, he wasn't, you know, out of nowhere, he was talking about the angel in a whirlwind, and it's certainly not an angel of God. And also, which is, uh, they, they believe is the, the evil Enoch, whatever the case. Uh, and yeah. This is all in within our country's political system. It's sickening, it really is. Yeah. I, I have think something that, to say about that. Sorry, Trey. No, Go you're ahead. fine. Uh, I was just going to say, I think that uh, I could be wrong about this, hmm. but I think I want to say I remember seeing somewhere where that angel that rides in the whirlwind, isn't that like Metatron or something? Oh, Metatron. That's right. Meta, not Megatron. Which, and which, which, Metatron. which is which is Enoch, by the yeah. way. Uh, if you read the secret, uh, what is it? I've got it right here. I've got Elizabeth Clare Prophet's uh, Forbidden Mysteries of Enoch, which has first and second Enoch. And uh, second Enoch reveals that Metatron is, in fact, they believe Enoch. And it wouldn't be the good evil Enoch. It would be the evil there Enoch. There it is right so. there on the screen, the, the Kabbalistic version of Enoch, the angel in the whirlwind. I have a theory. Metatron. Uh, 
I have a theory on that. Um, every time y'all just mention one word, it just triggers something. Uh, I love how this broadcast has been going because God bless you both. Because both of y'all have like a pr- uh, truck ton of data rattling off in y'all's brains. And like, as soon as you said Angel and Whirlwind, I, no joke, I hate to keep bringing this up. Bermuda Triangle part two that I'm getting, that I've been, it's been in the making for almost like 10 months or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I know I'm, yeah, it's really bad. But anyways, there's people in the chat that have been patiently waiting, but no joke, seriously, uh, Trey, the Angel of the Whirlwind and stuff, I have looked into this and I'm just going to kind of give everybody a spoiler to that broadcast I'm going to do. I have looked and it literally is, there's something in the ocean. I know this is going to yeah. sound crazy. Like, well, and it's, a, it's, it goes along with the Bermuda Triangle. I just want to throw it out there. Uh, just, just a little yeah, connect. Yeah. yeah. Just a little so, connect. Um, there's literally something there's literally just, something in the ocean. It's either the, the connection with the Bermuda Triangle crystal pyramids that's under the water or something hmm. weird that they're able to can harness and it's to do with time and, and the elements and the stochion, all these things in one big old package and they're able to harness this thing. So anyways, go ahead. Go uh, ahead and they, well, no, yeah. that, that fits in, that fits into like kind of the whole uh, legend of Shibalba, mm-hmm. how you would cross over from the world, uh, from this world to the next. And I think it is, is that the Aztec, isn't that what Shibalba is that Mayan? I can't remember. Um, but Shibalba is basically how you, you know, you pass from one world to the next. Mm-hmm. And it is often depicted in popular media anyway as a maelstrom or this whirlwind in the water. Uh, you look on ancient maps and you'll see like over in the unknown edges where, you know, it says uh, unknown uh, there. Uh, uh, here be monsters or whatever. Um, you, you know, you see all this on all these old maps. They would have maelstroms. Uh, this, uh, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story called Descent into the Maelstrom after he had visited like Norway or something. Um which, by the way, if you were to go off the coast of Norway, um, there are it's very famous for its maelstroms that will literally destroy your ship if you come in in between tides. It's extremely dangerous water. Um, so, but I, you know, I've always I've always thought there was something to that because it doesn't matter. Even like go back and watch uh, the original Stargate. Right when they crank up the Stargate, it does a whirlwind first, right mm-hmm. before the portal cranks up, because that's what it is. This angel in the whirlwind is. You know, this whirlwind is the, uh, this how they travel between worlds. Look at uh, the book of Job. It says mm-hmm. the Lord then descended in a whirlwind, right? Mm-hmm. You know, these are these dimensional these dimensional doorways. And it's, it's literally not only do you see it in the Bible, but you see it in all these different places. And by the way, uh, it's interesting to me because uh, at least in my own research, and granted it's very limited, um, when you would look at legends like the Kraken or any of these big sea monsters, they would always appear near a freaking maelstrom, like mm-hmm. these world these whirlpools in the water. It's insane how that works. Now, is there something there? I was just talking. I told you guys last week that I went to that paranormal museum up here in North Carolina. And me and the owner got to talking about, you know, Bigfoot sightings. And, you know, we had one. I kid you not, Brian, at that place I told you about, Medoc Mountain, where Bigfoot is commonly seen here in North Carolina. They said they were chasing him. And all of a sudden they just this 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 like portal, like a whirlwind opened up and they disappeared. You know, it, it's literally everywhere you look if you know what you're looking for. Oh, yeah, everywhere is right. Um, so now I want to mention two groups real quick, right? Uh, um, uh, two communist groups and both uh, Masonic as they come, Illuminati. They're, they're the political uh, side of the Illuminati, right? Number one, they, they were both created by uh, Zbigniew Zabisky and uh, David Rockefeller, right? So number one is a trilateral commission, right? Look at the logo. It's a whirlwind. That's what it's supposed to represent in the triple six. And also, if you look at the Council on Foreign Relations, right? Which, by the way, the new CEO, the new CEO of YouTube is on the Council of Foreign Relations, if y'all didn't know that. Yeah. So you will not see me posting to YouTube very often anymore. Uh, I will mostly be on Rumble now. So just giving you guys a heads up. And uh, yeah, the man on the pale horse. And also, who's that look like too? With his hold his hand up, right? Mm, yeah, see, uh, mm-hmm. I'll show you right now. Um, uh, that symbol. I'm a, that's oh, a oh, four. Uh, no, you're fine. You're throwing up symbols, and I know there's a thirty second delay. Uh, there was a symbol earlier, and I and I'm and I know what it's called. I just can't. 
as soon as you moved off of it, I lost my train of thought. Because continue, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. So, if you the symbol looks familiar, right? Uh, check this out, right? The famous picture of who Napoleon Bonaparte on the horse holding his right hand up, right? Not mm -hmm. a coincidence that <laughs> that's the symbol of the Council of Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. And yeah, demonic as it comes, man. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So yeah, that these organ they're the political they're the, the political realm of the Illuminati and Freemasonry. So uh so, yeah. and Trey, so, uh Trey, you said Pilot Mountain, right? That's in your area. You're so Pilot area. Mountain Pilot Mountain's about two and a half hours from here, and that's like a, a hub of like crazy stuff like this. Well you well you know um, that all you know that's all in circum it's all of a circumference uh it's like a big map. Uh, it's a pyramid yeah. grid, right? So it all yeah. and it all flows like a it flows like a fine there, line all the way up and down my area. Mm -hmm. And yep. some of the places there's a ley line. Josh been filming, and it's it's yep. that you can't even make his stuff up. There's a place that me and Josh would know about, and it fits like a it's just like a puzzle piece that you never can get away from. It's it's phenomenal. Yep. It's phenomenal. Yeah. So yeah, I'd look, I think I can't remember if I sent you that map, but there's a map of like. Some of them are ley lines, not all of them though, but it's a, basically an energy grid where there's this wagon wheel and all the lines converge on Pilot Mountain. It's like eight different lines. One of them goes to DC. The serpent ley line, of course, goes up to you in Kentucky. Uh, you know, by the way, that's the ley line that all the Bigfoot follow down from Kentucky mm -hmm. to North Carolina. It's just really crazy. I went to the uh, when we were at the museum. They had this this uh, map on the wall of all the sightings, and I went and looked at the line because you just kid you not, there's this straight line of a Bigfoot sightings and I pulled up my ley line map that I've got on my phone. My mm. wife said, you better not be proving a freaking theory about your ley lines right now. And I did. And she said, dog, if you ain't right, she said, it, it's exactly on that line. And I said, I can't take credit for that. Brian was the one that pointed that out to me. But, <laughs> oh, bless, um, bless you. Bless, bless you, Trey. <laughs> I, I seriously bless you for not, you know, no, you didn't, you could have took credit for, it. I would have got mad at you. No, well, I mean, you know, like, you know, I, 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 you know, it's just, I mean, you were the one that put the thought in my head. You said something about you had thought there was a ley line there. Um, but, you know, and it's weird, you know, I could, it, it, that's a completely different tangent. I, I shouldn't even go down that right now. But, um, what? you know, it look, when you, when you get into this stuff, it's just, uh, especially with this stuff with the, and, and as far as with the Council of Foreign Relations, one of the first shows Dan and I ever did together was on the Mark of the Beast. The only strike I've ever gotten on YouTube was because of that show. Um, and it wasn't even the first time I put it up. I went to re-air it yeah. one time and YouTube was like, ah, uh, yep, no. Um, but we <laughs> talked about, we literally in that episode talked about um, how when you look at this destruction of the nuclear family and the tenets of the Illuminati and Karl Marx and communism, how all of that stems from like Freemasonic groups. Um, so I think that one might be up on my Rumble channel. Mm -hmm. It's uh, The Mark of the Beast. It was about a two and a half hour episode that Dan and I was literally the first time I'd ever had Dan on my show. Oh, that and, was a uh, cool we, show. Yeah. yeah, that it was a lot of fun. We talked about, uh, you know, the we talked about RFID mm -hmm. and, um, you know, credits. That, yeah. Yep credit scores and esg and by the way we were talking about esg when back really the only person that was talking about it at that time was glenn beck hmm. um and boy he, he turned out to be absolutely right that was what put me on the trail of it and i was like "Ooh, this is kind of worrisome because you know especially now you look at this stuff they're trying to pass with this tiktok bill and the hmm. cd uh the cd um or uh the CBDCs and all of this stuff and all of that stuff that me and Dan were talking about is literally could come together. That's why this topic is so important. And you're like, cause you guys are thinking, what does any of this have to do with the mark of the beast and communism and things like that? Guys, you need to read this Luciferian transmutation book because the mark of the beast cannot happen unless there's an, a, a way to worship him too. Um, it, it says in both places, in Revelation chapter 13, and I believe it's verse 8, it says that, you know, he will be, that this first beast will be worshipped. And then later in the second half, when it talks about the false prophet, the one who gives the mark of the beast, it says he will cause them to worship the image of the beast. Well, what do you think they're going to be worshipping? They're going to be worshipping these, these gods of Freemasonry. By the way, Daniel chapter 11, I think this is really interesting. Um, 
when you read Daniel chapter 11 and you go to the willful king and you talk about Daniel chapter 38, that's uh, 11, 38, it says, but in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now, see, I think this is really interesting because when you study this, this willful king, it seems to be a Persian guy, right? Mm hmm. Um, I think he's going to be one of these Persian mystics, and I'm convinced it says that this word forces means a fortified place. But I think it's interesting that the King James translators chose the word forces. The word means fortress, so why not use that? Why forces? Because I don't think we're talking about a physical fortress here. I think we're talking about a spiritual stronghold, i.e. maybe somebody. Then this is me straight reaching here, so this is my theory. Take it for whatever it's worth. I believe this guy's going to be worshiping this master Mason. Mm -hmm. Now, see, this guy dies before the tribulation even starts. And, you know, for anybody who subscribed to my my stuff uh, tomorrow on Rumble at, I think, around uh, sometime, Jim, maybe you, if you're subscribed, you'll get the notification. I'm going to post a link on YouTube tomorrow. Um, but we're going to be talking about some scriptures where this guy on YouTube tries to prove that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. The problem is he uses scriptures for three different people. This is one of the verses he uses. When you study it, you realize this guy dies before the tribulation starts. But who is this God that he's worshiping that his ancestors do not? Well, if it's Persia, for most of modern history, they've worshipped Allah, right? Mm -hmm. But who's this guy going to worship? I believe, personally, he's going to be worshipping this Master Mason, which Daniel 8 and Daniel 7 talk about the little horns. I think it's going to have something to do with that. He's going to be worshipping this God of the forces that's going to reunite church and state, right? Um, and, and I've talked about this stuff extensively on my show before when we talked about King Charles and how I believe he wants to be this beast. All his imagery on his uh, coat of arms says so. Um, you know, but what people have to realize is that you're never going to identify the Antichrist by either his name or his number because that number represents a total apostasy of 6,000 years of known human history. In one man. That's what Irenaeus said in mm -hmm. book five of Against Heresies. So what we do know then is if we look at, you know, especially when you get into the study of Aleister Crowley and you start looking at this apostasy and these things like this, like this is that apostasy. Look at all the blasphemous things we've already talked about, how they mock Jesus in this master mason ritual where, you know, Hiram Biff, Biff dies, but he's raised again. And now you're this master mason that you you represent this this what did they call it? The Christ principle, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is just openly blasphemous stuff. I've got quotes in here from Albert Pike where he talks about how the Ouroboros and the Baphomet uh, together are the Holy Spirit. Like, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit right there. I've got it in two different books. I could pull up that quote right now. Matter of fact, I think I will. Um, because one of them is right here when we get into the androgynous God of Freemasonry. And this is in the global Luciferian mass book because, you know, this is another this is another one of the gods of Freemasonry. When you talk about the Baphomet. Because it was a lifeless Levi who first drew up the picture of the Baphomet based off the goat of Mendez, which, by the way, comes from ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, Thank but this you. Is what I he, was trying to figure out. I knew he got the idea from Egypt. Couldn't trace for so it was the goat yeah. of Mendez. Okay, it was the, it was the it was the goat of Mendez. Yeah. Um, but this is what he says. He says another explanation, uh, and this is uh, the Great Seal of Solomon, and this is what. Um, this is this is David Carrico writing here. Another explanation uh, of the Elias Levi occult symbol is contained in the following comments taken from page 253 in A Bridge to Light. It is a direct quote from page 734, Morals and Dogma, which was penned by Albert Pike. That's why I said it's an Albert Pike quote, but he's actually drawing it from A Bridge to Light, which was written by Elias Levi. Um, he says the snake that surrounds this symbol is clearly called the Holy Spirit, which I don't know if you guys can see it. But if you look, here's the seal of Solomon with what oh, Elias Levi called the white Jehovah and the your, black Jehovah. A little more to yeah. your head. Right there. That better? A little tiny bit more. Yeah. The other way, Trey. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can pull that symbol up. Uh... So, but yeah. Uh, so what it is, is you have the white Jehovah, you have the black Jehovah. This is Elias Levi's words, by the way, not mine. 
Um, and then there's this snake swallowing its tail, the Ouroboros around it. And he said that Ouroboros was the Holy Spirit. There's other quotes, um, and I've got them in here somewhere. Um, this is it right here on the screen. The life of Levi, as above, so below. Yep. And so, um, so yeah, and here's the quote, by the way, about the, um, the Baphomet. It says, there is a nature, uh, there is in nature one most potent force by means whereof a single man can possess himself of it and know how to direct it, uh, and, and know how to direct it, it could revolutionize and change the face of the world. The Gnostics held that it composed the, in, the igneous body of the Holy Spirit. This is Pike again, talking about the Baphomet. And how it is, it is the igneous body of the Holy Spirit, and it was adorned in the secret rites of the Sabbath or the temple under the hieroglyphic figure of the Baphomet or the hermaphroditic goat of Mendez. This is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, now, like, like, this is, but this is the kind of stuff we're dealing with. Like, I would say that is the total apostasy of 6,000 years because I think we've already done a great job of showing that this mystery religion goes back to, uh, by their own words, mind you, goes back to the sons of Cain. Mm. So I would Rebuilding. absolutely say that's 6,000 years of human apostasy. See, this is where the mark of the beast comes in. It, it, will it be a physical mark? I think there will be a physical aspect, but it's more... Look, you can't yeah. separate the spiritual and the physical. Mm. They they absolutely want the physical. That's why they're pushing for it. Um, but it's going to be this worship, this false communion, this this bread and blood, this flesh and blood that they're going to want people to take um, in this ritual, this transmutation. That's going to be what does it. That's the abomination of desolation that mm. Jesus talked about, I believe. Um, but when you get into this aspect of it, this I mean, that's the mark. That's the sign of their authority. You look at it. That's why you can see the 666 and all of this stuff in it. They're telling you about their religion. And wanna, that is the sign of their authority when you get into this stuff. 6,000 years of human apostasy, as Irenaeus said. I want to point something out, too, that people <laughs> completely low look. This thing isn't everywhere, and this is one of the cores of the top core. If I get to it, yeah. All right, yeah. So this is going to be look very familiar, right? This uh, star, so-called Star of David, which is no such thing. Now you're going to see this star, right? <laughs> this is heavily, heavily used in Freemasonry, not just Judaism, right? This is used in Hinduism, Catholicism, Islam, Buddhism, Freemasonry, Judaism, uh, Masonic temples, Church of Mormons, and the Gnostics, right? Yeah. Why is this seal so important, right? And uh, they, uh, Doc Marquis, uh, former Illuminati, God rest his soul, he said, you know, because people were you know, on the pentagrams, you know, the eastern and western, up, one pointing up and down is, yeah, that powerful talisman, absolutely. But the most evil and most powerful talisman in all the occult that's a symbol, right, is this star. The star of Raphael, the star of Malk. And uh, yep. if you read Amos 5, you'll learn, yeah, it's nothing to do with David. David never had a star. The, in the, it says it right out in the book of Amos. And those are the stars of your gods, you know, with a located she, of course. So yeah. why do you think they're everywhere? They are embedded in everything because this is the core deity of, this is the religion of Freemasonry. It's Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. It's not Jesus Christ. This is, and if you look, um, Kabbalah's ancient uh, Judaism, this is some, I'm talking about, you talk about today's word, version of Sat Satanism. This is the most darkest stuff you could ever imagine. They believe in, G uh, I'm sorry, God is androgynous and also believe that God and Satan are the same person. And it's so, so twisted, it's not even funny. He's both yeah. male and female. He's got split personalities. It is bizarre. And they believe that Jesus is Metatron. And, and uh, David Carrico covered that a lot too. And they, yeah, uh, yeah there's a complete twisted version of Jesus and Enoch and everything else. It is the, such of the most bizarre, most evil thing there is. That's why, and yeah, and, and deep in Catholicism, you see that everywhere. That is the it, core. It's, yep. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say it's confusion. Yeah. And God is not the author of confusion, as he's writes in the, the scripture. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, I have a little, just a little uh, insert here. Just listening to you both, um, real quick. In this, in the, in their, uh, 
So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, isn't there something? Is it uh, Enoch? Uh, I know David Carico and everybody does a good job with, and but John and all them, they've done an extraordinary good job on ACTV with the Enoch series. Isn't there? Um, isn't there an angel that taught? Was it the Enoch sixty nine maybe or sixty nine or fifty? Was it chapter sixty nine talking about the writing of ink? Am I am I correct on that? Day. You remember is talking about teaching man how to use ink and pen? Am I am I wrong? If, if it is Enoch sixty nine, it would be one of the Satan's. I've got my copy of e, uh, the book of Enoch right here, so give me a second. Yeah. I'll look it up. Forgive for me, you. forgive me. The reason why I'm no. I'm, there, I'm listening to you guys, and I'm kind of just compiling everything that we've brought to the table tonight and i was i have something to throw in there if you can bring it up i can't remember and forgive me everybody in the audience this is really just off the cuff uh it just came to my remembrance um i was just wanted to bring something up so if all this stuff because y'all know more about freemasonry than i do um if all this stuff I, is go ahead go ahead Trey. I, i'm sorry i was just gonna let you know i found it whenever okay. Please read it. Please read it. No, please read it. It is. It is 69. Enoch chapter 69, starting in verse 8. The fourth was named Penemaway. Now, keep in mind, this is one of the Satans. So you really want want to set a Baptist hair on fire? Tell them there's more than one Satan. Um, Don't do that. That that would not be. They're not ready for that yet. So don't start an argument. Um, The fourth was named (laughs) Penemaway, which I think is interesting because Nimaway was the one that locked Merlin in the tree That's in yeah, Arthurian yeah. legend. That's what I was um, going to bring up. That's what I was going to bring up. Yeah, yep. thank you. You're all, you're, you're all yeah. on the same mind here. Well, the yep. Holy Spirit's so, born out of here. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. So this was Penemaway. He taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet. He taught them all the, all the secrets of their wisdom, and he instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper, and thereby many sinned for all eternity unto this day. Mm. Well, I wanted to, I'm glad you, um, thank you for reading it, Trey. Um, my eyes are kind of giving out on me, so forgive me, everybody, if it's a distraction with my, my blue light filtering glasses. I'm not doing it for, it's, it's literally because my eyes are giving out on me so I can enjoy the rest of this broadcast with my brothers here. So, hey, well, uh, you do what you got to do. And yeah, I'll yeah. Be, quite frankly, you're yeah. going to look cool doing it. So, well, my, <laughs> I appreciate it, Trey. My mind, my mind's still here, though. My mind is still here. So, you're good. Uh, but the 69 on the chapter of Enoch, which you just got done reading. And the, that's why I wanted to bring that up. And you, you already took it. You already took it upon you. You just knocked out, out of the park, man. Um, I'm kind of contemplating everything that we compiled together today. And if we're talking about entities and things that are coming in and popping in, and there's men wanting to harness the Osiris spirit, you know, conjuring all this stuff up, becoming this enlightened one, Am, am I am I am I too far off, guys? Because I know that y'all know a lot more the masonry. But what I'm getting at is that no. with all this presidential debate is and all these different ritualistic standpoints, mm. is uh, are they are they bringing in? And what's so bad about it? Once they bring it in, they take their ink and pen and they start writing what these ancient uh, deities and ancient spirits have been around for st- millenniums, and they're able to ar- articulate it and, and put it in a book and paper form, and then produce it and just cause all kinds of discord and literally make up all kinds of different data that can bend and spin it to mankind's will. They'll, they'll manipulate it, defragment your brain. And before you know it, uh, they'll get you believing that stuff more than they will the Holy scriptures. Am I, am I, am I too far off there? I'm just kind of. No, I, I, I think you're spot on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to, I'm sorry to interject. I just wanted to throw that out there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely what they're doing. That was the whole point when Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon wrote his New Atlantis. It was literally a a story that was never finished, by the way, um, about how they needed this utopia where their philosophy could be exercised and exist. And that will basically, Manly P. Hall says that that was the blueprint for the United States. Well, when you really start to study Atlantis and you understand the 10 Kings that were the sons of Poseidon and how this beast will have 10 horns, that's absolutely what they're trying to do. And they are, they're using their pen. You always hear the term, the pen is mightier than the sword. I don't know if any of y'all ever watched the show once upon a time. 
But one of the characters that was, you know, a catalyst in the show early on, by the way, where all of these these Disney characters get stuck in this town in the real world, right? Um, one of the characters becomes um, the, I guess he was called the author or something like that, but he literally had this magic pen and he could, you know, change people's stories. Like, like the, like the, the most magic character of all on that show was the one with the pen. It wasn't Rumpelstiltskin, who was a great sorcerer. It wasn't the evil queen. It wasn't uh, the Wicked Witch of the West who was up there. Uh, it wasn't it, uh, Merlin had been up there. All of these characters had been up there, but the most magical character of all was the one that had the pen and could write the stories. So, uh, and when you talk, think about it, this came on the ABC channel. Like I said, it used Disney characters. You look at the fact that Walt Disney was in the Demole Society, and he was the one who really started putting all of this magic stuff with the Sorcerer's Apprentice and things like that and all these children cartoons, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that that is absolutely what is going on. So, But that's just my opinion. Well, and the Father in Heaven uh, gave the words for man to the inspire word of God to be uh, written. And I think it's just interesting, those words, the precious words of the Father and the Son, you know, we're talking about Christ Jesus, and it's just very, the inspire word of God is so detrimental for our walk. And I think it's just so interesting how it's more e just let's face the facts. It's so much easier to get drawn into secular things. It seems like it it's like you're it's almost like the like the flesh just resonates with it. And then, you know, I mean you want to just consume it with it doesn't matter if it's filthy garbage, you want to consume it. But then you have the living truth word of God that comes from the heavens and you're like it takes everything in your power to fight ever demonic, ever type of demonic, demonic suppression. And yet then, you know, after the dust clears, you, you either, you've either been caught up because this is, I'm teaching, I'm preaching to myself. You've either gotten caught up into the world so much or into other things that, that you, the last thing, the only, you forgot to read the word of God is what I'm saying, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, your daily yeah. walk. So it's almost like, yeah. it's almost like the powers that be, they know how to, to manipulate the genome. They know how to manipulate the mind. Your your cerebral cortex, the whole neuron pathways, the whole the whole ball of wax, and they push you into the secular knowledge, this ancient mm -hmm. uh, mystery school knowledge. But then they bend your wheel with the red and blue book, and they there's only some you know according to what I'm understanding in the Masons, there's only certain people that can understand the blue one. There's only certain people that can understand the red. Am I correct on that? And they yeah. They, and there's like this big old paradigm that they, and then at the end of the day, you forget your your so more far you're so much further away from this holy ghost you're the holy spirit or excuse me the holy scriptures and it draws you into the secular knowledge and this this knowledge that is of the earthly realm right am i am i correct on that i mean i'm just kind of i'm just kind of 100 percent yeah. right um yeah and see look that all goes back once again um it was it, i can't remember uh who it was but there was a, a you know a a philosophy guy who had been analyzing the writings of Plato and noticed that Plato would write something and it would be meant for a wide audience to get one meaning. And then he would have his, you know, astute disciples, his inner circle that could get a totally different meaning. And that's mm -hmm. what I mean. Like when you really study Freemasonry, uh, uh, Manly P. Hall talks about Plato a lot in his writings um at least what i've read of them and i won't even venture as far as to say that i'm an expert on the things manly p hall have wrote i just know what i've read through other people's research to be perfectly honest but what i have read he writes about plato a lot and um because i've had his audiobook so i have listened to some of his stuff um and this seems to be the thing like you get into and it's really interesting when you start getting into things like Plato and Pythagoras and all of this stuff. We once again, we're getting into all of these same things. They were just maybe a little more in their infancy and people like Manly P. Hall came along and refined them. But, you know, you're getting into this, you know, when we talk about the by the way, the Star of David is what we would call sacred geometry. And it's numbers actually like if you look at it, it that pulls up to six, six, six as well. Um and by the way, it's a, also a 2D print of what is known as the Cube of Metatron. Um, if you were to take the Cube of Metatron and its dimensions and push it into a 2D image, it would be the Star of David. Um, 
So just for those who didn't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of this stuff, it's all connected. Um, it's all designed to basically enchant you is what mm-hmm. it does. When you get into, when you talk about social engineering and brainwashing and MK Ultra, I mean, you could take this a thousand different ways. I kid you not. I am literally, I've been airing reruns of my shows lately because I've got a book, the notebook right here. Um, if I can do this without not being every single day, um, which I probably can't because I always knock everything down. But I'm literally got something that I'm working on. It's going to be a documentary style thing about how when you start looking into the alien agenda, mm. it can all be traced back to this stuff too. Whether it's Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard in the desert doing their Babylon working. They got the idea from Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley told them, don't do it. You're going to mess something up. And then got mad at them because they went ahead and did it anyway. Um, and then all of a sudden UFOs start being seen at an exponential rate from there. Uh, you can trace it back to Nikola Tesla, who was a spiritualist and allegedly, uh, you know, he was involved with the Philadelphia experiment, which then allegedly led to, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt meeting this elder race on a battleship. Um, you know, all of this stuff, it all ties in together. And I think it's so important that people understand that these things all tie in together because, by the way, when you see people like the angel in the whirlwind and all of this, that's why I brought up Stargate because that's what they're going to come back and do. I don't know if you guys – how many of you guys remember the movie Stargate, but it was literally the god Ra came in a pyramid spaceship through a Stargate. Um, When I add that in there, that was a Venama. And even though it looked like a pyramid, it was like an ancient – you know, it's – it's a hovering craft, right? But it was massive, yeah. like a city can inhabit a bunch of, uh, you know, so-called, you know, I guess people in it or aliens or whatever. But yeah. um, that's a Venama back in the Hindu culture, even though that, you know, we're talking about Orphanas. That's and, right. I yeah. forgot about so that. So the Aoife, the, the, I mean, the Venama, he landed on the capstone. It was like a capstone over top of the pyramid with the pillars. Yeah. And in the Atlantean culture, I mentioned this the other day, um, the Atlantean in North America talks about, uh, it was called uh, uh, Atalan. It was the name of North America in the Atlantis, uh, the Great wait, War of Atlantis. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. Hold on. Say that again. Uh, Atalan. And it was, uh, it's in English, it would means North America. And they had the capital of North America was called the Triple City, which was the Tripur. I think it's called Tripura. And that was a, a, a literally a capital of North America, the Atlantis narrative that could literally hover over the land and pull up. It had, it had pillars. It, and it literally would uh, dispute. It would uh, uh, when it when it went to go hover, it could go to other countries, and it had this yellow plume smoke come out from underneath it. No joke, no joke. And it would it was a floating city that inhabited uh, like tons of people. So it's the same concept Crazy. when you're thinking of Star Stargate. It, that's, it, I'm, I'm sorry, going on a big rant, but that's that's how I'm seeing it. Whenever you're talking, so I'm just kind of going back with oh, what that's, you're. Mm-hmm. That's uh no um. Uh, th- yeah, that so, and I was thinking, and I, I and forgive me, I'm looking this up right now. Um, uh, like, give me just a second. So, um, something just came to mind, and what was that name again? Oh, um, are you talking about? Uh, uh, yeah, are you talking what, about what Atlantis? Atlantis? Yeah, Atlantis. Yeah. So, I think it was. Mm-hmm. So that's that's so interesting because uh, it reminds me, and that it might not even be a connection, um, but in Frozen 2, Elsa had to travel to a place to discover who she was called Atta Holland. And it just it reminded me of that when you said <laughs> How was that. it spelled? It How was, was it literally spelled? a river of ice. It's A-H-T-O-H-A-L-L-A-N. It's spelled a little different, but I, I get what you're saying. The punctu- When you're pronouncing it, it sounds similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's, those, uh, there's definitely a phonetic similarity. Elemental, sp- oh. those elemental spirits are all over the place on the Frozen. Um, oh, uh, like, so, um, we, we passed it especially in Frozen Two. So Go ahead, Dan. Pa- uh, no, I was saying like I, I don't have a time limit, but we passed two hour mark. I don't know if you guys want to take calls. Um, I have a presentation too, but I mean, uh, this oh. pr- the presentation I got is going to take at least forty five minutes. And um, oh, okay, so well, I'm, I'm just sorry, gonna, um, man. We I'm got, just going to yeah. you know talk about a couple of slides that. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to either Sunday night or Monday, I'm going to just do another show separate this, uh, just, you know, just to illustrate the slides I got because the presentation I got, again, is a minimum of 45 minutes. And um, and by the time I'm done training, probably will be uh, asleep here. But I just wanted to um, you know, <laughs> point a couple things out, you know, and, and uh, because we told people that if you're Masons uh, to watch the show because of stuff that's literature that's in your own uh, Masonic libraries. I just want to, um, just a couple things. I'm, you know, I'm not going to show all the slides, but I want you to, if you're a Mason or think about going to Mason, right? Get, um, go into your library, right? I have this book and I, I'm going to burn the damn thing because oh, this oh. book here is, uh, one of the most disgusting evils books there. I mean, it's, it's pure spiritual filth, all right? By Albert Pike and Smalls and Dogma, right? So if you take Masonries of God and all that stuff, okay, uh, this is Confederate General Albert Pike, right? Yeah. Evil as they come. This guy almost almost ranks up there with Alistair Crowley. Almost. Yeah. So he created the 33 degree. He was um, the creator of that, right? It was only 32 degrees mm -hmm. at the time. He created the 33. Um, and his signal, that what you're looking at, right? It's a double-headed eagle bird. Uh, that is called Mamun Ra. That's an ancient Egyptian. I think it's uh, the god of wealth and war, if I believe I'm correct, right? Mamun Ra, right? Now... Now, let me ask you something, right? If you're a professing Christian and all that, and yes, there are Christians who are 30, 31, 32, 33 degrees, right? If you are a professing Christian, right? Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 24, right? No man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate one and love the other, or else he'll hold one up and despise the other. And you cannot serve God and mammon. <laughs> that damn that's right in your face. Yeah, I was actually just about to bring that up when you said Mom and Ra was the god of wealth. I was like, that sounds an awful lot like Mammon. Yeah, and it's right there in Scripture. You can't it's make even it stuff spelled up. the same. I just saw it, so I'm so I'm watching I'm watching the video on like mute while we're doing it, yeah. and it just popped across my screen. Uh, that's insane. Hmm. There, that's not a coincidence. By the way, Mammon is also a considered a. Uh, there's a in certain cultures, Mammon is considered a spirit or a demon yep. that is constantly tied into greed or wealth as and well. And that's why so, it's black uh, there, right there. Yep. In that illustration. And now, mm -hmm. when I was putting these together uh, yesterday, uh, Thursday night, right? Uh, thir Wednesday and Thursday night, I was putting these together, right? And I, for some reason, right, when I brought this up because I wanted to point out the thirty third degree. And this this came to my head, and the, the the Holy Spirit had to do that because Matthew six twenty four came to my head. I pulled that up, and uh, you can't make that up, <laughs> like that that's right in our face. So if you're a Freemason guy, then yeah, you can't serve two masters, plain and simple. God and man, it's right there in the scripture. Not a coincidence yep. that this satanic uh. punk here. I hope he was saved before he died, whatever the case. But regardless, it's not a coincidence yeah. that they use that. Okay, so, there's a couple more things, too. Um, I have a question yep. real quick about uh, Albert Pike. Hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't he also the co-founder of the KKK? Yes, he was a silent person. He yeah. was like a big but, pusher of the Ku Klux Klan. And you know, it's yeah. funny, too, uh, Family Guy. If people knew this, right, Family Guy would be shut down. You know how they put symbolism and all that stuff? Now, remember Stewie, one of the episodes when Stewie, Brian sold his uh, toy beer on a yacht sale? Yeah. Okay. They so they went around the country looking for uh, what's the the bear's name? I don't remember. What's the bear's name? Oh, regardless, right? Huh? Rupert. Rupert right? <laughs> so they went. Oh they, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Brian Rupert, right? Let me see if I can pull this up here. Uh, Brian Rupert. Hold on, say. Uh, looking for because I'm gonna show you guys something. It's <laughs> yeah. This was and if people knew what this meant. There would have been a massive uprising. Family Guy would have definitely got shot down for massive racism. Right? Yeah, I'm going to show you guys. Um, let's see. Uh, El Pike statue. Now, check this out, right? Uh, let me see. Yeah, I can't find an illustration right now. So, anyway, if you could picture, if you guys watch Family Guy, you know what I'm talking about. Brian's the dog. Uh, Stewie's the baby, right? And Brian sold his, his a talking dog, by the way. He sold his toy beer, Rupert. In the yard sale by accident, right? Somebody bought it. They moved across country, or whatever. So they went around looking for Rupert because Brian want, uh, Stewie wanted the back, right? Anyway, so they came into wherever Albert Pike statue in D.C. I'm sorry. They went to Washington D.C., right? And there's um, check this out, right? 
there's Brian and there's uh, Stewie, right, standing there, look, and he's, they talk to a black person, right? In the background is a statue, Albert Pike on the horse, right? And they says uh, something the matter of slavery, and uh, Stewie goes to the black guys, you're, you're welcome. You know, and, uh, and if you could put it this way, basically this is a direct massive statement because Albert Pike's right in the background, the KKK, you know what I mean, with the white dog. Yeah, this was like symbolic as it comes. But that Albert Pike was a big, big uh, pusher of the Ku Klux Klan. By the way, part of the Democratic Party too, so... <laughs> So that's how simple it is. Well, and it goes more, man. And Albert uh, Pike here, uh, he, he, his claim he, has, he says, to which we must uh, say to the crowd, we w worship a God. And he's saying to the public, you've got to tell the public we worship a God, but the God that one adores without superstition. To, to use a sovereign grand inspector general, we say that this is, may repeat, this is part of the ritual, by the way, of the 30, uh, 31st and 32nd degree, right? You must repeat this at the you know thirty uh, second, thirty first, and thirtieth degree. The Masonic religion should be by all initiates of the highest degrees, right? Maintain the purity of Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. Like we just told you, so if you are a professing Christian right now, you're in Freemasonry. This is the highest degrees, guys. They believe yep. God and Lucifer the same person. And it's more. Uh, it's more, right? Albert Pike, Morals Dogma, right? And now uh, Second Corinthians uh, 11 says, 14, in Marvel, no Marvel, right, that Satan himself transforms his into an angel of light, right? So now, um, page 246 of Morals and Dogma, right in the highlighter red, right? Lucifer, the light bearer, the strange and mysterious uh, name given to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. It is also the one who bears the light which is uh, splendors, intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual, and selfish souls. But anyway, masonry always promises light, right? Light, 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 light. The light is not an angel or Jesus. The light is Lucifer to them right there. And um, the Lost Keys of Freemasonry, Manly P. Hall, and I think one of the quotes uh, brought, um, Trey might have quoted, right? Now, Manly P. Hall, right, pages 35 and 36, he says, the true Mason is creed. Actually, uh, Trey already talked about that. That you must acknowledge all religions and temples and everything else. And he goes recognizes the light bearer, not the. You know, I'm saying, the Mason right recognizes only the light, not the bearer. And he worships at shrines. And again, Trey already talked about this quote. But acknowledge that doesn't matter who where the doesn't matter where the light. You know, the knowledge, the gnosis comes from, right? The G in the in the symbol. Doesn't matter where it comes from. If it's light, listen to it. Uh, that's not something a Christian should be saying. <laughs> and um, Manly P. Hall also talks about on page 78 when the Mason learns that the key is the proper application, the dynamo of living power, he has learned that the mystery of the craft, the seething energies of Lucifer, are in his hands. Uh, is profession Christian supposed to be playing with the seething energies of Lucifer? No. And these books are in your libraries, guys. Uh, page 18, he goes on to say that Freemasonry is a philosophy which is essentially creedless. It is true for it that the brothers bow to truth regardless of the bearer. Sounds like a lot like Pike just said too, right? It doesn't matter who the uh, no, uh, yeah, doesn't matter who the bearer is. The light instead of wrangling over who the one brings it. Don't worry about the one who brings it. He's saying, the, just listen to it. Doesn't matter where it comes from. This is the way we prove that we are seeking to know better and will. The dictate of the invincible one. And the, who's the invincible one to them? It's Lucifer. The true, No true religion exists than that the world camaraderieship uh, and brotherhood for purpose of glorifying one God and building him a temple constructed attitude of noble character. And as you see, that God is Lucifer. And at uh, pages 28 and 29, he says, the initiation brother realizes the so-called symbols and rituals are merely blind fabrications to the wise perpetrated Ideas incomprehensible. So basically, this is Albert Pike saying, "Listen, like you are lied to every time you get taught a symbol or something in Mason. You are intentionally lied to." And he goes on to say in uh, page twenty-nine, the average individual. He also realizes that few Masons of today know or appreciate the mystic meaning of concealment within the rituals, with religious faith and perpetuate to form uh, worshiping instead of the life. Those who have not recognized the truth. In the crystallized ritual, 
Those who have not liberated the spiritual germ from the shell empty words and not masons, regardless of the physical degrees of uh, upward, uh, I'm sorry, outward honors, right? Then um, he also says, and um, this is a quote from him too in this book, they wander, in, they wander in darkness seeking light, right? But failing to realize that the light is in the heart of darkness. <laughs> He's saying the heart of darkness is light. When Jesus says, I am the light, the truth, the way, and, he, and the Bible says, hey, the darkness does not comprehend the light. But this guy is saying, yeah, the real light comes from the darkness. This is, in, this is uh, his book, uh, The Secret of Hiram and Beth, right? And um, uh, uh, Anton, San, uh, yeah, Anton Sander LeVay, he was the founder of the Church of Satan in 1966. He was also a Freemason, by the way. This is the Satanic Bible, The Rituals, right? He goes on to say in page uh, 144 to 146, but he goes, says, but now even the most hardened skeptic should could be convinced that Freemasonry, right, is Lucifer Satan worship. However, mind you, uh, Anton LeVay was the 33rd degree. He's saying Freemasonry is a Lucifer Satan worship. However, for those who may still need more convincing, let us consider the internal names by which Masonry masks its many uh, references to Satan. And we just showed you a bunch of them, by the way. And there's tons more, but we're not going to get into all of them today. In the, bio, uh, in the Satanic Bible, we see uh, 77 names which uh, pagans have referred to Satan over the centuries. And let us quickly review some of the infernal names of Satanism found within Masonry. And he goes on with these names that Masons use, right? And uh, so real quick here, um, President, the sixth President of the United States, John Quincy Adams, he had a, an absolute hatred for Freemasonry because at this time, Freemasonry became massively corrupted by the Illuminati. And they became massively, because uh, George Washington won about, uh, in 1795, uh, 91, I believe it was, uh, about the corruption of the infiltration of the Illuminati in all of Europe and that coming to America. He penned a letter to his Reverend Jedediah. So anyway, by the time John Quincy Adams came along, and he already witnessed what Freemasonry did, right? <laughs> and he says, Freemasonry is deceptive and, fraud deceptive and fraudulent. It promises is light, right? But performance is darkness. Oh, is that so familiar? We just heard that from Who? Manly P. Hall, right? And also he says, Masonry ought to forever be abolished. It is wrong, essentially wrong, a seed of evil, which can never produce any good. And he also goes on to say, I do uh, consciously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the greatest, is one of the greatest moral and political evils under which the union is now laboring, a conspiracy of the few against the equal rights of many, masonry ought to forever be abolished. It is wrong, essentially wrong, the seed of evil, which can never produce good. Now, it's the full quote of that. And another one, he says, uh, Freemasonry is deceptive and fraudulent. And then that's the uh, quote we just said. It promises light, uh, but its performance is darkness. And exactly right. And he also warns um, uh, President John Quincy Adams, he warned that the lodges use the Bible should to do tra uh, train Christians raises red flags, right? He's warning Christians about being part of uh, going to the, uh, the lodges there, right? Uh, being part of a masonry. So he says, if the candidate has been educated to a sincere and heartfelt reverence for religion and the Bible, and if he exercises the reasons, he knows that all the tales of Jash and Boaz, those are, by the way, those are the two uh, temples, uh, two pillars, I'm sorry, in the Masonic Lodge. They represent the pillars of uh, King Solomon's Temple, Jash and Boaz. But anyway, so he says, if you know the tales of Jash and Boaz and Solomon's Temple and Hiram and Beth and Jubala and Jubilo and Jubalam are impostures, poison poured into the perennial foundation of truth traditions exactly resembling those reparated by Jesus Christ as making the word of God non effect. He said, yeah, if you, if, you know, if you know the Bible, you should not be in masonry because you could clearly see it's against God. You know what I mean? And um, I got so much other stuff, but one more thing I'm going to reveal here too. So if you don't think the Illuminati and yeah, um, Freemasonry have anything to do with each other, yeah. John, John Robeson, he wrote Proofs of a Conspiracy uh, back in 1798, right? He was uh, like a secretary, if you will, for uh, Adam Weissop. You know, he was... Uh, the professor of canon law, he was the founder of the Illuminati in May 1st, 1776. Anyway, um, this was um, at the Council of Wilhelmsbad. 
that he talks about when all the secret societies merged under Freemasonry, because at the time, the Illuminati was being hunted down for generations, the Knights Temple were underground, the Jacobins, the Druids, they all had to go underground because they would be hunted left and right. So anyway, he goes like this, right? Because everybody knew Freemasonry. They didn't expect nothing over it. So he says, the great strength of our order, talk about the Illuminati, right? The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any other place in any other name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. None is fitter than the three lower degrees of Freemasonry. That's the Blue Lodge, the supposed, you know, supposed Christian lodges. Yeah, the, the, the most evil institution ever, the Illuminati, right? Is concealed with the right in the inner circle of the um, the Blue Lodge, and he says the public is accustomed to it, expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. And he goes on to talk about that. So, um, what I got like this is only the, the scratch the surface of what I got. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do another um, off show for this, um, yeah, you know, to present all my slides and all that because I got another set and everything else and more on this one. So, uh, so. I'm going to do that like probably Monday or something like that. But um, yeah, um, if you guys want to add anything to that, go for it, man. And I got tons of more quotes from Albert Pike and um, <laughs> all these other cats from the Illuminati. You know, it's, uh, I mean, sorry, Freemasonry and the Illuminati. Albert Mackey's Encyclopedia. Uh, man, you got Duncan's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Uh, this is a good book too, guys. Voices from the Dead by Tex Mars. It talks about... Um, the ritual, the dead man in the coffin, which comes to find out that it is, uh, uh, what's his name here? Hold on a second. I, I got on my other slides. It's uh, Bar Simeon Yoshi, Rabbi Bar Simeon Yoshi, but that's, uh, yep. I'll save that for next time, unless you guys want to talk about it. But um, yeah. yeah the, that's, that's the guy that allegedly, uh, you know, officially Moses de Leon is the one who brought mm -hmm. together the Zohar, but according to Jewish legend, Rabbi uh, Shimon Bar Yochai was, uh, he was the one that did it. And it was like not long after the time of Jesus sat in a cave and had all of it supposedly, uh, uh, you know, transmitted to him by, I think, an angel like Metatron. So. Yeah, it's him right here. And, uh, it's from Tex Mars' book too here. So Jewish artist Conception, this famous uh, Rabbi Simeon Bar Yashi, Second century author of the Kabbalah and the Zohar, Yoshi, or I call him Yoshi, I don't know why, according to both the Jewish Encyclopedia <laughs> and Wikipedia, is described as a permanent and anti-Gentile uh, teacher. He quoted the Talmud as saying that, that the best of the Gentiles kill in his Kabbalistic works of the basis for doctrines of Freemasonry. He is honored in Freemason's 30th degree, the Knight of Kadosh. So if you ever see the... Um, the ritual they have, it's called uh, the dead man in the coffin. Uh, David Carrico believes that dead man in the coffin right here that they talk to, all right, that's by Yoshi. And, uh, and uh, yeah. also Tex Mars agrees with that. And uh, the Masonic drawing symbolizes uh, Rabbi Bar Yoshi and speaks to the 30th degree candidate from the coffin. So that I, mean, I believe I believe that's also that man in the coffin imagery is also big in skull and bones if I remember correctly. Oh yeah, yep, because it's got right, the skull and bones is on right on the top. See, it? you could barely see it, but it's right on the top with the skull and bones yeah. on top of the uh, lid of the mm -hmm. casket. Yeah, yep. Um, Very interesting. I, yeah, yeah. I really, I really need to get Tex Mars books. I. I actually don't have any of them, and I really want to read them. So I've got to buckle down and get those very soon. You get them on eBay, wicked cheap, man. And I, uh, I think his website's still up. I think his family runs it now. But, uh, man, cool. what a blessing to have him on the show. For a while, I stopped having him on the show because I had no idea. Because um, Alex Jones told me he's, like, uh, anti-Semitic and all that, so I stopped using him. Then I come to find out everything he's saying, the guy was 100% right. But he wasn't talking about real Jews. He talked about the fake Jews like the Bible talks about. So, yeah. um, and I didn't know any better at the time, so I stopped using, but I feel bad. But this guy, he was such a blessing to have on the show, and um, it was an honor to know him. Hmm. Yeah, he's he was a smart guy. I've seen some documentaries. Now, granted, yeah. they were with maybe not the best people. Like, I think he made a documentary with Steven Anderson one time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, hey, I mean, you win some, you lose some, right? But yeah. the guy was wicked smart. Like, just very, very, very intelligent. Yeah, I would recommend you get Codex Magic or um, that uh, book I just showed you there. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely start looking into getting those. But, um, 
Guys, I got to be honest with you. And you guys know I normally, like, I stick around even after Dan normally leaves, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, off there. But I'm I'm about to fall out. So, yeah. Um, oh, right. And I've told y'all, you know, that, I mean, normally it's not like this, but it's been – been a, a very, very tasking long. a very tasking week mm-hmm. yes yes it has mm-hmm. so um if it's okay with you guys i'm gonna cut out early and um but no, i will I definitely go back on, man. I do. oh hey guys thanks for having me you guys know i always look forward to it absolutely um, it's a pleasure man shabbat shalom and jason thank you for joining us too and uh, god bless shalom and you are the resistance If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com And welcome everybody to the Dan Bedani Show right on truthradioshow.com. So I want to welcome everybody here and uh, I want to acknowledge that this is a continuation from Friday's show. So it might look similar and everything else. So just want to let everybody know this is not a replay or nothing. This is a live show. So as you can see, I got my white wrinkly shirt on here. So yeah, uh, so we got a lot to talk about today. And what we're going to do, guys, and um, we're going to talk about Freemasonry again. There's stuff that I didn't get to bring up during the show uh, because we just ran out of time. Is you know because we had me, Brian, and um, uh, Trey Harris. We had all this information. You know, not enough time to do that, and I didn't really get to present what I have to present. So basically, it's going to be a very educational, and it's got to do with American history, French. Uh, history and uh, British history as well, and all Europe history, I should say, and American history. And it's um, very vivid. So I want to, uh, before we get going any further, I do want to make a clause here that we are not at all, okay, saying that all Freemasons are bad people. We don't want you getting your broomsticks and pitchforks and torches to go to the houses. No, we don't want you to do that. So, um, now I want to disclose that most Masons are very good people. And they're, they're great-hearted people, just like me and you and everything else. However, uh, they are hoodwinked. They're lied to by the people who run the order. So we're going to get into that. And what we're going to do, guys, tonight is we're going to prove, and I hope that you know, if you're a Freemason out there, or uh, thinking I'm joining the crafter, and I would hope that you would pay attention to this because I'm going to give you information that you could find in your own lodges to prove without beyond a shadow of doubt this fraternity, right, this craft, this brotherhood is not a brotherhood of light at all. It promises light but produces darkness, plain and simple. And we're going to prove to you today that the, the craft, Freemasonry, is not about God. Certainly not about uh, Hiram Biff or King Solomon. It is about Lucifer, plain and simple. And we're going to get into this today. So this is a continuation of God's of Freemasonry, the craft of darkness. And uh, so in this one, he has called its promise is light, but its performance is darkness. So there's again, a continuation from uh, Friday's show. And I want to thank shakingwakeradio.com and beforeitsnews.com for carrying the show. And uh, blessing to you guys over there. And a uh, blessing to my buddy Joshua Watts and his company, WattsLeather.com, where a custom leather project becomes a reality. WattsLeather.com is tonight's official sponsor. So we're going to dive right into this, guys. And right before we get going here, uh, we're going to read this verse here, Matthew 33, 37, it says, and actually, um, number one, I'm sorry, prayer. <laughs> That's number one. So let's begin with a prayer. So Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, please forgive us all of our individual sins and trespasses. And thank you so much for going to Calvary. And it's coming on upon the time, 2,023 years ago, that you sacrificed yourself for our sins. And we thank you so much. You came to save the world. And I believe in you with all my heart and soul. And Heavenly Father, we ask you to protect everybody here and myself against the forces of evil, protect this broadcast, and uh, protect the information, 
and because we've got to reveal some dark evil stuff. And I pray that you could protect us and bind the forces of evil and open the ears and eyes, especially those uh, brothers and sisters that are out there who are into the Freemasonry. In your mighty name, amen. So that being said, guys, and again, I want to thank everybody in the chat. Uh, thank you, Valerie and Uncle Obvious, uh, who's in the chat room there, moderating the chat, and I think my brother will be popping in soon. So thank you guys very much, and I just want to say hello to everybody. So again, this is a continuation from Friday. So we're going to start off, and this is going to be very relevant because in Freemasonry, right, um, everything's to do with oaths. We explain this Friday. So if you miss a show Friday, you're not really, it's not a big deal because we're getting to the point here in the show. So if you missed the show Friday, don't worry about it. You're more than welcome. Please actually encourage to go check it out after the show here, but it's not like you something you have to watch to understand what's going on here. You know what I mean? So this is just information I didn't get to present. And I presented a little bit, but it was quick. But I'm going to go through it all tonight. So, and much more. So hopefully we've got an hour and a half. So before I have to leave for work. So hopefully we can get this done. So yeah, enough chatter. So let's get going. So Matthew uh, 5 says, again, we have heard of the, has been said of the old times, right? Referring to the Old Testament. Thou shalt not forswear thyself. But perform thyself, perform unto the Lord thy oaths, right? It is forbidden to uh, take oaths. Yes, even against uh, oath on the Constitution. I hate to say that. I, it blows my mind, uh, heart to say that. But yes, even taking an oath on the Constitution or swearing in the Bible in the courtroom, that is unbiblical to do. All right? And so Jesus says, But I say unto you, swear not at all. Don't swear on anything, plain and simple. Neither by heaven, don't in other words, don't swear, swear to God. Don't you know when you were kids? Oh, I swear to God, you know, cross his fingers, whatever. I say, swear to God, I didn't do it, whatever the case. I don't do that, <laughs> for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is God's footstool, right? Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. Neither by shall you swear by thy head. In other words, don't take a a, a life threatening oath uh, that it's called a blood oath. Don't do that, right? And it's not coincidence the Freemasonry, almost every ritual and degree requires a blood oath. And it says, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yes is yes, yea is yea, no is no, nay is nay. For anything else more is of the coming of evil. And other uh, translations say is of the devil, literally. So what Jesus is saying, when you somebody asks you to tell the truth, right? You don't take a solemn oath, okay? Solemn oaths are completely unbiblical. Much as I know, I know a lot of patriots out there. I'm a patriot myself, but it pains to say, yeah, we're not even to take an oath on the Constitution. You know what I mean? So um, the scripture says, plain and simple, don't say, take any oath at all. Plain and simple. Even say, I swear to God, you don't do that. Plain and simple. It says, and I can't say that enough, plain and simple, because it is plain and simple. You know, so sorry to sound redundant, but yeah, I have to do that. He says, simple. Jesus says, let your yes be yes, and no be no, plain and simple. <laughs> I got to throw that in there. Yeah, so I say that a lot. I'm sorry. But yeah, let your yes be yes, and no be no. You don't need nothing more. Anything else is of the devil, literally. So that being said, guys, uh, let's explore what Freemasonry is. A lot of people have no clue what Freemasonry is. They think it's just a fraternal order, like the Elks Lodge, stuff like that. Yeah. It, it kind of is, but a little deeper. So Freemasonry, and I'll break down, if I have time, I'll break down what that symbol means. Now, this symbol here is the logo, the official logo. It's a square and compass of Freemasonry, right? So you get taught many means what that G means. And here's the thing, too. I want to point something out. It's going to make sense later. I'm not going to understand this now, right? If you really look at that, right, and what it truly is, and I want to explain something, uh, that everything in the occultic world is a sexual perversion, twisted version of God or something else. They, they, they take things and they, and they create their own as well, but it's always a sexual. This represents sexual union right here. It's a male, mountain of female. You ever hear the uh, phrase, and we're all adults here, right? You know, a hitting a girl's G spot to get her off, okay? Yeah. That's where that comes from. That's sexual union right there, male, mountain, and female. And it goes a little bit more, too. And it's also part of the, um, the Kabbalah style. We're going to get into all this. <laughs> so there's many, many meanings for a symbol. And um, in symbolism, right? 
symbolism, you take a symbol, right? And the public sees thousands of meanings for it, right? And they're exoteric. In other words, they're all false meanings. And Freemasons, right? We're going to show you this too, uh, that intentionally lied to. So when you get into the craft, right, you learn, you think that stands for God. <laughs> Later on, you, uh, they tell you it's Gnosis, which is, you know, the Gnostics. Then you learn about the sexual union about it. Then you understand now this is, uh, then all the, I'm sorry, they tell you the grand architect as well. But it's a Luciferian symbol, plain and simple. So we're going to get into that and everything else. I'm going to explain exactly everything about this. And he has a, the, the funniest thing I love about this, right? The funniest thing I love about this, right? Years ago, I almost joined Freemasonry because right? I was intrigued by the American history a part of it. And they had a lot to do with history all over the world especially all of Europe and the United States, today's world, right? They are a big part of that. I want to point that out, right? And they built these, you know, D.C., they built Paris, France, they rebuilt it anyway. And um, the Vatican, too, it's all connected. I'm really going to try to get into all this tonight. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so I have to point this out. So if you think you're rolling your eyes, oh, here we go with the conspiracies, whatever, you know what? Shut the show off, go get a clue, and come back to me. And I hate to sound like a jerk about that, but <laughs> I have to do that. Because if you think this is fake, guys, you that means you don't know history or reality. So we'll get into the symbol soon. So um, David Carrico's book, right? It's uh, The Great Seal of the United States. I used it in my documentary movie. I just seen the promo for it at the beginning of the show here. So, The Great Seal of the United States, that's his book, it's a cult meaning, right? That's available on FOJCRadio.com, the links are in the description if you want to buy this book, guys. I think it's only 12 bucks, literally, it's an amazing book. So, in the book, yeah, uh, and I hope I can see this, hang on, let me pull it up on my uh, screen here. Sometimes when I make these slides, I like, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't compensate. I know you guys can see it, but it's hard for me to see it. Hang on one second. All right, so where it's highlighted, right? It's a uh, footnote 87. Talk about that this graph on the right, right? That symbolizes the stair, the ladder. I mean, you know, Jacob's ladder, we did a show on this a couple weeks ago. This is the journey that the Freemasons make. And um, yeah, so in the footnote 87 here, you say, you will see the structure of the 13 degrees of the York right of Freemasonry, right? And I'm going to explain what this means. Uh, considering the information we have disclosed so far, the 13 degrees on the ladder is no surprise. Notice that the words at the top illustrate, there you shall find light, right? When David Carrico presents this question, is this the same light that Jesus spoke of? You decide. And he references uh, John 8, 12. It says, then the mason... I'm sorry, then, God forbid, then Jesus spoke again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light of the life, right? So, that being said, right, just wanted to point that out. So, that's the, um, the ladder of the Masonic, you know, 13 degrees in the York Rite. Now, I want to explain what York Rite and Scottish Rite is. So, basically, here's, I should have brought up the graft. But this is a structure of Freemasonry, right? So there's 33 degrees in regular Freemasonry, right? Now, however, the first three degrees, these are ranks, by the way. The first three degrees is it's the Blue Lodge. It's a separate lodge from degree four and up, right? So the Blue Lodge, I call it, right? And um, the fourth degree up to the 33rd degree is called the Red Lodge, right? So in the Blue Lodge, there's um, three degrees. There's uh, um, Enter the Apprentice, uh, I forgot exactly. Uh, Enter the Apprentice. Um, and the, yeah, then the Master Mason's the third degree. I should have had that memorized by heart because I talk about this all the time. But there's three degrees, right? And in the Blue Lodge. And it's predominantly looks Christian. They got a Bible on the altar. Uh, they talk about biblical things a lot. All right. So, and a lot of uh, pastors belong to these, uh, priests belong to Freemasonry. And they really think it's a fraternity for God. That's what they get told. That's what they go told. That's what that means. You know, the symbol is they get lied to. All right. So basically, uh, in the Red Lodge, when you go to the Red Lodge, right, when you you know become a Master Mason, which you're not a Master Mason at all, it's just a name of the title, it makes you feel important. They use grand titles to make you feel like you're illuminated, you're you're important, right? <laughs> then when you graduate the Third Lodge, right, then when you go to the fourth degree, you have a choice to go. 
you have the choice to go to the left path or the right path. The left path is the York right. The right path is the Scottish right. And I know it's got a little, sound a little alien to a lot of people up there. And I know a lot of listeners know this stuff. So I just want to um, illustrate this uh, the best I can. You know what the funny part is? Uh, again, I, like I mentioned, uh, I wanted to join Freemasonry years ago. And that guy, they didn't because I started learning about it. And I started watching videos from Dr. William Schnoblin, and he was a former Mason. And then uh, my buddy, um, Doc Marquise, I started learning more about with those two guys. Then they got in and joined. And then I started doing my own research, years and years of research. Then they, I invited them on my show when I became a talk show host and everything else and had them on a million times, you know. And I talked to them both in private so many times. I learned so much information. And other Freemasons as well that left. The, the craft for a reason, right? So the the coolest part about this is that I know it goes, you know, Masons defend this, okay? They defend the craft. They'll say it's a conspiracy theory. They'll do anything they can because they take a sworn oath to defend this. Now, years ago, when it was back in the 80s, 70s, I'd probably be killed for talking about this, right? But the funniest thing is I tell these people, right? It's like, hey, you know what? Guess what? I didn't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, right? Go through years of rituals, years of stupidity, selling my soul out, to know this information because God opened my eyes to this. He did it right on time before I joined because I want to know what I was getting into, first of all. And uh, then I realized, wow, all right, yeah. No, nobody that's Christian, after, after going to you know, show this, right? Nobody who professes Jesus Christ as your Messiah, right? You have no business at all, at all, being in this organization, this craft. And we're going to show this to you. And again, I'm not trying to, um, you know, make everybody that's a Freemason out to be a bad guy because they're not, like I said. But the craft is led by, it's a Luciferian organization. We're going to show that tonight with your own documents. That's the beauty about this. So if you go into your own library at the lodge, right, you got to find this disgusting book. Um, I have one of these books here. And I actually, uh, when I was learning about Freemasonry, my girlfriend at the time, she worked at a book recycling company, right? So every time somebody, a person would die or somebody cleaned out a house and they got a old, bunch of old books, they would donate it to this company, right? So my girlfriend ran into a lot of these books, Masonic monitors, uh, this as well, all this other stuff, right? And she, anything like that, she would save for me and because uh, they couldn't sell the stuff. It wouldn't scan into the system and anything they couldn't scan, they tossed away or just took home, whatever the case. So I've come across lots and lots and lots of, and I still got them, this material in my library, right? So I've read Masonic material. And so this here, I got this book as well. And this is a complete spiritual filth, but it is in your library, guys, and in the Masonic lodges. So this man, uh, Confederate General Albert Pike, which, by the way, he was a, one of the creators. Uh, he was the big backbone of the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, he's also the creator of the 33rd degree because Freemasonry before him only had 32 degrees. He created the 33rd degree. Right. So in his book, all right. And uh, in his book, he talks about all this, right? And we're going to show you what he says about Freemasonry. It's not of God or anything you think it is, okay? So now, um, the 33rd degree, and that's a symbol of Mamun Ra. Mamun Ra is an Egyptian deity. And it goes back to that, and that's actually a demon right there. It's a double head uh, uh, eagle, a demonic one. It's um, Nephilim, too, yeah. <laughs> so it's the god of war and wealth. And he, Albert Pike chose this to represent the symbol of the 33rd degree for Freemasonry on the Scottish Rite, by the way. So, um, and it's over after Mamun Ra, this demonic Egyptian god, fake god, lowercase g. And if you notice the title, guys, um, where it says the gods of Freemasonry, you know, it's not a um, grammar error, no. It's spelled that way purposely, because I am not going to call them gods big g's, you know what I mean? <laughs> they're lowercase g's, that's it. Uh, because they're fake gods. So Mammon Ra is that chosen one. You know what? You, the, the coolest thing about this, check this out, right? What does the Bible have to say about this? If you go to Matthew 6, 24, right? And this popped in my head uh, last week when I was doing research for the show Friday, right? This came to my head. I don't know how, but the Holy Spirit, I should say. This came to my head, right? When I was studying this, you know, getting the stuff together, this came to my head and I pulled this up. Matthew 6, 24 talks about this, right? No man can serve two masters, 
for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one. This is Jesus talking. Matthew's taking count of this, right? And despise the other, right? So he's, Jesus is saying, no man will ever serve two masters. You can't serve two masters, plain and simple. And you cannot serve God and mammon. Wow. <laughs> is, that not, is that not prophetic? It is that not spiritual significance? And that's what they do in Freemasonry. You think you're serving God, but you're actually serving mammon. Tell me you can't make the stuff up. <laughs> like as Brian would say, right? So uh, Albert Pike goes on in his book, right? So, of course, I got this off of Freemasonry site, and uh, they try to make excuses for this. That's the thing. The thing is, Freemasons now, they have tons of websites and all of this stuff now to counter this stuff, right? They'll make every excuse in the world, and a lot of people buy into it, but they, they even the smart as they are, they still can't cover up for everything, right? So, anyway, um, Albert Pike, and this is also in his book, right? And he says that which we must say to the crowd, that's the people, the public, right? We worship a god. But is it the God that adores without superstition? To you, Sovereign Grand Inspector Generals, that's, uh, I think that's the 30th, uh, seven, yeah, I think it's the 33rd degree. The 33rd degree Mason, right? He's talking to them, right? So to the, the public, he's saying, right, we present that we worship a God. But it is that the God that adores without superstition. And to the Sovereign Grand General Inspector, uh, Inspector General, we say this, uh, to you that repeat it uh, to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degree. So he's addressing the fellow 33rd degree Masons. And it's a sovereign grand inspector general. So he's telling them to, to tell the 32nd, the 31st, and 30th degrees, right? The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai is also God. Adonai, which is Abba, which is our Heavenly Father, the Creator, right? So what is he saying here? How could Lucifer in God be God? Does that make any sense? You won't, eat, and I know you're for your Freemason, I'm a Master Mason, or I'm a, a into the Apprentice, or whatever, or a fifth degree, even a 20th degree, right? I don't know what you're talking about. We don't learn that in Masonry. You're not going to learn that in Masonry until you get to the 30th degree. Then you're going to dig back, oh, yeah, yeah, I think, remember that guy Dan telling me this, yeah. Or you could go into your library and look this up for yourself. They clearly say Lucifer is God. And they, they say uh, Adonai is God, too. What it is is, um, if you've ever seen the Baphomet, right? All right, and um, let me see if I get to this quick. The Baphomet. Wait till you see some of the stuff I got here coming. This has got a rock... Uh, I've been studying this stuff for years, guys, so it's like um, secondhand nature uh, to talk about this. So the Baphomet uh, represents a male and female deity, and, and if you notice the sun and the moon, right? The white, the light, I'm sorry, the light and the dark, right? It represents male, female, good and evil. And you ever see the yin yang, the yin yang symbol, right? Yin yang. Right, you know what that is, right? And this is why most Masonic floors are red and I'm sorry, black and white. And sometimes in the case they'll be silver and blue. But it represents ultimately uh the checkerboard. That's all Masonic floors, right? And what it represents is um as below as above, so below. Trying to get to find that one. I should have pulled this up. But when I do these things, it just like my, my mind wanders and I'm like trying to get a good illustration for you guys. So, as in the tarot cards, have the same thing. As above, so below. Long story short, it, they believe God, right, is both evil and good at the same time. They believe there's a balance in the universe. We get told that all the time, right? There's no balance in the universe. They believe just as good, powerful as evil is just as powerful. 
balance in the universe. You hear this in Star Wars and movies and everything else, right? Balance, right? The yin yang, you know, martial arts and all that. Balance, right? There is no balance. God is more powerful than evil ever could be, right? But in their reality, they think God and Satan are the same thing, right? And the same person, split personality. Also, they think God is a male and female in drug and a spirit. That's where that comes from. So, yeah. And I know if you're a Freemason and listen right now in low degrees, you're like, what in the hell are you talking about? Well, <laughs> yeah, this is from your own books, guys. Not a coincidence that a life of Levi, he was um, in the Knights Templar, the leader of the Knights Templar, and a Mason as well. He created this off an Egyptian horned deity. You notice how the goat has a pair of breasts and a penis right there with uh, snakes on I can get into all the symbolism with this, but I don't want to divert off the show here because you know, of the amount of time we have here. Yeah? So that's Oliver Pike, the creator of the KKK, also the creator of the 33rd degree for Freemasonry on the Scottish Rite. So, and now check this out, right? This verse, 2 Corinthians 11, right? This is his book, Morals and Dogma. I added this verse later, right? So, um... I I paste this verse. That's not in the, that's not in his um in the book whatever. So this Second Corinthians eleven says, and no marvel for Satan himself transforms into angel light. Right now this is what Al, uh, the Pike has to say in Morals and Dogma. Right, page sixty three. He says it is Satan attempting to clothe himself in the angelic vesture of light. That's <laughs> that's that right there. Admitting this, okay. So. And he goes on page 246, he says, The apocalypse is, to those who receive the 19th degree, the apothesis of the sublime faith, which aspires to God alone and despises all the pomps of the work of Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness, Lucifer. The son of the morning, it is he who bears the light, and with it, its splendors, intolerable, uh, blind, feeble, and sensual, and selfish souls. Doubt it not. For our traditions are full of divine revelation and inspirations, and inspiration is not of the age of the creed. And Plato and Philo also inspired, right? So they were also into the cult too. So he mentions Satan 22 times, Lucifer 6 times, and the devil 8 times. Just want to point that out in his book, right? And I've already done a show before people start saying, oh, Jesus and Lucifer are the same one. You know, there's lunatics out there. Even so-called Bible scholars, I, I did a whole show on that. And using the Bible, completely eradicating that stupidity. They were from two different bloodlines, first of all, right? They lived in two different eras, first of all. So they have nothing to do with each other at all. And Lucifer is a son of the morning star, right? One of the many, they don't tell you that there's more than one morning star. You find that in the book of Job. When the morning stars, all of them, dance together, right? So there's more than one morning star. Jesus is one of those morning stars. One of them. Not the morning star, but one of them, right? So we want to point that out. That's where they get the, um, the misconstru misconfiguration from. <laughs> So it's not just Albert Pike, and uh, we got Manly P. Hall, Manly Palmer Hall. He was a philosopher, well, if you want to call him that. <laughs> I don't revere any of these people's philosophers, but he was a very well-known Freemason as well. This book is also in your library, in the Masonic Lodges, and many other books by him and many other books by uh, Albert Pike. So I'm going to go through some of these books here from your own library to show you what masonry is about. So, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly P. Hall, right? Now, <laughs> page 35 and 36, right? He says, A true Mason is not creed-bound, but he realizes the divine illumination of his lodge that a Mason, as Mason there, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, Muhammad, and the same means for little. That he recognizes only the light, not the bearer. So, if you're a professing Christian, right? You say you believe in Jesus as the Messiah, right? And the Holy Bible is not a universal thing. The Catholic churches, it combines all those, but the Bible doesn't. The faith of Jesus Christ is, does not combine all these as a universal thing. And number one, the Bible says Jesus says he is the only light. He doesn't say Buddha is the light too, Muhammad is the light, or anybody else, right? He says he is the light. So if you're a professing Christian at this point, you'd be like, hold on, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you talking about? We were to recognize the light, it doesn't matter who the bearer is. That's what Manly P. all is saying, right? 
He worships at shrines, bows down before every altar. Um, professing Christians don't bow down at any altar, first of all. Let alone um, shrines and temples and everything else. Whether in a temple or mosque or cathedral, realizing with his true understanding that oneness of all spiritual truth, all true Masons know that the, they only are heathen too, who, uh, who have uh, great ideals, uh, do not live up to them. They know that the all religions are one, but one story told in diverse ways for people uh, whose ideals differ, but those great purposes harmony with Masonic ideals. So the Masonic Lodge is a universal religion, just like the Catholic Church. It's not a uh, coincidence, too. There's a lot of connections with them, right? <laughs> so regardless of what you heard, and yes, some Catholics oppose, uh, some popes did oppose Freemasonry, but ultimately they're, they're one and the same. And um, they're both into the Kabbalah. We'll get to this stuff, right? So Manly P. Hall, right, in page 78 in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, he says, when the Mason learns that the key is the proper application of a dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. That, if we were to end the show right now, like, we just think, right, we're done today, have a good day, see you guys Friday, whatever. If we were to end it right now, this right here, if you're a confessing Christian, right, that belongs to the Freemasonry, right, or thinking about it, that right there should say, hmm, yeah, I'm not going anywhere near that. And it's called the craft for a reason. It's witchcraft. So, there's more, yeah, page 18, he goes on to say, Freemasonry is a philo philosophy which is essentially creedless. It is the truer for it. Its brothers bow to the truth regardless of the bearer. He said the same thing as uh, Albert Pike did. Doesn't matter who the bearer is. Bow to it. So, a demonic force, you know, an entity appears in front of you, an unclean spirit, Lucifer himself. Well, listen to it. Doesn't matter who it is. Just listen to it. That's what they're saying. Now, <laughs> you open up your Bible, it doesn't say anything like that. He said, the, Jesus is the only light and the only, uh, and him and the Holy Spirit are the only ones you get information from. So they serve light instead of wrangling over the one who brings it. So instead of arguing about who brings it, just serve it. Yeah, that's what he's saying. And this way to prove that they are seeking to know better and will and dictate the invincible one. Who's the invincible one? Their fake God. Lucifer. Lucifer Adonai. That's who they think is, you know, the God, right? No true religion exists. They're not the world comradeship of brotherhood for the purpose of glorifying one God and building for him a temple constructive attitude of noble character. So they'll mention God, right? But again, we proved already, okay, that is not the God of the scriptures. They talk about an androgynous God who's both uh, male and female, and uh, Satan and God at the same time, right? So, uh, page 28, 29, I think I, yeah, I think I already talked about, and so if something sounds repetitive, I'll stop it, but um, yeah. All right, so um, when I told you um, at the beginning of the show, I showed you the Masonic symbol, one of many symbols you got to learn about, right? So they purposely lied to you along the way, and Manly P. Hall says this, right, page 28, he says the initiate brother, that's yes, when you first join the masonry, right, in the Blue Lodge, realizes that his so-called symbols and rituals are merely blinds fabricated by the wise to perpetuate ideas and yeah, incomprehensible too. Um, so yeah, the average individual. So he also realized that the few masons of today know and appreciate the mystic meanings concealed within these rituals. With religious faith and perpetuation of form, worshiping of instead of the life, and those who have not recognized the truth and crystallized ritual, who have not been liberated in spiritual gem for the shell of empty words, are not masons, regardless of their physical degrees and outward honor. So anyway, he goes on to say too, and I hope I put the slide in. If I don't, then it is in the book. He says masons are intentionally lied to, intentionally. You lie to about every symbol, every hand gesture, token, and that. Then you learn. Start, start to learn the real meanings as you progress. Then when you join Mason, even the Master Mason in third degree, they're not going to tell you, and you think you know it all. You think you're the cat, so I'm a Master Mason. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. You're just at the beginning of the lies. It's like joining high school. You get into high school, you're a freshman, you think you're on top of the world, 
And the juniors and seniors are like, yeah, pfft, get out of here, kid. You know, <laughs> if you want to put it in that perspective. So uh, Manly P. Hall says, the lost keys in, in his lost keys there. He says, they wander in darkness seeking light, right? Now, this is very particular, right? Talking about uh, the secret of Hiram Mabeth, right? And you'll learn about Hiram Mabeth. He was a servant in the Temple of Solomon, right? So he says, they wander in the darkness seeking light, failing to realize that the light in their heart is of darkness. They're in heart of the, I'm sorry, the light in their heart is of the darkness. So Jesus says he is the light, and he says the, the darkness does not comprehend the light, right? So why would a Christian, you know, a godly fraternity be telling you that the real light is in the darkness? Uh, that doesn't sound biblical to me. So, um, speaking of satanic and all that, um, Anton LaVey, he was a founder of the Church of Satan in 1966, right? So, in his book, he wrote the satanic Bible, the, sat the satanic rituals, right? He goes on, but by the way, he was a mason too, right? So, in his book, in uh, the satanic Bible, pages 144 to 146 there, yeah, and he says, uh, by now, even the most hardened of skeptics should be convinced that Freemasonry is Lucifer, Satan, worship. However, for those who still may need more convincing, let us consider the infernal names by which Masons mask its many references to Satan. In a Satanic Bible, we see 77 names by which the pagans have uh, referred to Satan over the centuries. And let us quickly review some of the infernal names of Satan found with the uh, masonry. Now, I didn't put it there. It's 77 different names, right? There's a lot of names that are used in Freemasonry. So, and um, then, they, like I said, with history, well, we'll get to some more quotes of the books and all that. So let's go into a little American history, right? And, um, yeah, <laughs> you guys got to be, like, rattled uh, if you don't understand this by now. Uh, what the Founding Fathers done to this, right? Now, I want to go on record, yes, a lot of the Founding Fathers were Masons. And like I said, uh, you know, not, not all Masons are bad people. They were all hoodwinked, right? So, um, and back when the Founding Fathers of this country established, right, when Masonic Order started to come here and all that, they were not infected by Illuminism yet because the Illuminati was just starting to affect the, the European lodges, Right? And by the time they got over here in 1776, um, I'm sorry, it was uh, years later in the 1780s when the Illuminati and the Jacobins and the Templars and all that all merged together. We're going to get into this. Then they infected the European lodges. We got the letters from George Washington we're going to show you too. But um, later on, John Quincy Adams, he was a sixth president of the United States, right? Now his father, John Adams, I believe was a Mason, right? And he was also, I think, the second president, whatever. But... um. No, was, yeah, I'm bad today with history. <laughs> it's just so much to remember. But his father was president, plain and simple. So uh, John Quincy Adams says, Freemasonry is deceptive and fraudulent. It promises of light, but its performance is darkness. And he says, Masonry to, ought to forever be abolished. Its wrongs essentially wrong a seed of evil, which can never produce any good, right? And he goes on to say, right, he goes, I do consciously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the, it is the greatest, uh, one of the greatest moral and political evils under which a union is now laboring. A conspiracy of the few against the equal rights of many, Masonry ought to forever be abolished. It's wrong and essentially wrong. A seed of evil which can never produce any good. And again, Freemasonry is deceptive and fraudulent. Its promises of is light. It's performances of darkness. And that's what you get uh, when you join Freemasonry, right? Uh, you get a told it's illumination. You're seeking light. Truth, right? And there's no truth in it at all. So, um, and sorry if a couple of these things sound repetitive, but um, uh, John Adams warned that lodges use, use of a Bible should, to be trained Christians, raise a red flag, Right? So he warned about the lodges, the use of their Bible. So they basically put it on the altar. The altar and the covers, by the way, when you see the Bible on the altar, right, if you're a mason, right, when nobody's looking, I want you to take that altar because it's on wheels, all of them are. So just move it slightly a little bit to the side, right, and look on the floor. Yeah. Because when you guys are not in your lodge, whatever the case, the people who are above you, right, 
They don't care about that Bible altar. They care about that star that's on that floor. That's called the blazing star. The, the dog star, too. The dog star or the blazing star. That's serious. That's the true deity. Okay, we'll get into that later. So, and uh, John Am says, if the candidate has been educated to the sincere and heartfelt reverence for religion and the Bible, and if he exercises his reason, he knows that all tales of Jashin and Boaz, which I'm going to show you what this means in a minute, a couple of minutes here, of Solomon's Temple, of Hiram, Biff, and Jubilee, and Jubila and Jubilom are impostors, po uh, poisons poured into the perennial foundation of truth, traditions exactly resembling the reprobate by Jesus Christ as making the word of God non-effect. Now, remember we talked about the seven, no, Anton and Ray talked about those 77 names that Masons use for Lucifer, Satan there? Yeah. Jubilee, Jubilee, uh, Jubilo, the, well, those are imposter names for God. And if you wonder what, um, and I'll show you later too, the what Jashin and Boaz is, right? There are two figures, and later on they uh, they erected two pillars in the Temple of Solomon, right? And you'll find this in the Bible too. Uh, the the two pillars, uh, one is called Jashin and Boaz. We're gonna show you what these mean later. So. So if you got this book, you got to try to get this book, guys. It's called Proof of a Conspiracy by John Robinson in 1798. Now, mind you, um, this is not a recent made book. This was actually written in 1798. And in fact, George Washington read this book. I think it was mass produced in 17, something like that. But it was the 1700s when he first read it. Then I guess it started going on production in 1798. I believe that's the case. But uh, George Washington writ, uh, wrote, uh, no, writ, um, yeah, excuse me, read this book, right? So we're going to show you that. So if you go to the actual, the actual Library of Congress right there, George Washington to Williams Russell, and he penned the letter in 1798. Actually, yeah, the same, yeah, all right? So George Washington got one of the first copies of this book by William Russell, right? Now, here's the thing, right? When I said back then, masonry wasn't affected yet by Illuminism. So what happened was George Washington, right, he learned about this. Now, yes, we're going to get into the Illuminati, right? And I know people roll their eyes when you talk about that. The Illuminati and masonry go hand in hand. So, and um, this is the Library of Congress, so you can go verify this, right? George Washington wrote to Reverend Schneider, right? And he's in Mount Vernon, September 25th, 1798, right? And he goes, sir, my apologies are due to you. For not my not uh, not acknowledge the receptor re receipt of your obligation in favor of the twenty second. So although um, and for not thanking you at an earlier period and for the book you had uh, goodness to send me. So he's taking uh, Schneider to that he sent him uh, this book. Yeah. So George Washington says I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plans and doctrines of the Illuminati, but never saw the book until you ple uh, pleased to send it to me, right? So he's never seen this book until you, uh, he was sent it. So the same causes have prevented my acknowledging of the receipt of your le uh, le yeah, letter and have prevented my reading of the book. Here until, namely, the multiplicity of the matters which pressed upon me before and in the uh, deliberating state in which I was uh, left after. So after he read this, he's like, well, all right. So a severe fever had been removed, and once allows me to add a little uh, more now, and now thanks for your kind wishes and favorable sentiments, right? So this is the time when George Washington was, like, getting sick. And anyway, he goes, except to correct the error you have run into in my uh, presiding over the English lodges of this country. So um, what he's talking about, because uh, William Russell, talk, because he knew... Um, George Washington was a, a Mason, right? And I guess he thought he was a full-time practice of Mason, right? So he says, I'm going to correct you, you know, on your error on this, right? And of my presiding, George Washington presiding over the English lodges of the country, right? And he goes, the fact is I preside over none. So I know Freemasonry, when you join Freemasonry, right, they're going to tell you, oh, George Washington was a Mason. And they have the show, actually, let me show this.
They'll show you pictures of George Washington with um, the apron on and everything. Right there. So, like, uh, they, like, make a lot of false claims in Freemasonry. They really do. Let me just get back to where it was. and So, um, yeah, he said, Judge Washington said, at this point, right, in 1798, he doesn't preside over any lodge at all. The fact is I preside over none or have been in one or more once or twice within the last 30 years. He was an honorary mason because he was, you know, who he was. They honored him, married, made him mason, right? But he's saying, I, I have not, I only been in there a couple times. Once or twice within the last 30 years. So I know there's a lot of um, conspiracies going about George Washington, but no, he was not a practicing mason. And I know because there's a lot of stuff built around George Washington, people don't even understand. So the Washington Monument, the original Washington Monument was scrapped. The Congress ran out of money, and uh, the Freemason Lodges took over the project, right? They completely revamped it to turn into the obelisk and everything else. So, and they revered George Washington, right? They even got him painted up in the Capitol as some kind of a god, a send the god, right? But the, the fact is that George Washington only went to two, lo <laughs> two lodge meetings in 30 years. So anyway, um, and I, I'm going to bats for George Washington at this one here. So um, again, he's already been to maybe once or twice within the 30 years. And I believe notwithstanding that the, none of the lodges of this country are contaminated with the principles ascribed to the Society of the Illuminati with respect, I am. So he's basically acknowledging, yeah, all right, because of this book um, here, Because uh, this book here, John Robeson was like a, almost like a secretary for Adam Weissup. Adam Weissup, he was the founder of the Order of Illuminati, the Bavarian version in Germany. Uh, because uh, I, I don't want to divert too much off the subject, but um, the Order of Illuminati was around longer than that. Uh, they started off in Rome, you know, with the Jesuit order, Ignatius Loyola. Uh, and the Pope at the time was like, yeah, you, you got to hide that, all right, because people start to make connections. So he created the Order of Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, which is nothing to do with Jesus at all, called the Jesuit Order, right? So it hid within the Order of the Jesuits, right? So later over the next couple you know, hundred years, when the Illuminati were really starting to get connected with Rome, people starting to say, oh, this is going on, right? Adam Weissap, not a, co not a coincidence that he was a Jesuit too. He was a professor in canon law, lived in Bavaria, Germany, by the way. He officially, publicly created the Order of the Illuminati to get the ties away from the Catholic Church, right? So <laughs> one of his buddies there had all his information and talked about, he, he blew the whistle. He was one of the first whistleblowers about this. Wrote a whole book on this. And I believe it cost him his life too. Uh, I got this book at home. It's been a while since I read it. But I would highly suggest if you want to know about the Illuminati and Masonic orders and all that, yeah, the Jacobins, the Druids, all the the, uh, the Knights Temple and all that, they've never went away. The Knights Temple were not abolished in the 1300s, okay? They went underground. Same thing with the Druids, the Jacobins, and uh, all the other secret societies. They all merged together, and we're going to show you that in a little bit. Actually, I can show you that now, uh, since we're on this here. Uh, so, in 1782, right, before this book came out, the, in the Congress of Wilhelmsbad, right, now, this is from a uh, traveling temple. They'll sit there and try to make light of it. So at the time, it was called the Grand Lodge, right? The, the Mother Lodge in, in England, right? So this uh, Congress of Wilhelmsbad in 1782, right? So this is years now uh, after all these organizations, whatever, started, you know, so-called being killed off, whatever the case, right? So, and this is when... Crap was really heating up with the Illuminati, right? So what they did was they met all in this big Congress. They had representatives of the Druids, the, Druids, the Jacobins, the Templars, Masonry, the high levels, by the way, and uh, Illuminati and all them, right? And all these groups. They merged together in one, con um, one Congress, right? Now, this is what um, John Robeson talks about this, right? So he talks about this right here. He says... Um, this is exactly this uh, 1782 Congress of Wilhelmsburg, right? So they, all these organizations, they said, all right, we need to hide. We need to be hidden in plain sight, so to speak, right? 
So they chose Freemasonry, which at the time was called the, the Mother Lodge. Everybody knew about it. Nobody at all batted an eye toward the Mother Lodge. Everybody knew it. They just thought it was a fraternity, you know? So on page 112 of his book there, Proves of Conspiracy, he says, The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never ever appear in any other place in its own name, but always covered by another name. In another occupation, none is fitter than the three lower degrees of Freemasonry. The public is accustomed to it. And that's the Blue Lodge, by the way, the so-called Christian Lodge. Yeah. No, yeah, it's right there. None is fitter than the lower th three degrees of Freemasonry, and the public is accustomed to it, it expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. And next to this, uh, the form of learn of uh, literacy society is best suited on purpose and had had freemasonry not existed this cover would have not been employed and it may uh, be such more than a cover and he goes on to talk about it some more so he's saying basically what they had to do in this council right they had to all join together number one they had to hide they had to become a secret society within a secret society and the the, the blue lodge right most of these people are good people. They're all good people. You know, and, and uh, you know, pastors and all that stuff. And, yeah, and people, you know, so you're supposed to be having a lot of faith in God and everything, right? Yeah. They hid within there. So they could never, ever be acknowledged. And the people in the Blue Lodge have no clue that these the guys even exist. They hide within the secret society. It's in the circle within the, uh, in the circle. So the public perception is the Blue Lodge Masons are good people. They do a lot of uh, charity and all that stuff. But these dark people hide within that order. And this was uh, 1782. This happened in the Council of Wilhelm's bed. So back to Albert Pike. He's got a book uh, called you know, Morals and Dogma and his other book called A Bridge to Light. So Morals and Dogma, he says, page 817, the world will soon come to the U.S. for sovereigns and prophets, and we shall constitute the equilibrium of the universe and be rulers over the masters of the world. And Albert Pike was an Illuminati. And I know colleges, the funny thing, this is the most hilarious thing, right? The funny thing is, right, <laughs> the colleges, if they talk about it, if you go to university or whatever, they'll, they'll bring up some world history. And if they, you know, the Illuminati gets brought up, they'll say, oh, oh, oh they're, they were once a secret society that once existed. They, they, they died out in 1785, right? Hmm. Yeah, if they died out in 1785, then why was John Quincy Adams and other people in uh, the late 1700s, say 1790s or so, even the 1800s, talking about them? As posing a threat to this nation. Why would they say that if they died out in 1785? Because they didn't. They went underground in the Continental of their own bed. Congress, I mean. So in the Bridge of Light in his book, right, page 291, he says, Freedom marches ever onward toward the conquest of the world. This is world domination plan. And this book here, Proofs of Conspiracy, he reveals the, their plans for global dominance. And they were completely funded by the Rothschild family. Now, today, the World Banks, they're the Illuminati. The Council on Foreign Relations, today, we have the CFR and uh, the Trilateral Commission. Those are the political spectrums of the Illuminati. I know it's a lot to digest and uh, absorb. So, um, in, in page 325, he says, Such, my brother, is a true word of Master Mason, such as a true royal secret, which makes possible in uh, shell at length, make real, holy empire, and true Masonic Brotherhood. So, and um, now, Albert Packy, Packy, <laughs> Albert Mackey, okay, uh, it's called Mackey's Book of Encyclopedia there. It's a, Maso Ma yeah, I got the encyclopedia. It's a big two-book uh, series. But um, these encyclopedias are in your lodge too, right? So it's Albert Mackey, he was a 33rd degree Mason. Uh, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, page 619. Hang on, let me get a drink. I'm stuck here. Tongue tied there. So he says, The religion of Masonry is not sectarian. It admits men of every creed. It's not Christianity. So, yeah. That Bible on the altar when you first walk into a blue lodge, right? Yeah. Nothing to do with that Bible. That's just, that's there for, for charade. That's all. 
It is not Christianity. Its religion is that general one of nature and primitive revelation, handed down to us from some ancient and patriarchal priesthood. So Freemasonry is a merger of many philosophies and all that stuff. Uh, cultism, all Eastern mystery religions, all merged together, New Age religion. And ultimately, Luciferian. That's... <laughs> So, and Albert Pike and Morris Dogma says, um, Freemasonry is an ancient mystery religion based on the Judaic Kabbalah. The old primitive faith that is a Freemasonry religion is derived from the ancient pure Kabbalah. So now, when I mentioned earlier about the androgynous God being both male, female, good and bad, right? Yeah. And Kabbalah, if you, if you knew anything about Kabbalah, you'd be like, hmm, that sounds familiar. Yeah, because it's exactly the prime religion of the D religion, the head at the top of the pyramid, right, of Freemasonry is the Kabbalah. It's not Christianity. It's not any of those other religions. It is Kabbalah. They believe in a universal God, an androgynous God, and they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They believe the Holy Spirit's female, which is complete blasphemy. And now the, the scriptures say, right, right in the scriptures, there's two unforgivable sins, those who take the mark of the beast, and the, the biggest one is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be forgiven. Jesus himself said, you could curse me. You could blast me all you want. Yeah, I could forgive you for that. You could blast for the Father, right? I could forgive you for that. But you blast me the Holy Spirit, you would not be forgiven. Not in this world or the next one to come. Makes it very clear. And that's exactly what these people do. These people are pure evil. Now people say, oh, you're being anti-Semitic. Now this is the dark side of Judaism. Ancient evil to, a core, to the core. Right, so Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry, right? That's another um, book you might want to look into. That's uh, right in your Freemason lodge, and it goes all do all the rituals. It's all mis it's all uh, Luciferian. And this book here by Tex Mars, right? He was another um, guy, God rest his soul, a pastor, uh, just like David Carrico. Uh, when it comes to Freemasonry, these guys are on top, exposing it. So in this book called Voices from the Dead, right? Uh, page 87. So here, reiterated, is my summation of what the Freemasons and whom is worshipped, right? Uh, so Freemasonry is an ancient mystery religion involved in the worship of Satan and inferior deities through Kabbalistic rituals and doctrines taught by the lodges. And notice again the several elements of Freemasonry. Because they use elemental magic and everything else. And uh, that's into witchcraft and all that stuff, right? Oh, let me get to my slide two. So we're on to slide set two, right? So in his book, page 52, uh, he shows you this um, this guy here. And this guy is, uh, I, I always butcher his name, but I don't really care. Um, uh, Rabbi Samian Bar Yoshi. Yoshi, whatever, I just call him Yoshi. <laughs> so um, this guy here, who's was a Jewish artist and conception of a famous Rabbi uh, Simeon Bar Yoshi, second century author of the Kabbalah and the Zohar. Yoshi, according to both the Jewish Encyclopedia and Wikipedia, is described as a preeminent and anti-Gentile preacher. He is quoted in the Talmud in saying that the best of Gentiles kill is Kabbalistic works of the basis for the doctrine of Freemasonry. He is honored in Freemasonry's, um, was that ninth degree? Hang on a second, let me get that right, because I got my little graphic over. Hang on a second, let me move that quick. Oh, I'm sorry, 30th degree. So he's, uh, this guy here, he's on the 30th degree, the Knight of Kodash. That's the, the name of the, the degree, right? So, um, this is the stuff you got to, I mean, especially if you're a new Mason, guys, or join, you, whatever. This is what you got to experience when you get to the dark degree. Stuff gets bizarre. You start talking to dead men in coffins. So this airy scene is a painting of the part of the 30th degree ritual of Freemasonry painted by uh, this guy here in New Mexico. The painting shows that the catacomb-like interior of the lodge and the three strange fingers wearing black robes and hoods there on the altar at right of three skulls. There's uh, three skulls at the right of the altar. Right there. I don't know if you can see it to the right. Uh, see that altar on the right? Right above is three little skulls. 
So, um, page 56, uh, text says, uh, the Masonic drawn symbolizes ba Rabbi Bar Yoshi as he speaks to the 30th degree candidate from his coffin. So, um, David Carrico as well, uh, he talks about this too. He actually did a whole midnight ride on this, uh, that the, the dead man in the coffin ritual, it's a 30th degree, right? It's a ritual you have to do. When you become a, to become a 30th degree Mason, this is a ritual you have to go through. And you need to, this dead man in the coffin speaks. It's a demonic spirit. But it symbolizes uh, Rabbi Bar Yoshi. This is some wicked stuff, guys. Necromancy. The Bible forbids this stuff big time. You don't speak to the dead. That's right in Deuteronomy 18. I don't even need to pull that up. You should pull that up on yourself. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 18 completely says you don't do this stuff at all. You don't do divinization. You don't do any kind of form of witchcraft, speak to the dead, uh, pass children through the fire, anything like that. And most of that stuff is exactly what they do in Freemason lodges. And um, this book here is Deosophical Kabbalah by Rabbi uh, Shimi and Bar Yoshi. And that acquaintance to uh, Madam H.P. Wolowski, she had a book called Deosophy too. And all these dictators over the years, like uh, Adolf Hitler, right? He was a student of Theosophy as well. Also a student of, um, he loved Aleister Crowley as well. And then he, what he did was he created his own cult in the Nazi movement. It was called Ariosophy. It was a combination of Theosophy, um, all kinds of um, eight, uh, Eastern religions and all that, Eastern uh, mysteries and all that, combined it all together. And he was also a member of the Thule Society and uh, the Real Society, which were Illuminati factions. And he was also as a Mason as well. That's what drives these uh, top world dictators. This is very evil, guys. And this is right in the heart of Freemasonry. And this book here by uh, W.W. W. Westcott, uh, found the Foundations of the Freemasonry Studies, the Kabbalah of Freemasonry. Talks about, yeah, the whole core of Freemasonry at the top of the pyramid, all right, is Kabbalah. It's a satanic, literally satanic as it comes. You don't get any more satanic than the Kabbalah. So now we move on to the symbols, right? And we all heard this all the time. I did shows on, two shows on this, me and John Pounders. From Night TV. TV. Um, this is so-called the Star of David, right? Nope. Yeah. No Star of David. Let me see if I got those. Yeah, well, if you go to Amos 5, right? Let me see. Um, Amos... Five stars of your God. Hang on a second. So Amos 5, right, and Acts 7 talks about this, right? They call this the star. That's not the star, by the way. I don't know why they put that in the picture. They call it the star of your gods. It's the star of Raphim and the star of Moloch. And it's this star here, what people call the star of David. Now, <laughs> if you read the Torah, right, you'll never see David at all had any star. And again, the Bible calls this uh, the star of Moloch, the star of Raphim. So uh, when I uh, was good friends with uh, Doc Marquise before he passed away, uh, Doc Marquise used to practice this heavy, heavy dark magic, right? He told me, because you got the two pentagrams, you got the left and the right pentagram, the, you know, the left path and the right path. It's a pentagram pointing up, pentagram pointing down, right? Now... Um, those are pentagrams, right? And people think they're evil. They are very evil. The goal of Mendes and everything else. But he told me, all right, when he was into the stuff and saying the same thing, um, Bill Schnobel, right? He, they told, both told me that most evil talisman, it's a symbol, right? The old most evil talisman, all the occult is this right here. You don't get any more evil in this symbol right here. And you ask, well, why is it on the Jewish flag then? Because the Revelation chapter two and three talks about the fake Jews profess to be Jews, but they're not. They belong to the synagogue of Satan. Those are the clowns who formed Israel. Now, no, that does not represent all the Jews in Israel. No, 
The real Jews didn't want that back then. They wanted the menorah. But guess who put that on the flag? Yeah, back to the Illuminati, back to the Rothschild family. They're the ones who founded, paid the money to found the state of Israel again. And of course, the United States was the first country to recognize Israel. Then they told the church, oh, no, no, the Bible says you've got to support the Jews. They take it out of context. You know, we don't, we don't have to kiss Israel's ass. That's not what the Bible says. And the Bible's talking about spiritual Israel. David Carrico pointed that out, right? But, yeah, and Freemasonry runs rampant in that. This is, and here's the thing, right? You got to see the star everywhere. In Hinduism, Catholicism, especially in Catholicism, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, Freemasonry, you know, they're all over the place of Freemasonry. The Mormon Church, Satanism and Gnosticism. Not a, not a coincidence that they all have that star embedded everywhere. That is not the star of David, you guys. And people say, well, this one's interwoven, that one's, it doesn't matter. That star is pure evil as it comes. That is the heart, soul of Freemasonry right there. Now, we, you know, the, the OCNI, this is one of the most famous, famous um, symbols in the Masonry, right? When you first joined the Masons, they told you the Eye of Providence, right? Providence means God's care. Yeah, the Eye of God, right? He's watching over us, right? That's a lie. Because later on, you get told, oh, no, 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 it's not. It's actually the Eye of Horus, which is Tammuz, right? Then you got, you know, I think before that, I'm sorry, you get taught the New Age version. What they do is, here's the thing. They want to mold you into a perfect cornerstone, right? So you're a block to them, right? So they welcome people. Uh, if you're an atheist, it's real hard to go to the ranks of masonry. They want somebody to, you have to have a DD, right, to join from masonry. Because, and if you're into the occult, you got to fly through the ranks like no tomorrow. You'll be right at the top before you know it. Now, for um, Christians, it's a little harder to, you know, mold them. So what they'll do is they'll uh, take, uh, you know, let's say this is God and um, the Freemason logo with G, that's God. Oh, look, look, there's a Bible on the altar too. They talk about Hiram Biff. They talk about uh, um, uh, uh, King Solomon and all that, right? This is so biblical. This is awesome, right? And they'll lie about history, you know, false information, right? Oh, even George Washington was a practice of Mason. No, he wasn't. He only had to do lodges in 30, 30 years. <laughs> so they'll tell you a bunch of these lies, right? Thinking this is a great fraternity. Then what they'll do is you progress into the Red Lodge, right? Depends what path you take. Most um, Christian professors and Masons go to the right path. The left path, uh, they call it Satan's path. Pass there, right? Uh, the people, the occultists go strictly to the left. It's the fast way up to the top. That's the York right. They'll take the Scottish right uh, that perceives to be Christian, but it's not, right? Then you start learning less and less of biblical stuff. It's out of the way, right? Then you start learning, no, 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 that's... That's the third eye. That's where they inject New Age into it. That's why most of these Christian churches today are all hijacked by New Age occultism, a universal religion. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. Freemasons, right? Priests, right? So this third eye and the penile gland, right? It's you, your own God. That's where they put you to be, right? And they'll, they'll lie about the Bible and you know, take Bible scripts out of uh, context to say, oh, no, no, God's in us, so we're, we're God too. They'll give you that New Age approach. So they'll take you from a, a God-loving, God-fearing uh, Christian, right? And they'll mold you into a New Age type person, right? Now when you're into that New Age, right, then they slowly indoctrinate you. It's like, well, that eye is actually of Horus, Tammuz, which was the son of uh, Osiris Nimrod, right? And when you learn, <laughs> yeah, this goes so so deep. And uh, I encourage you to, William Schnobel's book, Masonry Beyond the Light, he talks a lot about this stuff. Exposes a lot of Freemasonry, right? So he talks about this, and we'll get back to those um, DDTs in a second here. So the Mighty Dead, he says, uh, such men would be offered immortality and godlike wisdom. In common with the most other Gnostics type cults, right? And that's what Gnostic saw. It's like a New Age cult. It's, uh, they go, you know, deep into the Kabbalah, right? The Palladium taught that the serpent told the truth in the God of Need, and basically the candidates were exposed to five step program of Palladium. Palladium, right? So what that is, it's like um, they again they worship Lucifer. They get told that um, the serpent in the garden was revealed. He was the, he was re rebelling against God because he was doing it for our 
uh, he was advocating for us to know the truth. That's where the, the core of Gnosticism is. They believe that the serpent was the good and God's the evil one from withholding knowledge from us. That's what they believe, right? Which is false. And uh, I'm sorry, right at the top where it says the mighty dead. He goes, what would you offer? We, what could you offer to one who already had reached the pinnacle of masonry? Uh, many of most already had wealth and power, and the only enticement of in any power would be the ancient one. And uh, remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, he says, you shall not surely die. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, if you eat the fruit, right? So what they do is they advocate, advocate for the serpent. So I'm not going to go over all uh, seven steps here, but uh, one step is adoption. This is where the mason is brought into a fellowship of Lucifer. He is guided into swearing an oath and being yoked to the temple of Lucifer. Ultimately, he is led into making a pact with Lucifer. This is basically selling their soul to the devil. And the mason promises to surrender himself. And so it surrenders the body, soul, and spirit to Lucifer, usually for a period of seven years. Uh, in return, Lucifer promises to grant him all the worldly desires. Selling your soul. That's what they do with musicians in Hollywood, right? Yeah, same thing. And after the seven years are up, if he has been a good servant, Lucifer will give him another seven years. And if he has failed in some fashion, his life is taken. That's why you see a lot of stars who claim to be in the cult. Uh, I think it's uh, the age of 27, um, the 27 club, that all these famous people died at the age of 27, I believe. 27 or 29, uh, don't quote me on that. Then number two, right, he says, illumination. Through the drugs and occult techniques of the seers, the so-called dirt eye, which I just got done talking about, the all seeing eye, this is where they start telling you the dirt eye is not of God. The dirt eye, it's a dirt eye that would be open, not just partially, as in physics, but completely. This eye is called the agenda chakra, right? Now, this goes into the um, uh, kundalini, the dark side of yoga, right? The kundalini and the chakra, right? The dirt eye. It is felt to the point of contact between humans and Luciferian consciousness that it is supposedly located in the forehead above and between the two visible ears. And we just got done talking about that. This is, this is where they start molding you from a God-believing omnipresent God to um, that, you know, Jesus is nothing but a consciousness. They call it the Christ consciousness, that he's not a physical being, it's just a consciousness in the universe that we can harness and be God's ourselves. That's what they preach like, in the New Age, which is not true, by the way, guys. So they mold you from a Christian into a New Age type Christian, which is uh, oxymoron, if you ask me. There's no such thing as a New Age Christian. <laughs> no such thing as a pagan Christian. No such thing as uh, a Christian witch. So, uh, page 185, he says, to open the eye a little bit is to experience f uh, phys psychic power. So, when you open the eye to experience the psychic powers, to open the eye completely is to have your brain flooded with the pure consciousness of Lucifer himself. This is why one of the Masonic symbols of the all-seeing eye, it is the symbol of illumination. This is Satan's counterfeit for being born again. In, in it, you acquire a personal relationship with Lucifer. You begin to think his thoughts and see what he, with his eyes. And you begin to look at humans the way he does. And it's not a pretty experience. Now, William Schnobel went through this stuff, guys. Just want to point that out, right? Let's see where my time is here. So I just want to point that out, right? And uh, so... And the same thing, with, we're going to do show, more shows on a New Age cult that hijack Christianity. So the thing is, these uh, New Ages, they, 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 they meditate and use the third eye like this, and they believe they're talking to Jesus. They see an image of Jesus, but it's not him. Uh, this guy, Guan Quindalini, I can't pronounce his name, it's one of the ascended masters, they call him, right? And they say Jesus is an ascended master. Then you learn, no, that's not Jesus you're talking to. This is Lucifer. Satan, if you will, right? So... Um, this is like what I was trying to explain. Like, if you could look at the bottom, right? You got the enter the apprentice is the first degree. Fellowship craft is the second degree. A master mason is the third degree. That's in the blue lodge, right? Then the right path is a Scottish right. The left path is the York right. 
you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You yeah, got all these degrees uh, up to the up the ladder there. And then you got all these, uh, and that's a quicker way up the ladder to the thirty third degree. And those who stay like Christian, like they'll, and that's a cultic side, the York right. This right here is, um, you know, and they slowly mold you from. Again, I say if you're a cultist, you'll, you'll extend real quick, but. They want to take you away from Christianity, get you into a new age lie of it, then turn you into to believe in these Eastern religions, then turn you into a Luciferian. That's what it does. It molds you into that perfect cornerstone for them. So this is the ranks of Freemasonry. The path of Freemasonry. That's where it goes. And then these are the many lodges too, guys. There's um there's a blue lodge like we talk about, the Scottish right and the York right of Freemasonry, right? then the Shriners, right? You heard about the Shriners? They donate to the burn victims' hospital. I want to point out too, yeah, that's all they do good. All these things have philanthropy pages to present to the public. They do good things, and it, yeah, it does do good things. But what it does, it conceals to the evil stuff that they do. Very evil. Then you got the Grand Sovereign Inspectors General, the thirty third degree, right? Then you got the Supreme Council of Grand Sovereign Inspectors General. Then the Order of the Trapezoid. Then the Ancient Primitive Rite of Memphis Mizoram. That's what, uh, 97 degrees. Uh, William Schnobel was a 97 degree. It goes beyond, okay? Then most Masons have no clue that these didn't exist. And if you notice, there's a pecking order when you're going up the ladder. Like a Blue Lodge member, they would never know anything when an order of trapezoid. They have, would have never clue anything up there and more. You're not even told about these things until you reach a certain level. Then there's the Order of Temple Orientis, the OTO that was created by Alistair Crowley. Right, you got the Palladium, you got the Illuminati, the Nine on No Men, the Seven. And I forgot what the T G A O T O stands for. And yeah, <laughs> and you got Lucifer himself. That's U.S. Masonry. There's little variations between, and now the symbol, right? And then, yeah, there's little variations between you know which country, whatever the case. They got slight variations, but generally the same. So. um yeah, and that's not God. It's not Gnosis. Yeah, it's Gnosis to Lucifer. That's what it is. The seething lights of Lucifer, as we learn from famous Freemasons, right? And you got uh, the Masonic symbols of King Solomon's Temple, right? And this is Albert Mackey and a couple other Masons wrote this book, Foundations of Freemasonry Series, right? Everything's built around, and that's why the temples, uh, the, the lodges are built just like, just about symbolizing King Solomon's temple, right? And if you all recall, uh, King Solomon didn't end up as a good guy, all right? God quickly took his power away from him. He allowed his enemies to overthrow them and destroy the temple. Remember that, right? Yeah, nobody had wisdom like Solomon. God granted this guy so much wisdom, right? But what he did, he started turning to the dark side. He started seeking, uh, doing these um, rituals that talk to demonic spirits and all that. Yeah, he became corrupt real quick. So I talked about these pillars here, the pillars of Jashin and Boaz. You'll learn about them in the Bible as well. Let me see if I can pull this up here in one second. Just trying to read this. It's uh, yeah, in First Kings chapter 7, 2 Chronicles 3. And because of the sake of time, I don't have time to read all this, guys. So if you want to do some extra reading on that, um, then you'll learn what these uh, pillars are. So now, like I said before, like they'll take biblical stuff, right? And they'll put their occultic perverted twist to it. Then they'll actually start worshiping these things. And you see these temples everywhere. There are these pillars everywhere in the Masonic Lodges. And there's, um, you know, Masonic Tracing Board, they call it. That's, um, see the B for Boaz and Jashin? The light in the dark, as above, so below. God and Satan, same thing, they, could they call it? This is so full of symbology, I could be here for like 20 minutes explaining this, yeah. And this is why the Masonic floors are like this. Now we get into, we talked about that star on the floor, Yeah. See that altar right there? You don't see the altar in, in um, Blue Lodges. And uh, let me actually, hold on a second. Let me um, 
get a better illustration of this here. Uh, So, um, like I said earlier, right, you see this blue lodge, right, and up on the altar, right, they have this pretty little Bible, right, with the square and compass on it, it's always on it, right, to make it look like that's, you know, the Bible is the supreme deity, whatever the case, right, but under this, under this um, altar here, right, like I said, when you move the altar away, and it, the floors vary, you know what I mean, they're, they're always, you see the blue and white, the black and white, it's the same thing, it symbolizes uh, equality, and duality at the same time. Uh, equal, you know, uh, they call it equality in the universe, right? <coughs> hey, let me get the, um, let me see. Sonic floor. So now when you move that altar away, there's a star on the floor. What is that? There's always a star on the floor, right? Yeah. And see that altar that moves? It covers a star during the Blue Lodge. And the Red Lodge is, yeah, that star on the floor is called the Blazing Star. It's the Dog Star Sirius. And it's highly worshipped, <laughs> highly worshipped in uh, masonry. And that's when the Masons, when he took over the project to build D.C. And um, his um, Washington, Judge Washington's uh, monument, right? And it's not a coincidence that they, they constructed the monument 555 feet tall going up. And the base goes on the ground, 111 feet on the ground. It's 666 feet. 555 is a symbol for death and resurrection. It's a numerology, gematria. And see the blazing star? The blazing star goes exactly over the Capitol. Over the, we did a whole show on this as well. So I encourage you guys to go check that out for further information. But all this stuff is by design. Pleiades and Orion, the blazing star, it's all connected, guys. 33 degrees in the arc and all that. This is all, all connected, all of it. And it's all symbolized around three people. Samaramis, Nimrod, and Tammuz. Back to the Tower of Babel. That's what Nimrod was considered basically the first mason. The great builder. So Nimrod, his also name is Osiris. The, the, the Egyptians called him Osiris. He was called Gilgamesh and other uh, things. And, um, you know, John, uh, Gary Wayne's book, <laughs> we always call him Gary Wayne, John Wayne, I mean, Gary Wayne, um, his book, um, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, he gives you all the names that um, Nimrod had, and different cultures, because when the Tower, the Tower of Babel crumbled, right, and God told people, to be fruitful and multiply, go, go into the earth and multiply, right, they didn't want to do that, they said, we're going to stay here, we're going to build the Tower of Heaven, right. Defied what God told them to do, that's why God said, destroy the, um, the Tower, right, and confounded their languages, and they took off to uh, other lands, right? So the thing is, all these Eastern religions, to simplify it, right? Because people say, well, how do you know your God's your only God? There's thousands of gods. Well, yeah, easy way to find that. Because all those thousands of so-called gods, right? You narrow them down, most of them are these three people, right? Yeah. Then you narrow it down some more, you come to find out the other ones are either Nephilim or fallen angels. So, how do I know my God's the only one? Because, yeah, my God's the only one, the infallible God. Because all those so-called gods and all that, they're just the same people. They're like, when all the cultures split, right, they took this Babylonian religion, they took splinters of it, and, of course, they had different names with their own language for these same people. Variations were mainly the same story. And, yes, they all counted for the flood, the giants, and the whole nine gods. So, Samaramis is known as Isis and Ishtar and all that, right? Tammuz, the sun god, right, is Horus, which is his birthday. When December 25th comes, you're you're not honoring Jesus. You're on this guy right here. And he's also um, also part of the whole Valentine's Day thing, too. He's the Cupid. Very disgusting, perverted holiday. And Rome, I, and Rome just picked up and everything. Everything that Babylon did, Rome is that today. But they disguise themselves with the Catholic Church as um, a Christian church. Constantine merged the two things together. And real Christians never followed the Catholic Church back then. So, But regardless, this is um, the heart and soul of Freemasonry.
Their goal is to build, a, not, not just Solomon's Temple, but build the Tower to Heaven. It's a Luciferian organization. And John 8.32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So, Freemasons, yeah. He doesn't say Buddha. He doesn't say Muhammad. Doesn't say anybody else, right? Doesn't say Lucifer. He is the light. And no, him and Lucifer are not the same. And John 16 says, in 13, 14, How bet when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide us all into truth, and he will shall not uh, speak of himself, but whoever shall hear, that shall he speak, and when he shall uh, show you these things to come, he shall glorify me and shall receive of mine and shall spew, uh, show him, sorry, unto you. That's the Holy Spirit he's talking about. And the Holy Spirit is not a woman. All right, that's pure blasphemy. Because how could a holy, yeah, uh, a female in the Holy Spirit impregnate Mary? Makes no damn sense. That's pure blasphemy. <laughs> so Matthew 10, 20, uh, yeah, 10, 26, 27. Fear them that not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness there, that speak ye in the light and what you hear in the ear that ye preach upon the housetops. So in other words, Jesus said, I have kept nothing in secret. Yeah. And that's everything about Freemasonry is all secrets. Secret, secret, secrets, and most of them are lies until you get to the, law, the highest degrees. Then you learn those so-called secrets were lies. So guys, if you like the show here, we got a PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App. And also in the chat room, we got a donation page here. If you, and you don't even have to sign up for nothing. It's cool. Just go on the page, whatever you want to donate, and uh, just use whatever card. You know, you don't have to sign up for nothing. It's awesome. So that's in the chat room there, and that helps support our operation and our um, uh, ministry here. So thank you guys for doing that. And um, so we got, do got to get going here. And please, guys, if you want to know more about Freemasonry, David Caraco and his wife there, they are the kings, okay, and queen of exposing Freemasonry. Like, nobody does it better uh, than David Caraco. I'm going to say it hands down. Um, you could check him out in nystv.org, all their videos. And uh, you know, nice TV and everything else. That's a paid network. They got the stuff on YouTube for free too. But all this stuff that's been taken off YouTube because of the content, it's all on the network, uh, nystv.org. And if you want 30 days free, no obligation, just go there, sign up. You don't even have to enter credit card right away. Just put Dan the Man right there, promo code, Dan the Man, lowercase one word, and in, uh, in the promo code, and you get 30 days free. Tons of spiritual warfare stuff, guys. And, um, yeah, thank you guys for joining me. And uh, so, what's up, uh, Uncle? You know, Uncle, obviously. Yeah, thank you, brother. And, uh, yeah, good stuff, man. This is an awesome show. And I wish I had more time to score more details. And Because when you get to the Illuminati, man, whoo, that's another rabbit hole. That goes, woo, way deep. <laughs> way deep. So, man, uh, yeah, and, uh, and again, God bless you guys. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. And my buddy uh, in the chat room, DJ G, he's like a historian, too. Uh, so, um, me and him will talk a little bit about this earlier. But, and again, um, and I know a lot of people like to criticize George Washington, but, man, um, that guy, again, he only attended a handful of meetings. And it's even said, I'm trying to find the proof of that, that he denounced Freemasonry in his deathbed. And there's other letters, too, he wrote. Um, I even forgot to pull those up. Uh, he talked about the infiltration of Illuminati when he finally learned. This is years later after the um, 1789. Uh, you have that book there? Yeah, let me do, double check that. Yeah. 1798, okay? Right, and before he died, he knew about the infiltration of Illuminati. And he was concerned about it. He was warning American lodges that the, the Illuminati, that's, and he said they infiltrate all of the European lodges, and they have come here. He warned the American Masons about that because his, uh, I think it was Jedediah or whatever, um, that he was a Mason, you know, and he, he tried to warn them about the infiltration of the nefarious Illuminati. And that's also, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember where I could reference that. But you can find that in the Library of Congress, too. And it's all there. You know what I mean? It's crazy, right? You go to the Library of Congress, all the stuff that's so-called like conspiracy theory that the History Channel lies about, that these blokes that um, make these shows 
um, that you know they they bring some stuff up just to get you tuned in and they'll you know like I said the History Channel and other networks like that and Masons do this too. They'll do that and what they'll do is they'll because they know it's uh, this is uh, all public stuff now, right? So what they'll do is they'll bring it up too, right? Then they'll make a mockery of it. That's a way of covering up the information. So again, to people out there with Freemasons, I just hope and pray that this program today, and if you go to FOJCRadio.com, uh, there's plenty of material on there. Like David Carrico, he can help you with this stuff too. Um, he'll invite you to call him. And uh, to prove that Freemasonry is, and no, you can't take it over. Now I know people say, well, I'm a Freemason, maybe I can bring light into Freemasonry, real light into Freemasonry. No, you can't. You cannot do that. Freemasonry is designed for evil, for evil purposes. And they, their intent is to turn you, that's why they say they want to mold you into the perfect cornerstone. The way you're created, God created you beautiful. Doesn't matter if they call you this block. Masons know what I'm talking about, right? Then they're going to call, carve you into that perfect cornerstone. No. The way you are is the way God made you. It's perfect. They want to coin, uh, carve you into something that God forbids you to be. So if I could say anything to you right now, I would say denounce Freemasonry right now. There's, and there's an organization out there, I believe, I think, out in Washington State, uh, if I can remember. Um, it's called uh, Former Masons for Christ. I don't know if they're still around, but there was an organization. They had hundreds of Masons that used to be Masons that left the craft. What you need to do, okay, and, uh, and I know there's good people, you need good friends and all that, with the fraternity and all that, I understand that. But what's more important, them or your soul? And if they're truly your friends, they'll respect you for this, right? What you need to do, right, to get out of this, completely denounce anything to do with it, right? You go into you tell them, say, listen, thank you for your time. I'm done with this. I'm quitting. Turn in all your stuff, all your Masonic gear and all that stuff. Turn it all in or burn it. I would suggest to burn it, if you ask me. And don't sell it. Don't do nothing. Burn it because it's pure evil. And I don't even have time to get into the stuff that, you know, wow, yeah. So, um, and I would tell Jesus Christ that, you know, I mean, obviously you're already saved, right? But I would tell Jesus, like, please forgive me for dabbling to the occult like this, into Satan's lair. You know what I mean? No, because you got lured by Satan. Denounce it spiritually and physically. That's what you're supposed to do. Repent from it. And ask for forgiveness. And Jesus will forgive you. Trust me when I tell you. Then ask Jesus, open your eyes about it, right? Because he says, if I you have I let me see, he has let me hear, he will open your eyes. And you don't even have to believe me. You don't, and I encourage you, go do your own research. Go into your own libraries at the lodges. Go do the research and compare it to the Bible. Hold masonry to the Bible. And you will see for yourself that the Bible is infallible and you see for yourself everything they teach is direct contrary to what this teaches. Don't take my word for it. Go do it yourself. And that being said, guys, love you all. God bless. We'll see you Wednesday on Breaking the New World Order. And we're going to have a lot of news to talk about and everything else. And we'll see you Friday on Spiritual Warfare Friday. Me and Brian, we got an awesome show. Uh, we're going to talk about Easter, right? And uh, we're going to get into the biblical timelines when Jesus was really crucified when he really resurrected, and to prove that Easter, uh, uh, Jesus wasn't resurrected on Easter. Because Mary Magdalene, when she went to the tomb, the Bible says this, right? She went to the tomb early Sunday morning before the sun even came up, right? She went to the tomb, and the angel was there. Jesus wasn't. The angel told her he was already gone. So she didn't go there and see him resurrect. She went there, he was already resurrected. And we're going to show you how the Catholic Church had a lot to do with this lie, this whole... And the thing is, we're going to show you the biblical historical proof, okay, of Jesus' crucifixion. With the timeline, what the Bible says. Not the Catholic Church, not your church down at the corner, okay? The Bible and history, real history. So, that being said, guys, I love you guys. Shalom and God bless. We'll see you Wednesday, and you are the resistance. Thank you for supporting TruthRadioShow.com. 
in our continuous fight against the New World Order. If you want to donate and help contribute toward our daily news show in our spiritual warfare ministries, contribute any amount to the following links in the description. That's our PayPal, our Venmo, or our Cash App. Or just simply take out your camera and scan the code bars on the screen. And we thank you once again for help supporting the fight against the New World Order. And remember, you are the resistance. God bless.